Welcome to heat transfer. Uh, what I'm going to be doing in this course is covering the topic called heat transfer. And what we'll begin by doing is taking a look at the different forms of heat transfer that exist. And essentially what heat transfer is, it's the process of energy exchange or energy in transit due to a temperature difference. And so what we're going to be doing in this course is we're going to be studying heat transfer and there are three main types of heat transfer, modes of heat transfer. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time looking at two of those being conduction and convection. There's also radiation. We'll, we'll look at it but uh, not in the same level of detail as we will with conduction and convection. So let's take a look at the three types of heat transfer. Okay, the first type of heat transfer we're going to take a look at is conduction, and conduction occurs in solids. And what is driving conduction are temperature differentials. And so here we have a case or a scenario where we're looking at a, a solid, and we have T1 on one side and T2 on the other side. And if it happens that T1, temperature 1, is greater than temperature 2, the heat uh, is going to flow from the hotter temperature to the colder temperature. So that's a pretty natural process that we're all familiar with. But in this, what we would then do is we would sketch the heat transfer and we draw it with a little Q. That's what we'll be doing in this course. We use little Q to denote heat transfer. And we'll talk about the units. The units are joules per second or watts, but we'll look at that a little bit in more detail later on in this lecture. So that's the first form of heat transfer. Uh, the next form is convection. So here we're taking a look at a schematic with convective heat transfer. And when you have convective heat transfer, there's usually, well, there will be a fluid involved. There will be a fluid and a solid interface. And so uh, what will happen is the solid will be at a different temperature from the fluid. And you could either have the solid hotter or cooler than the fluid. But in this case that we're looking at here, we're saying that the solid is hotter than the fluid temperature. So in this case what would happen is heat would flow from the solid out into the fluid and we would draw our convective heat transfer uh, going in the direction into the fluid. So in this case the solid would be heating the fluid. The last form of heat transfer and it's one that is very different from conduction or convection and that is radiation. Now when we're dealing with radiation, what happens is objects radiate and they absorb uh, energy and, and typically in heat transfer we're looking at energy in the part of the spectrum referred to as the infrared. Uh, but when we look at this, what happens is energy is being emitted by an object and so it would be radiating and we will call the radiative heat transfer coming off Q1. And this object down here can be radiating as well, and that would be Q2. So when we look at radiation heat transfer, it comes down to being a balance between the amount that is emitted and the amount that is absorbed. And we will look a little bit at radiation, but not in the same level of detail as we will for conduction and convection. So those are the three forms of heat transfer that we'll be looking at in this course, the three forms of heat transfer that exist. And what we'll do in the next segment is we'll take a look at how heat transfer relates to fluid mechanics and thermodynamics.
What we're going to do in this segment, we're going to take a look at how heat transfer relates to a couple of other subjects that uh, you'll encounter in this area of the thermal sciences, and, and those are uh, thermodynamics and fluid mechanics. So a heat transfer obviously is related to both thermodynamics and fluid mechanics. And what we'll begin by doing is taking a look at thermodynamics. So if you've taken a course in thermodynamics, you're fully aware that in thermodynamics, we always talk about heat interaction. We talk about heat interaction, work interaction, and the change in the internal state of matter as it goes through transformations from one state to another. Uh, but essentially within thermodynamics, we're always dealing with the conservation of energy, and that's the uh, main law that we use when we look at thermodynamics. And you could have either a closed system or an open system. And depending upon the system that you're using, the uh, conservation of energy or the first law of thermodynamics will look a little different. So let's take a look at a closed system to begin with. So when we're dealing uh, with closed systems in thermodynamics, quite often what we will show is interaction between the system and the surroundings and interactions can be in the form of heat transfer q and and i should point out and i'll, I'll make a comment in a moment i'm using heat transfers designation for q so if you think this looks a little strange from a thermodynamics course that's the reason uh, but what we have is we have heat interaction we have work interaction and we have a change in the state. And, and in this case, we're looking at internal energy of our fixed mass system. And usually when we write out the first law, so if we're writing out the first law for this type of system, it would look something like this. So what we have is we have heat transfer in minus work. In this case, it is going out is equal to the change in internal energy per unit time. Uh, concerning the units, I, I need to make a little bit of a comment here about the units that we're going to use. And if you recall from thermodynamics, And what we'll do, we'll take a look at the units for heat transfer. So quite often we'll have capital Q. Sometimes you'll see capital Q dot, and that would denote joules per second. And then other times what we do is we divide by the mass flow rate, or M dot, and that gives us a little Q that we use in thermodynamics, and that's usually uh, energy per unit mass, so I'll, I'll put kilojoules per kilogram. And that is what we've used in thermodynamics. Now, when we're dealing with heat transfer, what we do, we use designation little q, and that denotes joule per second, or watt. And, and so those will be the units that we use in heat transfer. And you notice by comparing these two together, they're different. And, and so just don't get confused by that. In, in heat transfer, little q denotes joules per second. And that's why this version of the first law might look a little funny or strange if you've just taken a course in thermodynamics or if you remember thermodynamics. But that would be uh, how heat transfer is involved in a closed system. So what we'd be doing in heat transfer is determining what this value of Q would be that usually when you're solving problems in thermodynamics, uh, Q is usually assumed or given. And if you recall in thermal, we also had systems where mass could be crossing our boundary and those are open systems. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to write out the, what they sometimes call the fluid kidney. So it's just some system. It's 
So there we have our system. We have mass crossing a couple of boundaries. We have an inlet and we have an exit. And given that we have mass crossing the boundaries, we have to be a little careful with the first law of thermodynamics. And we usually have information about the state coming in and the state leaving. And that is usually in the form of things such as the internal energy, little u, uh, PV, which is pressure times the specific volume, and the velocity. So that would be on inlet. And then on exit, we would also know that information. Now we put this all together and that goes into the first law of thermodynamics. So writing out the first law of thermodynamics for an open system, we have the following. Okay, so there is our first law of thermodynamics. Sometimes what we'll do is we'll cluster this into the enthalpy. And this is our kinetic energy and this is our potential energy. And we have mass flow rate coming and multiplying as a pre-multiplier in both the inlet and the outlet. And then we also have our heat transfer and we have our work. So in, in this course, we're going to be focused on, again, estimating what that heat transfer might be. Uh, and that is, again, something that is quite often assumed or just given when we're doing thermodynamic calculations. So that is an open system in thermodynamics and where we see places where uh, heat transfer comes in. And I just want to make a comment about thermodynamics. I'm going to write that out next. So when we're studying thermodynamics, uh, as I mentioned, quite often the heat transfer is given. And, and so thermodynamics tells us nothing about the mechanisms uh, that uh, the heat exchange is taking place under, uh, nor does it provide methods for computing the rate of heat exchange. Now, sometimes you'll give it a problem where you can actually calculate Q that, that might be for a particular system, but you, you have no method of actually going in and calculating what that heat transfer would be for uh, given scenarios. And, and so that's what we're going to be doing in this course. We're, we're going to be looking at the mechanisms of heat transfer and we will be estimating the values of the heat transfer. And, and with that, you're better equipped to be able to go in and then analyze systems, uh, be it with thermodynamics or fluid mechanics, which we'll get to in a moment. But what we're going to do, let, let's take a look at a brief example that kind of illustrates this. And what we'll do, we're going to look at the case of throwing an iron ingot uh, that is being quenched in oil. So there we have our problem statement. You look in any thermodynamics book uh, under closed systems, fixed mass, and guaranteed you'll find questions that look like this. And uh, so in order to solve this, uh, what we want to do, we want to find what is the change in internal energy for an iron ingot that is quenched in oil and it's going from a thousand degrees C down to a hundred degrees C. So if you're doing thermal, uh, what you do is you would go and you would find, well, we have to get the specific heat. And if you recall, du is cv dt. Uh, so that is a way to evaluate the change in internal energy. Now we're dealing with a solid and consequently CV equals CP. And, and so we don't really have to worry about that. But uh, we then go in and we evaluate the change in internal energy. And we can plug in the values. Okay, so that's pretty typical of something that you'll see in thermodynamics. You evaluate 405 kilojoules. Everything seems great. You've solved the problem. However, there, there are some other questions that you may ask. Uh, let, let's say you want to know how long is this process going to take? Well, looking at this, you have no idea. You have no way of being able to figure that out. 
Uh, another thing, let, let's say we're, we're dealing with ingot of iron quenched in oil. Let, let's say you're studying material science and you want to understand what the microstructure is like on the inside of this ingot as it's going through this quenching process. So that means that you want to know what is the temperature distribution inside of this iron ingot and how is it going to change with time. Well with thermodynamics you cannot figure that out and, and so what we need to do we need heat transfer in order to figure those things out. Uh, with heat transfer be able to figure out the convective heat transfer coefficient on the outside that would help us figure out how long it's going to take and we would also use conduction and the heat diffusion equation that we'll be looking at in this course to figure out how the temperature on the inside of this iron ingot is going to change as a function of time. So the questions that we might ask So you might want to know how long is it going to take and temperature distribution. Heat transfer gives us these answers and, and so that's why you're studying and watching this video hopefully and we'll watch more videos and that way you'll be able to figure out how to solve this using heat transfer. And if you're not interested in that and you just want the thermodynamic approach, go and watch the thermodynamics course. Okay, so that's thermodynamics. Let's take a look next at fluid mechanics. And the place where fluid mechanics comes in to heat transfer uh, is when we have convective heat transfer. So let me scroll back here. This was from the previous lecture. Uh, segment and and what we did is we had convection here so we looked at convection convective heat transfer we talked about that and you have a moving fluid coming over some surface here I draw it as being a really nice flat plate but it could be any kind of irregular surface so that is the place where fluid mechanics comes into heat transfer So what we'll be doing in this class, we'll be taking a look at convection uh, and the course we'll be looking at uh, both natural and force convection. Natural is where the buoyancy force is what is driving the fluid and that provides the energy exchange. Uh, force convection is where you'd have a pump or some sort of fan or blower uh, moving the fluid over the surface. And what happens is we can do analysis up to a point. Uh, we, we can do laminar analysis. but as soon as you start getting complex shapes and if you get turbulence uh, forming in the uh, convective heat transfer over the surface, so let's say you had a turbulent boundary layer here, then all of a sudden it becomes very difficult to be able to predict what the uh, heat transfer rate is. And we usually show that with the convective heat transfer coefficient. I won't get into that yet. I'll do that in, in a later segment here. Um, but when you get turbulence, then you need to use empirical data. So basically you conduct experiments and you use non-dimensionalization, non-dimensional numbers in order to come up with the estimates for the convective heat transfer that would be for uh, fluid mechanic flows over heated objects or cooled objects. So that is how fluid mechanics and thermodynamics relate to heat transfer. Uh, we'll continue moving on and, and looking at uh, a heat transfer and, and different aspects of heat transfer in this course. What we're going to do now, we're going to take a look at the physical mechanisms of heat transfer and the first one that we will consider will be conduction. So conduction is heat transfer uh, due to atomic and molecular interactions and the, the nature of conduction depends upon whether we're looking at a gas, a liquid, or a solid. And what we'll do, we'll begin with gases. 
And when we're looking at conduction in gases, we're assuming that there is no macroscopic velocity of, of the molecules or the atoms, uh, that they're all kind of moving around on their own, but macroscopically a bulk of them is not moving because then that would be convective heat transfer. Uh, but to begin with, for gases, what we'll do, we'll sketch out uh, th this would be from the kinetic theory of gases where you have these molecules or atoms moving around. They all have different velocities and they're all hitting into one another, colliding and exchanging momentum in the process. So it is that energy exchange that is what is represented then by conduction uh, in, within a gas. And there are different types of energy that can exist within molecules uh, or atoms. So we can have translational energy, which would be the kinetic energy of them moving in a direction. They could be rotating. And you can also have vibrational. Now vibrational would come in if you have, uh, for example, diatomic oxygen, where you have two uh, atoms of oxygen and they're connected through some bond. The, the vibration could be that bond where they're moving back and forth or they could be rotating. And, and th this is all covered in the area referred to as being the kinetic theory of gases. And through this theory, you can actually use these, construct models and predict some of the uh, basic properties of gases. And, and so that is how we can have conduction in gases. Now moving on to liquids. Now, liquids are similar to gases. However, with a liquid, uh, there is a shorter distance between the collisions. And so we refer to that as the free mean path or the free molecular path. And that would be the distance between collisions. So in the case of a liquid, that distance is shorter and consequently they don't have to move as far to have a collision. And then finally, the material that quite often conduction applies to is solids. Although you can have it in these other forms, but solids are usually the one that we're dealing with. And, and with solids, uh, the molecules are in a, a more regular pattern. And they're fixed, and so they don't have the ability to move around as much. So we can have different types of lattices. You can have face center cubic, body center cubic. Uh, but typically when we're dealing with solids, there are two forms of interchange of energy. We can have lattice vibration And we can also have electron motion. So lattice vibration is where the connection between all of the atoms or molecules uh, would be vibrating. You can have these waves going through. And then in the case of electron motion, each of these atoms or molecules can have free electrons that are spinning around and those can move through the solid. And, and those can also provide a form of energy exchange. And, and with that, given that we're talking about electron motion, uh, the idea of a conductor versus a non-conductor, there's actually a relationship between uh, electricity, electricity flow and heat transfer.
Okay, so uh, what we have here is that non-conductors, so a non-conductor would be an insulator, uh, they, they transfer energy via lattice waves alone. And if you have a good conductor, conductors transfer both through lattice waves or lattice vibration, as well as electron motion. And, and the final comment here is that good electrical conductors are usually good heat conductors. So if you look at things such as uh, copper, copper is a very good electrical conductor. It's also a very good heat conductor. Gold, platinum, things like that. They're, they're, they're good electrical conductors and they're also good heat conductors, usually the case. So anyways, those are the three different uh, situations we can have for a gas, a liquid or a solid when we're looking at conduction. So we're talking about the uh, physical mechanisms of heat transfer and we're looking at conduction, the first method of heat transfer. And what we're going to do now is we're going to write out one of the equations that we quite often use when we're examining conduction. And it is referred to as being the conduction rate equation. And the equation that we use is Fourier's law. And writing it out. This is written in one dimension. We can have it in three dimensions, but uh, we're writing it here in one dimension. And that's why if you look here, we have the little X that denotes the fact that we're in the dimension or direction X and we have this constant K a is the area and then DT by DX a gradient so what we're going to begin uh, in looking at this equation we're going to write out a little schematic showing the temperature with diff the distance in a solid so let's assume that we have uh, some solid and we have temperature and then we plot distance uh, along the horizontal and if we could measure the temperature let's say we measure t1 here and then a little further into the solid we measure t2 and what we find is for one dimensional conduction oops i didn't do a very good job of that this should be a linear line a straight line so there we go, that's a straight line connecting uh, x equals 0 to x equals L, T1 to T2. And then remember the heat is going to flow from the hotter to the cooler and consequently the heat transfer is going in this direction here. And we will take a look at the different terms in Fourier's law. We have Qx. That's referred to as being the heat transfer rate, and that could be in watts or joule per second. We already talked about that in an earlier segment. The next term that we have is K. K is the thermal conductivity of the solid that we have, or the material that we have the heat transfer going through. And the units of K are going to be watts per meter degrees C, or it could be watts per meter Kelvin. And the next term that we have is the cross-sectional area through which the heat is being transferred through. And so that's the area of the surface. And that will be in units of meters squared. And then finally, we have dd by dx. That is the temperature gradient 
in the direction of heat transfer. And that is what is driving the heat transfer to take place. And the units there are degrees C per meter or could be Kelvin per meter. Given that we're looking at a difference, it doesn't matter if it's degree C or Kelvin. So that is the Fourier's law. It's a law and equation that we're going to use over and over and over again when we are analyzing uh, many, many different systems in heat transfer, especially when we're looking at conduction. So uh, the, the different terms in Fourier's law, and then that is for one dimension. Uh, we'll, we'll get to a little bit more of a complex form of this equation when we look at the heat diffusion equation, and there we would have it in multiple dimensions. But for right now, uh, we'll consider it only in 1D. So we just took a look at Fourier's law and we said that that was the equation that enables us to calculate uh, heat transfer when we have conduction. What we're going to do now, we're going to take a look at an example problem applying Fourier's law for one dimensional heat transfer. Okay, so there's our problem statement. Uh, we're given a brick wall and we're told that one side of it is at 20 degrees C, the other side is at 5 degrees C. It's 30 centimeters or 12 inches thick. And we're given the thermal conductivity and we're asked to solve for the rate of heat transfer going through that wall. So let's write out, and we should do this whenever we're solving problems, begin by writing out what we know. So our knowns. We were given the dimensions of the wall and consequently we can then determine the area, the thickness of the wall. We were told the thermal conductivity. Remember from Fourier's law, uh, K was the thermal conductivity, so we use K, little k for that. And then we were told the temperature difference on either side of the wall. What are we after? We're after the rate of heat transfer. And that is Q. And then finally what we'll do, I'll do this on the next slide. We're going to write out a schematic. You should always do schematics when you're solving engineering problems. It kind of helps you conceptualize and understand what is going on. And it's also a way to communicate for somebody else who's looking at your analysis. So X is the horizontal distance. This is our brick wall. And we were told the inner and outer temperatures. So what we're going to assume is that that is measured by a thermal couple or some other mechanism right on the wall. We were told the width of the wall was 30 centimeters. Thermal conductivity was K. And what we're after, we're trying to determine this rate of heat transfer coming through the wall. That will have Q. So uh, one of the things you have to be very careful with with Fourier's law and applying it is uh, making sure that you have the right coordinate system with your temperatures. And so here we will say X is equal to XI and then X is equal to X outer. And you'll see why in a moment when we uh, put the values into uh, Fourier's law. And I'm going to assume a couple of things in solving this problem. One is that we will assume that we have steady state conditions. So what does that mean? Well, we're going to talk about steady state and then we're going to talk about transient conduction later on in the course. But steady state conditions means that the temperatures are not changing. So it's not like you have somebody 
uh, taking a blowtorch to the left hand side and, and raising this temperature up to 80 degrees C. So we're assuming that things are remaining at, at stable conditions and that the temperature is not changing. Second thing, we're assuming that we have one dimensional conduction through the wall. Even though this wall is finite, uh, we're going to assume that we're looking in the middle region of the wall. If we were to go to the edges of the wall, then you would get uh, more than 1D. You'd have 2D, maybe 3D conduction. And the third thing that we're going to assume is that we have constant thermal conductivity. both throughout the wall as well as a constant thermal conductivity that does not change with temperature. So those are the three things that we're going to assume. Now in order to do the analysis of this problem, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use Fourier's law or Fourier's equation that we saw in the last segment. And that stated Qx is minus Ka dt by dx. And we're going to substitute in some of the values to begin with. First of all, we're going to start with the temperature differential, uh, dt by dx, or the gradient, I should say. And for this, th this is where you have to be careful to make sure that your coordinate system and the temperatures that you're using are consistent. And so in evaluating this, we take ti minus t outer, so the change in temperature from the inner to the outer divided by the change in distance from the inner to the outer surface. And one thing I should say here is notice that this can also be written in another way I could have flipped it around, T outer minus T inner, and then X outer minus X inner. And by having a consistent sign convention for the coordinates, uh, we would get the same answer. But we're, we're not going to do that here. We're going to use this form of it. Uh, but just as long as you're consistent with the way that you're applying your coordinate system and your temperatures, you should be fine. Uh, so let's enter in our values minus 0 0.69 and I'm going to explicitly put all of the units I usually won't do this but I will for this equation or for this problem uh, given that we're just starting out but you'll get used to it as we go through the course and so we can move a little quicker later on uh, and then temperature 5 degrees C and what I'll do is I'm going to do this with the outer minus the inner so the outer temperature is 5 degrees C minus 20 degrees C, so I was wrong. I'm not using that one. I'm using the second one. I apologize. So we're actually using that. Uh, outer minus inner, and then we're going to divide that by, let's look back at our schematic. So we're going to take X outer minus X inner, and that is just 30 centimeters. So expressing that in meters, and we have that. So plug this into your calculator and you find Qx for this brick wall is 1,035 watts or 1,035 joules per second. So there we go. That's our first heat transfer calculation that we have done in this course. We've estimated the heat loss from a wall knowing the temperature conditions on either side of that wall. So if you were to do this for a house, for example, you could then figure out what is the heat loss from the house. Uh, and that starts giving you interesting things for engineering analysis. So anyways, that is the first problem dealing with conduction. What we're going to do in the next lecture, we're going to move into convection and then we will look at radiation and that will... Uh, take us through the three different physical mechanisms of heat transfer.
In the last lecture, we were talking about the uh, physical mechanisms of heat transfer, and we began by talking about conduction. Uh, so what we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to move into the second mode of heat transfer that we discussed, and that is convection. So if you recall last time we said that convective heat transfer involves a fluid, be it a gas or a liquid, over some surface. And what we're looking at here, we're, we're talking both about the random motion in the fluid, and, and we looked at that with conduction, and we talked about kinetic theory of gases and the fact that a gas or a liquid, the molecules are in motion. Uh, but it also involves a bulk or macroscopic motion of the fluid. And, and so we'll take a look at that uh, with a schematic. And what we'll begin with is by showing the case of a flat plate where we have a fluid flowing over that flat plate. So imagine we have a flat plate and we have a fluid flowing over that plate and it is moving from left to the right as shown here. Now what happens is uh, we, we have what we call the no slip condition at the wall and, and that's where we will have zero velocity along the wall and that's why in this sketch I have shown the velocity going to zero at the wall and then when we move away from the wall we get into what we call the free stream region and that is outside of the hydrodynamic boundary layer and outside of the hydrodynamic boundary layer the velocity returns to what we call the free stream velocity so u infinity and, and so the presence of the wall is not being felt further away from the wall outside of the boundary layer and in a like manner we also have a thermal boundary layer and we go from the uh, temperature of the wall at the wall and th this would be a case where we have a heated surface because the temperature of the wall is higher than that of the surroundings. And then as we go out of the thermal boundary layer, we then return to the condition of having uh, T infinities. That would be the free stream temperature. And so this particular instance that we're looking at here, uh, and this here is the temperature distribution but this would be a case where we would have heat transfer. Given the wall is hotter than the fluid, the heat transfer or the flux is going to be moving away from the wall and it's going to be going in that direction there. So in this particular case, what we have is we have uh, U of Y is our hydrodynamic velocity boundary layer and T of Y is our thermal boundary layer. So those are the boundary layers. If you want more information on that, you can go and watch my uh, introductory fluid mechanics course where I go into a lot of detail about the boundary layer. Uh, typically for isothermal flows, however, so I usually don't look at cases where there's temperature variability. In heat transfer, we always have temperature variability in the boundary layer, and that's why we have this uh, thermal boundary layer as well. And depending upon the Prandtl number, the boundary layer, uh, be it the hydrodynamic, or the thermal boundary layer can grow at different rates. And, and so a fluid with a Prandtl number of one, they would grow at the same, and we'll talk about the Prandtl number later on in this course, uh, but if it's one, then they'll grow at the same rate, and if it's different than one, then they're not growing at the same rate. So you could have a, a thicker uh, hydrodynamic boundary layer versus the thermal, or the other way around. You could have a thick uh, hydrodynamic, uh, they, they depend on the Prandtl number. So, uh, when we're looking at convective heat transfer, uh, in this course we're going to be looking at two different types of convective heat transfer, and that depends upon the forcing mechanism. And so we will talk about forced convection. So forced convection is just what it sounds like. We're forcing the fluid over the solid surface using some mechanical means, that could be a blower, it could be a pump, the surface itself could be moving, as in the case of uh, an aircraft flying at very high elevation where the temperature would be very cold, minus 60 degrees C and the aircraft skin would be at a higher temperature. Uh, or we could have what we call free or natural convection. Uh, 
So in this course, we're going to study both of these types, uh, forced convection as well as free convection or natural convection. And you can imagine when you have free or natural convection, if this is our wall and the fluid is moving up, the angle of the wall is going to be very important. You'll have uh, fluid being heated and that is what is moving it. And, and so there is no mechanical means that is causing the fluid to move there. Um, but the angle becomes very important because free or natural convection at this angle is very different from free or natural convection at this angle where the fluid is moving up that way or that way versus a flat plate uh, where you might have some free convection but it's not going to be as strong. So anyways, we're going to look at that later on in the course. That is free or natural convection. We will also be looking at forced convection. So those are some of the concepts behind uh, convection. Now, one of the things when we're doing convective heat transfer, another thing that we're going to be looking at is the nature in which the energy going into the fluid is being stored. And that brings up the idea of sensible and latent heat exchange. So in the case of sensible heat exchange, uh, these are words that we've seen most likely in thermodynamics. Uh, but here the energy transfer is going into the fluid and is causing the fluid to increase in temperature. And, and so it's uh, manifested in the fluid by an increase in internal energy. So if it's a gas, it would be the uh, kinetic energy or the velocity of the gas molecules. If it's a liquid, it would be the uh, amount that the liquid molecules are moving around. Uh, now latent heat exchange is another form that we will be looking at. So latent heat exchange is where the working fluid that, that we have in our system is going through a phase change. And typically what we'll look at in this course is going through a phase change from a liquid to a vapor and then a vapor back to a liquid. And these processes, boiling and condensation. So uh, we've seen those and discussed them in our everyday lives, but we'll be looking at them from a technical perspective and quantifying the amount of heat transfer associated with these processes. And, and given that a lot of energy can go into a phase change, uh, we'll find that the heat transfer rates for either boiling or condensation are, are very, very high. And I, I guess I should say that we could have going from a uh, solid to a liquid as well, going through a change of state. And that would be what we call phase change materials. And, and sometimes those are being used in, in things such as solar energy uh, where what they'll have is a wax-like uh, substance. It is a solid and then when it goes into the liquid state it absorbs a lot of energy and that's for a thermal storage. And, and so that could be another application. We won't be looking at that in this course, but just be aware that phase change materials are another topic of heat transfer. Uh, and that's where you're going from solid to liquid or liquid to solid. So that is convection. Uh, what we'll be doing next is taking a look at the governing equation for convection, and then we'll work an example problem. We're now going to take a look at the equation that we use for convection calculations and this is referred to as being the convection rate equation. And if you recall when we looked at conduction we had Fourier's law. Well for convection we have a similar equation and it is called Newton's law of cooling. And so this is the equation that we use for a lot of the uh, convective heat transfer calculations, pretty much everything that we're doing. Uh, again, on the left-hand side, we have Q, and that is going to be our heat transfer rate in watts or joules per second. And then on the right-hand side of the equation, we have H. That is our convective heat transfer coefficient, and that's really where the bulk of the effort is going to be, is determining what that value of H is. Uh, we have the wetted surface area. Uh, the contact between the fluid and the solid. And then we have the wall temperature minus the free stream temperature of the liquid. So 
So this is Newton's law of cooling. Uh, Q is our heat transfer rate. H is the convective heat transfer coefficient. A is going to be the surface area. And then T wall minus T infinity. So we'll be using this equation. Uh, and like I said, determining H is going to be the biggest battle that we have when we're dealing with convective heat transfer. Uh, there are many, many different empirical relations that we'll be using and uh, for determining the value and we can then apply it for engineering calculations. And so sometimes the unknown might be the wall temperature, sometimes it might be the rate of heat transfer, it might be a sizing problem, different things like that. That is Newton's law of cooling. What we'll do in the next segment, we'll take a look at applying this to an example problem. <laughs> So in the last segment, what we did, we talked about the convective rate equation. That is Newton's law of cooling. What we're now going to do, we're going to solve an example problem involving convective heat transfer. So I'll begin by writing out the problem statement. Okay, so there is our problem definition or problem statement. What we have is hot air flowing over a flat plate. The air is hotter than the plate, and, and so that is going to have an impact on the direction in which the heat transfer is taking place. Uh, we've been told what the convective heat transfer coefficient is, uh, 75 watts per meter squared degrees C, and the area of the plate is 2 square meters. So we know the free stream temperature and we know the wall temperature. Those are known, so our standard technique of solving any problem, let's begin by writing out what we know and then what we're looking for. So we're told to find the heat transfer rate. Now, one thing to notice uh, when I wrote out the convective heat transfer coefficient here, notice that I used uh, units of watts per meter squared Kelvin, whereas in the problem statement it was watts per meter squared degrees C. Please. Be aware that those are identical. There is no difference from one to the other. And, and so don't get confused by that. They are the same thing. All right, so what we're going to do, we are going to begin by writing out a schematic. Okay, so we have fluid flowing over a wall. We have no information about the boundary layer, so we'll just draw it as being uh, free stream temperature T infinity coming over the wall. And we know, however, that the uh, wall temperature is at a lower value. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to begin by just showing this as heat transfer going in that direction. And then we'll see what we get as we go through the process because that's a standard definition that we've used. Uh, typically we say the wall is hotter than the fluid. Assumptions that we're going to make in solving this. So we're going to assume that we have steady state conditions. What does that imply? That means that the wall temperature is not changing with time, uh, nor is the free stream temperature fluid or the velocity of the fluid coming over it. So we have steady state. Now for analysis, it's pretty simple. What we're going to do, we're going to take uh, Newton's law of cooling that we just saw. Uh, we have all of the different values. So it'll be pretty much uh, straightforward plugging in the values. So analysis for this. And when you write out Newton's law of cooling, it's always Tw minus T infinity. Plugging in the values. So we get that. When you calculate everything, we get 15,000 watts or 15 kilowatts 
and given that we have a 50 minus 150 that's actually a negative so it's a negative value and what we need to do is go back and look at the way that we had the drawing we were showing the heat transfer going from the wall out into the fluid uh, but given that the fluid is at a hotter temperature, a higher temperature than the wall, the fluid is 150 versus the 50 of the wall, really what we have is a scenario where we have 15 kilowatts, and then just add the words into the plate. And what that does is it shows that you know the direction that the heat transfer is taking place. It is going from the fluid into the plate and warming the plate up or heating it up. And so the temperature of the plate eventually would start to rise. So that is an example of how we can do calculations using uh, Newton's Law of Cooling for convective heat transfer. Okay, we're now going to take a look at the third form of heat transfer, uh, and we've looked thus far at conduction and convection. We are now going to move into radiation and look at radiation briefly. Uh, radiation is quite a bit different from the other forms of heat transfer that we looked at, uh, where those were involved with uh, either macroscopic fluid transport or uh, electron motion, lattice vibration, gas uh, molecule movement within our liquids. Uh, so we looked at conduction, conduction, convection, and now we're going to look at radiation, which involves things in the electromagnetic spectrum, and that's why it's a lot different. And we'll notice the equations are a lot different as well. And so I'm just going to give a brief introduction to radiative heat transfer. So when we're looking at radiative heat transfer, we're talking about things in the electromagnetic spectrum. And typically, a radiative heat transfer covers a portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. And we look at the infrared visible and then parts of the ultraviolet. Okay, so taking a look at the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, we have the electromagnetic spectrum as a function of the wavelength in micrometers. And uh, what we have, we go from the uh, UV, which would be kind of on the purple side. That's not quite purple, but it's close. Uh, we go into the visible. Visible, what we can see with our eyes, is between 400 and about 760 microns. And then we move into the near-infrared and then eventually the infrared and that is in this region. Now thermal radiation uh, you could say goes anywhere from about 0.1 microns up to about 100 microns. So this is where thermal radiation exists or is radiation heat transfer. And so visible, obviously, that's what we can see with our eyes. Infrared, that is if we are looking in the infrared spectra. And, and so here I'm looking at you in the infrared. And you can see funny things. Uh, watch my nostrils. So you can hear me breathing, and as I breathe in, I breathe in cooler air, and consequently you see the temperature change, and then we go back, and when I exhale, it's hotter air, and so it's obviously a hotter temperature. So uh, we can do neat things with infrared cameras, as you're looking at right now, or we use things in the visible range. Um, but uh, what we'll be doing is we'll be looking at infrared uh, radiation and radiative heat transfer, and for the most part, it is in this range right here. 
and uh, solar radiation is typically would be anywhere from 0.3 up to 3 microns so our eyes are only able to see a, a small portion of the actual spectra that exists so if we're looking at solar irradiation from the sun that would be the range of solar radiation uh, for radiative heat transfer however the majority of the energy is going to be in the IR range and, and that is where uh, we have significant amounts of heat transfer everything is emitting and absorbing thermal radiation so what we're going to do next is we're going to take a look at some of the equations that are involved with radiative heat transfer and then we'll work an example problem <laughs> So in doing calculations involving radiative heat transfer, uh, there are some complex things that, that you can get into where you're looking at one surface with respect to another. However, what we're going to do is we're going to present now kind of a simplified equation where if you have a smaller object in a much larger surroundings and the surroundings temperatures are not changing, uh, we'll look at an equation that can be used for that type of scenario. So we'll refer to this as being radiative heat transfer. Now, in the uh, theory of radiative heat transfer, we can consider an object to be an ideal radiator if it behaves as a black body. And for that, uh, it would be emitting, we quantify the amount of radiation that it is emitting uh, using the following equation. And so what this equation presents would be the amount of energy that is released from a body at a particular temperature and the temperature of the body would be TS and the proportionality constant in this equation is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. Now one thing that I should say that you have to be very very careful of when you're using these equations in radiative heat transfer is notice we have this raised to the power 4 and so therefore you need to ensure that your temperature is always in Kelvin. If you try putting degrees Celsius in here, you will get the incorrect value. So be very careful with that. Now, an ideal radiator, that's kind of a theoretical maximum that an object would emit at a given temperature. In reality, no objects emit at an ideal radiator. They emit at a slightly lower value than that. And in order to characterize that, we have a term called the emissivity. So let me show you the equation for how a real object would respond. And so that would be a real surface in comparison to a black body. Notice when we had black body, we had the B subscript here. We do not have it for uh, the rate at which energy is released, the term on the left-hand side. Uh, and we also have this new term that we've introduced, this epsilon. This is the emissivity. And the emissivity is going to range between 0 and 1. And depending upon the object that you're uh, doing the calculation for or looking at, there are tables with emissivities. And surface finish is very important uh, for emissivity, be it dull or very, very polished. That can have a big impact on the emissivity. Uh, so that is in terms of what an object would emit. We're all radiating energy right now, radiative uh, heat transfer given the temperature of our bodies versus the surroundings. At the same time, the surroundings around us are radiating and we're absorbing the radiation from the surroundings. And so an object may also absorb radiation And we use this equation to characterize the amount of energy that an object is absorbing, where we will define the terms. So that is the amount of energy that an object will absorb. And what we have here 
we have G abs, that would be the rate at which energy is absorbed. And on the right hand side then we have a new term alpha, that is called the absorptivity. And just like the emissivity, it ranges between zero and one. And then uh, we also have this term here. This is the incident radiation, sometimes called the irradiation. Uh, and that would be the amount of radiative energy coming onto a particular object. And, and so a very simplified case of this, uh, we, we could look at a smaller area versus a larger surrounding. So let's take a look at that. So if we had a scenario like this and we were considering some smaller object within a very large surroundings where the surroundings temperature uh, is at T surrounding and then the object itself is at TS for the surface of the object, we would have radiative interchange between these objects. And so this object would be radiating out and then this a surrounding would be radiating back and you get reflection and everything but uh, essentially you eventually get to a balance and the net rate of exchange for the surface so let's take a look at this surface right here uh, we can come up with an equation for the net rate of exchange So the net rate of exchange is going to be what the object is emitting and, and then we compare that or take off what is being irradiated. And, and so with that we can sub in the two equations that we've looked at, the one with emissivity. So that is how much a body would be emitting. So you or I sitting in a room were irradi or emitting radiation, it would be that amount but we're also absorbing radiation from the surroundings and so we characterize it with this term here. Now in order to simplify this and, and th this is all very very simplified because in reality these terms are wavelength dependent and, and it gets much more complex. You have to look at projections of one surface versus another uh, but it, it, another simplification that we can say is if the emissivity is equal to the absorptivity we call this a gray surface and with that the equation simplifies even a little more and what we end up with is the following And so this is an equation that we can use in, in very simplified calculations for uh, radiative heat transfer where if we know the emissivity of the surface of the object and we know the surface temperature of the object and the surroundings, we can then estimate the amount of radiative heat transfer that is occurring. So what we're going to do in the next segment, we're going to take a look at an example uh, applying this equation. And that will then conclude our very, very brief overview of radiative heat transfer. Okay, we're now going to uh, work an example problem involving radiation. So what I'll do is I will begin by writing out the problem statement. And this is a very simplified radiation example. We're going to use the equation that we derived at the end of the last segment uh, where we consider the object to be a gray surface. Okay, so what we have, we have an astronaut sitting and working in the service bay of a spacecraft and we're told that the astronaut is surrounded by walls at a minus 100 degrees Celsius 
and the area of the spacesuit of the astronaut is 3 square meters, emissivity is 0 0.05, and we're asked to calculate her rate of heat loss when the suit's outer temperature is 0 degrees C. So she would obviously be at, at a warmer temperature, and then there's conduction going through the suit, uh, but the outer temperature of the suit is at 0 degrees Celsius, and we're trying to calculate the amount of heat loss from the spacesuit. So let's write out what we know and what we're trying to find and then we'll work this problem. Okay, so we're trying to find the heat transfer from the astronaut. We're going to call that Q. It will be watts, uh, watts that we'll calculate because we know the area of the astronaut's spacesuit. So let's begin with a schematic of what is going on in this problem. Okay, so there we have the astronaut in her spacesuit uh, out in space. We have vacuum conditions, so there is no mechanism of convection going on. The only form of heat transfer is going to be radiative heat transfer. And given that the astronaut's outer suit temperature is at a higher temperature than the surroundings, we know that the heat transfer, the radiative heat transfer, is going to be going in that direction. So uh, let's make a few assumptions in order to solve this problem. Steady state. So the uh, spacecraft is not going around the Earth and going from a, a shaded region to a, uh, a region where we have solar radiation. It's operating at steady state. Second thing is we will assume this to be a gray body. And with that, we can then say that the absorptivity is equal to the emissivity epsilon. Alpha is equal to epsilon. And so with that, for analysis, what we can do is we can use the equation that we came up with in the last segment. So uh, let's begin by writing out that equation. Okay, so we have this equation. Uh, we can put in all the values. Now, the one thing you got to be really careful with, I've already told you about this, is watch the temperatures whenever you have radiation because notice we have this raised to the power of 4. In everything else we're doing, conduction and convection, we do not have temperature raised to a power. Um, and, and so it's usually a temperature differential, a temperature difference. But here, we're raising temperature to the power and consequently we need the temperature to be in Kelvin or things will go awry for us very quickly. So let's plug in the values into this equation. We have the emissivity, 0 0.05, the area of her spacesuit we were told was 3 meters squared. The Stefan Boltzmann constant, you're going to memorize this throughout this course because you're going to use it so many times. And then finally the temperature, and it has to be in Kelvin. So the first one is the surface temperature of her suit. And let me put in the Kelvin there. I'll put in the units. So that's raised to the power 4. And then the surrounding temperature we're told is minus 100. So that is uh, 173 Kelvin. Also raised to the power 4. Plugging in the values, we find that the heat loss from her suit is 39.6 watts. So, um, what does that mean? Well, let, let's do a little bit of a conversion here. Let's figure out how much food she needs to eat in order to maintain that uh, level of heat loss. And, and so, if we look, one calorie, a dietary calorie, is 4186.8 joules. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to convert the heat loss into calories. And we're going to convert this, instead of calories per second, we'll do calories per hour, because that's a little bit more of a meaningful uh, number. So that's dietetic, so that is relating to food. 
And with this, we find that the heat loss translates into 34 calories per hour. And I did some looking up of values to figure out what type of food would replenish her uh, in maintaining her temperature. And there are different things. Uh, if she wanted to eat butter, uh, she could eat one teaspoon of butter. That has 35 calories, but I don't think she wants to eat butter. Uh, if she has seedless uh, raisins, I looked it up and 22 seedless raisins have 34 calories. So if this astronaut wants to maintain uh, the overall balance and overcoming the heat loss, she would need to eat 22 raisins within an hour. So that's about a raisin every two minutes. So anyways, that gives you an idea of how to apply a radiative heat transfer. Uh, we simplify things drastically by assuming it to be a gray body, so emissivity and absorptivity are related. As well, we didn't look at many of the other aspects where things are really a function of wavelength. And so radiative heat transfer can get co quite complex. We're going to keep it quite simple in this course, and we're mainly going to focus on conduction and convection. So th those are the three forms of heat transfer. And what we'll do in the next uh, lecture is we're going to take a look at combining the three together into a, a specific problem. But, but that'll be in the next lecture that we are doing that. So anyways, that is radiative heat transfer. What we're now going to talk about is a device that enables us to examine the emissivity of, of different surface finishes. And, and it is uh, referred to as being the Leslie's cube or a Leslie's cube. So this is a device that uh, was devised by a fellow named John Leslie in 1804. What the Leslie's cube consists of, it just like it sounds, it is a cube. So it's a cube made out of copper and in the top and there's an opening and it enables you to pour a liquid into the cube. So the, this is made out of copper. Could be made out of other uh, materials as well, but that was the one that I had was made out of copper. Uh, and then what you do is you put hot water into it. And each of the sides of the Leslie cube have different surface finishes. And so the one that we'll be looking at in, in a short while here has one side has white paint. The next side has gloss black paint. Then the next side has flat black. And the last side is just bare copper. So if you recall when we were talking about radiation, uh, we said that there is a black body, an ideal black body radiator. And for that, uh, we had an equation that enabled us to calculate the amount of radiation emitted from that type of object. And so the radiation emitted on the right was watts per meter squared. This is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. And then this here is the surface temperature in Kelvin. 
And this is actually integrated over a broad range of wavelengths. It, 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 the actual amount of radiation is wavelength dependent, uh, but this uh, equation would be integrated over all wavelengths. Now, it turns out that we had talked about how real surfaces do not emit this full amount of radiation. They actually emit uh, a little less, and so a real surface A real surface emits with the following equation. And here, this is the emissivity. So that is the basis of Leslie's cube. It enables us to study that. So what we're going to do, uh, we're going to take a look at a video of a Leslie's cube with hot water inside of it. And we'll take a look at what results uh, when we look at that with an infrared camera. So here we go. So what you're seeing here is an image. The IR camera is up on the left. Uh, visual is, is straight ahead. So we go from white to gloss black, flat black, and then we get to almost like a polished copper finish. And we go back to white. And, and so the IR camera in the upper left corresponds to what you're seeing in the middle image. So that is what the IR camera is collecting. Now we can analyze that data because with the IR camera we do get temperature data. Uh, but what I did is I put a thermometer into the Leslie's cube and there you can see with white it's 40.8. Now the thermometer is right in the middle of the liquid so it's not going to change. But all of the surfaces should be reading at about 40, 41 degrees Celsius. Uh, as we can see from the thermometer. And so uh, all four of the surfaces should be reading that on the Leslie's cube. But now let's take a look at what happens when we go to the IR uh, camera. And so th this is a, the first image from the IR camera. And this would have been for the white surface finish. And then we go to the gloss black, 41.7, so that's not far off from what we'd expect. 41.2 for flat black. And now the last one is going to be copper, 27.5 degrees C. So what is going on there? Well, that is a perfect demonstration of the uh, idea or the concept of emissivity. Because what we saw was that for white gloss black and for flat black, uh, the temperatures measured with the IR camera were all pretty accurate to what we had with the thermometer. But then when we went to the polished copper finish, it was 27.5 degrees C, very, very different from the 41 degrees C that the water inside of the Leslie's cube was at. And what is going on there is the fact that polished copper has much different emissivity from the painted surfaces. So let me write out what the emissivities are for the different surface finishes that we just looked at. Okay, so there we have the emissivities for the different surfaces. And you can see for all of the painted surfaces that we looked at, the emissivities are all pretty close. 0 0.93, 0 0.92, 0 0.94. Now that was for an oil uh, paint. I'm not exactly sure what finish it was on the Leslie's Cube, if it was an oil paint or other, but uh, that, that's irrelevant. Uh, the, the, the paint was... Uh, similar to values that you look at for emissivity, paint typically around 0.88 to about 0.95. And, and so those were the values of the emissivity. That means that it's emitting uh, most of the uh, black body radiation value. Now when we look at copper, however, polished copper, really, really low emissivity. And consequently, that's also why we were measuring kind of a very low temperature with the IR camera. Uh, I think it was around 27 degrees C when it should have been around 41 degrees C. Now, I didn't have perfectly polished copper uh, for the cube that I showed you. It was kind of old and a little tarnished, so the emissivity may be a little bit higher than this 0 0.03. Um, but you can set emissivity in any kind of infrared detector. And the camera that I was showing you the results for, uh, the emissivity for that camera is set to be 0 0.95. 
So what does that mean? What that means is that if you wanted to use an infrared camera to measure the surface temperature of an object, you need to know what the emissivity of that object is. And, and so if you're measuring something such as copper, polished copper, uh, chances are you're going to get an incorrect result if you do not adjust the emissivity accordingly in, in order to correspond to whatever the surface finish of that copper would be. So anyways, that is a demonstration of emissivity and it shows us the importance of knowing emissivity values for our engineering calculations because uh, if we're off with the emissivity, our results could be very, very incorrect. Uh, and consequently, we do need to pay attention to emissivity when we're doing our calculations. So that is Leslie's Cube and emissivity. We're now going to take a look at a concept that is uh, quite useful to use when you're solving problems involving heat transfer. And it relates to the flux of thermal energy or uh, going through surfaces and what happens when you go from uh, one surface or one material into another. And it's referred to as being the surface energy balance. So let's take a look at that now. And so what we're going to do, we're going to consider a scenario where we have a solid uh, so we have conduction and then we have a fluid outside of the solid, we have convection, and then we have some surroundings. So we have radiative heat transfer. Okay, so what we have here is we have a scenario where um, we have a solid, and so the solid is shown here. So this here is all solid. And then we get to an interface where we then transition into a fluid. So there's a fluid outside of the solid. And then far away, we get to some surroundings that is at temperature surrounding. And when we're dealing with these types of problems, uh, first of all, we know that within the solid, we have conduction. And we've shown the temperature distribution here. Uh, but we know that we have conduction coming through in this direction because it's going from the higher temperature to the lower, T2. Now, when we get to the wall, what's going to happen is the conductive heat transfer or the energy flowing in is going to leave via two mechanisms. One of these is going to be radiative. Let me use a different color there. I will use red. So we will have radiative heat transfer and we are also going to have convective heat transfer. And given that I uh, put the fluid in green, what we'll do is we will put convection in green. So we have convection, radiation. And, and so in solving these types of problems, it's often useful to draw a control surface right on the interface between where the solid transitions into the fluid. And, and so what I'm going to do, I'm going to sketch a control surface. I'll do that red so that it's easier to see. So what we're going to do, we're going to assume that these control surfaces exist on either side of the solid fluid interface. And we're also going to assume that they are infinitesimally large. So the, the delta between them is, is or sorry, infinitesimally small. Uh, that they're right next to each other. Uh, they include no mass or volume. And, and so the control surface is going to be kind of a theoretical construct. But it's a very useful one that we can use for solving problems whenever heat is transferring from uh, one media to another and, and one material to another. So uh, let's take a look at conservation of energy across the control surfaces. 
And so we know conservation of energy says Q in minus Q out is equal to zero. So we're assuming that this is a steady state scenario. Uh, so there's no buildup of energy, but even if it was, the control surface is infinitesimally small, so there would be no place for it to build up. Um, but let's look back at our diagram here. So what is coming in? We know we have conduction coming in, and then what is leaving? Well, we know we have radiation and we have convection. So those are the three things that we will put into this equation. So in here, we can then rewrite what is coming in is Q conduction. And what is leaving is going to be heat transfer due to convection and heat transfer due to radiation. And those all need to sum to zero. So this is a very useful equation that can help you solve a lot of different problems. Uh, basically, it's an energy balance that you do on this infinitesimally thick surface. We call it a control surface. And we will use this while solving problems. Okay, so that is the idea of the control, uh, the control surface and the surface energy balance. What we'll be doing in the next segment is we're going to be looking at an example problem involving all three, conduction, convection, and radiation. We'll be using the uh, energy balance in order to solve it. All right, uh, what we've been doing thus far in the course, we've been looking at the different modes of heat transfer. We looked at conduction, convection, and radiation, and then we looked at an approach called the surface energy balance, uh, which enables you to formulate an equation when you have these different modes of heat transfer in a particular system. So what we're now going to do, we're going to work an example problem. And this example problem is kind of going to unite all of the three different forms of heat transfer that we've looked at thus far. So this will be combined modes of heat transfer. Okay, so there's our problem, kind of a long statement, but uh, what we have is we have a furnace and within the furnace are combustion gases, hot combustion gases, and there is a brick wall uh, that forms the wall of the uh, furnace. And what we are told is that the ambient air temperature is 25 degrees C. The brick wall is 0.15 meters thick. Uh, we're told the thermal conductivity of the brick, it's 1.2 watts per meter Kelvin, and the surface emissivity of the brick is 0.8. Um, and we're told that under steady state conditions, the outer temperature of the brick wall is measured to be 100 degrees C, and we know that we have free convection, so that is convection without any kind of uh, pumping source, so it's just due to the buoyancy of the air. On the outside of the brick wall, has a convective heat transfer coefficient of 20 watts per meter uh, degrees C, meter squared degrees C, I should say. And we're then asked to determine what is the inner wall temperature of the furnace on the inside of the brick wall. So uh, here we have a problem. And just analyzing it quickly, uh, given that we have thermal conductivity, that means we have conduction going through the brick wall. Uh, we're given a convective heat transfer coefficient, so we have to have convective heat transfer. And they give us emissivity, and that means that we have radiative heat transfer as well. So uh, what we're going to do, we're going to use the surface energy balance. That's a concept that we looked at in the last segment, and we're going to use it to solve the problem. So uh, just like all the other problems, we begin by writing out what we know and then what we're trying to find, and then we'll write out a schematic. Okay, so that's what we know. Now let me check here. Uh, yeah, 25 degrees C. So the ambient was at 25 degrees C. That's how we get the surrounding temperature. Um, now what are we after? We're trying to find 
the temperature on the inside of this brick wall which we'll draw a schematic in a moment and things will make a little bit more sense okay so we're going to call that T1 uh, the inner wall temperature now what I'm going to do let me go to a new slide because the schematic is kind of large so the schematic that we're looking at so here we have our brick wall this is very similar to the energy balance that, that we looked at in the previous segment but over here we have combustion gases now in reality what's going to happen is there will be convective heat transfer on the inside as well here and probably also radiation because you have a flame uh, we're neglecting those and we're just saying that we know this temperature or that's what we're trying to solve for a key one uh, so let me sketch out the rest of it and then we'll come back and work through the problem. Okay, uh, let's see here. I'm going to put a surface temperature here. T surface. All right, so what we're going to do, um, we are after this here, we're looking for this temperature, uh, but when approaching this type of problem, uh, what we need to do, we need to uh, come up with an equation where we have all of the different components involved, and, and in order to do that, we're going to do this surface energy balance, so let me draw that in here because that is where conduction is going to go into both convection and radiative heat transfer. So that will be our surface, uh, the, the surface where we're going to apply the surface energy balance. Now a couple of assumptions that we have here, steady state, 1D conduction through the wall. So steady state. That means that you're not changing any of the conditions. Uh, second one is 1D conduction through the brick wall. And a third thing is surroundings are large. Compared to the brick wall. Another one that I should add here is that we're dealing with a gray surface. So with that, that means that the emissivity and the absorptivity are equal to one another. All right, so what we have, we, we have all the different components here. Uh, we're now going to perform a surface energy balance on the outer wall, and that will enable us to come up with our equations. So uh, just like before, what we were going to have, we're going to have what's coming in is going to be that. And then what is going out is going to be these two here. So let's put that together. Okay, so we have conduction, conduction, radiation. Let's plug in all of the different terms. So we have Fourier's law, Newton's law of cooling, and then our radiative heat transfer equation. Okay. Now what we can do immediately, we can cancel out the area because that's common to all of them. So area disappears. I'm going to uh, expand the temperature gradient uh, term. So let's do that. And I'll put the other two terms onto the right hand side of the equation. Now note the way that I'm doing this, I'm uh, putting TS minus T1, and so TS is the value of the temperature. Th this would be TS is here. So I put T surface, actually let me correct that. I'm gonna make that TS because that is what we have, and then we have T surrounding. Uh, so that is a surface temperature TS is for 
this surface right here. So when I do conduction, I'm taking TS and that is going to be at X equals L. And then we will have T1 and that is at X equals zero. And we then are able to evaluate the temperature gradient term as we have there. Uh, now on the right hand side, what we'll do, we'll take conduction or convection and radiation and bring it over to the right hand side. So we have this equation here and at this point it, it's good to reflect where we're going uh, in terms of solving the problem. So let's come back and look at our schematic. First of all, what are we trying to find? We're trying to find the inner wall temperature T1. So let's go back to our schematic. This is the thing that we're after. Consequently, with our energy balance equation, what we really should be doing is we should be trying to isolate for T1. So let's try to rearrange this equation and isolate for T1. Okay, so we get this equation here. We can now go ahead and plug in the values because we know everything in this equation with the exception of T1. Okay, so we get that and be certain to keep the temperature in degree Kelvin when you're using the radiative heat transfer equation, which we've done. For the other ones, you can leave it in degree C because they're not being raised to the power four. Uh, but when you have it in the radiative heat transfer equation, that has to be in degrees Kelvin. So once we plug those in, let's see what we get. Okay, so we get that for our final answer. Temperature is 352.5 degrees Celsius. And so that would be the inner wall temperature of our brick wall. So we have this brick wall. We have our furnace. We have natural convection taking place out here. And then we have some big surroundings where we have radiative heat transfer. But what we've been able to find is that this is 352.5 degrees C, this inner wall temperature. Now, this was fairly easy given that a lot of the information was given to us. Had I asked you uh, to solve for the surface temperature, uh, that would have been a little bit more challenging because you would have had a fourth order equation that you would have to solve. But uh, this was a little bit more direct the way that we had it, uh, trying to solve for T1. And that is then an example of combined modes of heat transfer. So here we just solved a problem uh, involving conduction, Q conduction, we had convection, and we had radiation. So all three of them put together, enabling us to solve something in terms of an engineering application. Let me get rid of that because that's just a hypothetical. Uh, but that is an example of, of putting things together. And you can see using this control balance uh, energy surface, or control surface, I should say, enables you to do quite a bit. And we're going to use that over and over and over again throughout our calculations and heat transfer. Uh, whenever you have conduction on the inside and then you're going to other modes on the outside, it's a very, very handy way of being able to handle things. So that concludes this segment, looking at an example problem of combined modes of heat transfer. In this segment, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the question, why study heat transfer?
And if you recall, what we said is that heat transfer is uh, basically energy in transit due to a temperature difference. So all the processes that we're going to be looking at will involve a temperature difference and we'll be able to uh, hopefully illustrate how heat transfer is taking place in each of those. Now what we're going to do, we're going to take a look at a number of different systems and uh, I'm just going to list them out and then we're going to go through and take a look at them and describe them. Okay, so those are the things we're going to look at and, and what I hope to be able to show you is that heat transfer exists all around us and consequently it has uh, significant application into our modern lives. So what we're going to be doing, we're going to be looking at uh, heat transfer within residential buildings, we're going to look at heat transfer within residential electrical systems, we'll take a look at uh, what I call everyday living, places where heat transfer has an impact in our everyday lives. We'll take a look at refrigeration systems that we have in our homes. Uh, lots of heat transfer there. Laptop computers, they generate a lot of heat. They dissipate a lot of heat. Uh, anybody who has a laptop in their lap obviously knows that they generate heat. So we're gonna take a look at that. And then finally, we'll conclude by looking at transportation systems. So this is a bit of a gee whiz lecture. Uh, the purpose of it is to provide you with a little bit of motivation and background for why we're studying heat transfer. So let's begin. So we're beginning with residential buildings and here we have a hot water boiler in a house and we're going to zoom in on the area where the energy is being added. So here what we're looking at, these are flames. We're burning natural gas and the heat that is generated is used to heat a boiler. Water is circulated using a circulation pump and then that goes through a manifold system and and through pipes that extend throughout the house. Here you can see one of the pipes going through one of the floorboards and it goes up and then it goes into hot water radiators. And so through natural convection, which we'll study in this course, that is how the heat is transferred from the liquid through fins into the room and that's what heats it. Now, where does that heat go? Well, eventually it goes out into the atmosphere and here you can see some homes and a lot of the heat loss obviously is coming through the windows. That's one of the areas where we have uh, the uh, lowest resistance to heat flow and consequently that is heat transfer in residential buildings. Another one we're going to take a look at, let's now look at residential electrical systems. And so this begins with the power that is coming to our homes from power plants that could be very, very far away. Uh, but what happens is that power is at a high voltage, it needs to be reduced and there you can see a transformer on a pole. Uh, if you have un underground lines, yeah, that's another transformer. Again, the transformers get hot. It comes into our homes into a distribution panel. There you can see the ground fault circuit interrupts are a little hotter. We have a stove clock, a telephone, they're all generating heat, a cable splitter, a power bar, a cable box with your TV, a photo frame, they generate a lot of heat as you can see on the right, a ground fault circuit interrupt plug on the left and a dimmer switch on the right. And then these are interior wall plugs and exterior wall plugs. You can see on the exterior, we lose heat to the outside. So that's a look, a quick look at electrical systems. Now, a lot of those systems uh, are being cooled naturally and, and consequently there is no forced uh, convection uh, providing the cooling. But cooling of electronic systems is very, very important and, and we will be looking at that throughout this course. The next segment that we're going to look at is what I call everyday living. So let's take a look at that. Now, everyday living, we're going to begin with the biological. A professor that is in shape is a happy professor. This is me on a stair stepper and you're going to see a 45 minute workout compacted into a number, short number of seconds. You can see as I go into the workout, you're looking at it every five minutes. So watch what happens to my body. I'm getting pretty hot. Uh, you can see that I'm sweating a lot, so my body is regulating the temperature uh, by perspiring and then that provides cooling to my body. And as I go on and on, you can see that my head is getting hotter, as are my hands. There I'm done, I'm stretching a little bit. 
and there you can see the byproduct of exercise. I'm very happy. Uh, we have hot water systems in our home. So there you can see hot water coming out of the tap. You change it to cold, all of a sudden the water goes black. So actually it's just cold and with the infrared camera you can see it. This is something that I like to do every day. I, I do like coffee, I have to admit. So here is an automatic espresso maker and you can see the hot espresso coming into the cup. Lots of heat transfer in these things if you've ever taken one apart. A number of different boilers and you take that hot coffee and here we're pouring hot coffee into cold milk so the milk is on the bottom and there you can see the beautiful natural convection cells that are forming we will study those in this course uh, they're not as perfect as Rayleigh Bernard convection cells that we will look at but nonetheless they are convection cells and eventually the coffee and milk comes to a uniform temperature and there is the coffee cup ready to be consumed. So that is a heat transfer in everyday living. The next thing that we're going to take a look at are refrigeration systems. Uh, household refrigeration used to be done by bringing in a block of ice and you'd put it in what they called the ice box. Uh, and then through the development of the refrigeration cycle, uh, using different types of working fluids, which I cover in my thermodynamics course, uh, we have the convenience of having refrigeration in our home. So this is something that happened long, long ago. But anyways, let's take a look at those. Uh, refrigeration systems, we're going to look at two different types. Uh, we'll look at what I call a free convection uh, refrigerator and a forced convection refrigerator. So let's begin with the free convection. And so there you can see the compressor at the bottom and the heat rejection in this cycle is through coils that are on the back of the refrigerator and those coils are connected to wires that are essentially acting as fins and then you have natural convective heat transfer. So those coils are hot and there when you look on the IR camera you can see the compressor is very hot. You have the hot refrigerant going up and then coming through the coils and that's where it rejects heat to the room. Now more modern refrigerators, they've compacted everything into the bottom and we use forced convection. So there is a fan in these systems. So there you can see the IR on the left, the compressor is hot and then the coils are on the right. And there you can see the fan right in the middle. And what it does is it forces air to go over the coils where we're rejecting the heat from the refrigerant. Uh, which then becomes part of the cycle for refrigeration. So lots of heat transfer in your refrigerator. Uh, the next thing we're going to look at, electronics. Uh, a lot of cooling is required in electronics. And, and so we're going to take a little bit of a, uh, a history review of laptop computers. So Let's take a look at the IR signature of laptops. This is from 1998, a Micron Transport XKE. You can see the thermal signature. Uh, Sony with a P3 processor from 99. Another Sony, another P3 from 2001. Another Sony, this one with a Pentium M from 2005. Uh, here's another Sony. This one always operates hot for some reason with an i7. And then here's another Sony that does not operate as hot. Uh, so those are Sonys. Here are some Apples. Apple manages the heat in a very different way. It brings it out behind the keyboard as you can see in these images. So that's a MacBook Pro and then a MacBook Pro 15 with a Retina display. And, and you can see where the heat is dissipated. And this is an older Dell, but I like this one, 2002, for the reason that I have a motherboard. And so we can take a look at what's going on on the inside. And there I zoom in on the processor. And if you look at the processor, it is attached to a heat dissipation system. There's a heat pipe which then moves over to uh, some fins and then there's fans on the other side of the fins that uh, result in forced convective heat transfer to remove the heat from the processor. And so that was a heat pipe that you're looking at. And we will be looking at, at the basis of heat pipes when we study boiling and condensation in this course. And we'll also be looking at fins. So all of those things we're going to be looking at in this course. And, and cooling of laptops as we put more and more transistors onto the processors becomes more and more of an issue. And, and consequently, uh, there's tons and tons of heat transfer in uh, any kind of electronic systems, as we can see with the laptops. The final thing we're going to look at is transportation. So transportation, 
uh, we're going to begin. This is a Chevy pickup truck. You can see the engine is hot, the exhaust pipe is hot. This is looking at the engine on the inside of the engine with the engine running. That's the radiator hose going to the engine block. Uh, and a lot of heat. The only thing that's cool in there is the air conditioning compressor, which is on the top in the middle, uh, as well as the inlet air duct. You can see that that's a little cooler, but everything else is very, very hot, including the alternator. Uh, looking, where does that energy go? Well, it propels the car and it also goes out through the exhaust. And so there you can see the exhaust pipe. Products of combustion are heat, uh, CO2, and water vapor, as we could see there. Uh, these are vehicles in transit. And so here we can see there are different thermal signatures for many different types of vehicles. Uh, there you have a big semi-trailer and it has uh, it, its exhaust pipes. When you look at the exhaust from the back, sometimes you see dual exhaust manifold. Sometimes you see just a single exhaust manifold uh, with the hot spot on the back of the car. And then these are cars in traffic. So on the left, we have stop and go traffic. On the right, we have free flow. And you can see in stop and go, the, the cars are getting hot uh, because they don't have as, as good of a uh, convective heat transfer as they've been designed for. And that's why they're operating very hot as they drive by and stop and go. Going Now, th this is an aircraft. This is a Dash 8 uh, landing in Calgary. And you can see the turboprop engine, a lot of heat there. Uh, and then on the left we can see the blade. And touchdown. And then finally this is another aircraft with a, a gas turbine engines coming in and you can see the gas turbine engines are very very hot. A lot of thermal systems are in there. Thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, heat transfer and consequently that is a very very important area of keeping the gas turbine blades cool as we'll see here. This is the blade from a gas turbine engine and what you're looking at here this is the leading edge of the gas turbine blade. Uh, looking at it from the end, you can see the cross section, and so it's a very curved shape. Uh, the other thing to notice, there is a bit of a bluish white coating, and that would be a coating to protect it from the high temperatures that would be encountered within the exhaust gas stream of the gas turbine engine. And the other thing to notice is that there are a number of ports on the bottom of the blade where it would go in. Uh, to the engine itself and compressed air from the compressor would be uh, used and, and ported through that ducting system and then it would come out through these small ports. There's some on the leading edge, there's some up on the tip of the blade, uh, some towards the trailing edge and then even on the tip you can see there are more ports there. Those are used for cooling the blade uh, due to the hot combustion gases and, and that is uh, the gas turbine blade. So there we go. You can see a lot of heat transfer exists in systems that we have in our everyday lives, uh, be it transportation, be it things within residential, be it everyday living. So hopefully that provides you with motivation to uh, focus and study on heat transfer throughout this course uh, under the realization that it is very, very important to our lives. Everyday living, uh, we have enormous amounts of heat transfer in it. And I only focused on some of the things that we encounter daily. There are also industrial processes with enormous amounts of heat transfer uh, and, and, and consequently, but the principles are all the same and any of the principles that we develop for these systems would apply to industrial systems as well. So I uh, hope you enjoy that. You can come back and watch it if you need motivation while you're studying for exams or something like that. We're now going to take a look at uh, general conduction analysis. And so in order to do this, what we're going to do, we're going to start off with uh, Fourier's law, which if you recall is uh, the law that applies for analyzing conductive heat transfer. So if you recall Fourier's law, which is the conduction rate equation, what we said was that the heat flux in 
Now we looked at it for one dimension, so let's say it's in the x direction, it is related to the thermal conductivity, the area through which that heat is flowing, and then the gradient of temperature in the dimension that we're looking at. So in this case, the x direction. Now this equation is observed. It, it is not a derived equation. So it's observed from experiments. So it's what we call a phenomenological equation. So this equation, uh, phenomenological, and it's derived from experimentation and from observations. Now, the equation that we've shown here is for a one-dimensional case. And this equation can be extended into multiple dimensions. And, and so we can extend it to three dimensions. And let's write that out. So what we can do, we can write the heat flux as a vector. And so here we can see we have the x component in the i direction, the y component in the j, and the z component in the k direction. And we can also relate this to Fourier's law. And so let's do that in this line. And what we'll do, we'll pull the minus Ka, so the thermal conductivity multiplied by the projected area out of the brackets. And then what is left on the inside is just going to be the derivative with respect to the dimension. But instead of being an ordinary differential, what we'll now have is we're going to have partial differentials because we're looking at a case where the temperature could be a function of multiple variables. So looking at this, we can rewrite this as the heat flux, which is a vector, is minus K, the thermal conductivity, times an area. And looking at what we have in the brackets here, if you review your vector, uh, vector mathematics, you'll recall uh, that one of the vector operators uh, was this is the gradient operator. And it's the gradient of the temperature, temperature T, which is a scalar. So here the gradient and the gradient, if you recall from your math courses, is defined in the following way. And we would have whatever it is that we're operating on in brackets here. So that's the gradient operator, and that's essentially Fourier's law in three dimensions then for all three spatial dimensions. Now, what we can do, we can illustrate what is going on graphically. And, and so let's take a look at what that looks like. And we'll look at this in 2D. So let's imagine we have some object and we'll write it out as being X and Y. And if we could go in and measure the temperature at every point in that object and then plot up what we call isotherms. So those would be lines of constant temperature. We would get something like this. So if those were our lines of constant temperature, and if we were to take this field and we were to compute the gradient of this field, uh, we would get lines that we call gradient lines. So I'll sketch those on. And the gradient lines are going to be perpendicular to the isotherm lines. And if we were to take a particular point within this space, so let's take this point right here. And we'll call that point x, y. And we were to evaluate the gradient at that point. Remember the gradient is going to give us a vector. So it's going to have direction. So the gradient is going to be in this direction here. And essentially what it is representing is the direction of the maximum change in temperature. So that would be the gradient of temperature. And if I keep drawing a line, okay, so we get that. Now, 
If you recall, uh, and we, we know just from physical experience that heat always flows from a, a hot point to a colder point. And consequently, what we're seeing here is the gradient is showing us the direction in which the heat is flowing. And it's going to go from a region of high temperature to low temperature. And so the, the gradient is just simply showing us the direction that the heat is flowing in. And it happens to be that where you get the maximum change in temperature with position. And that's what the gradient operator is showing. So the heat is flowing in the direction of maximum temperature decrease. Now, if we want to evaluate the heat flux, remember the heat flux is a vector because we had Q is minus Ka gradient of T, and T is a scalar. This is going to give us a vector when we take the gradient operator of the scalar temperature field. Uh, so if you want to be able to evaluate the heat flux Q, uh, what this is telling us, usually you'll know your thermal conductivity, but we need to be able to evaluate the temperature field in order to get the gradient of the temperature field. So that is one of the main goals within heat transfer analysis, depending upon the problem, but uh, usually for conduction, what we're after is to determine the temperature distribution within an object. So in order to proceed with this and, and start doing calculations, we need a way to be able to find out what the temperature is within an object. Okay, so we need a way to be able to find the temperature field. And so that's what we're going to do in the next segment. We're going to derive an equation. It's going to take a little bit of time. It's the heat diffusion equation, but this is the most general equation for conduction analysis, and it enables you to determine the temperature field in an object, provided you know a lot of information about that object, mainly the boundary conditions and what the material is on the inside. Uh, but nonetheless, what we'll do, we'll derive the heat diffusion equation and uh, with that equation, you can determine the temperature field, and from that you can get heat flux and, and determine the, the flow of heat throughout an object. All right, uh, what we're going to do in this segment, we're going to derive the heat diffusion equation. And if you recall from the last segment, what we did is we came up with an equation that enabled us to calculate the heat flux within an object. But uh, we said that in order to be able to evaluate the heat flux, we needed to know the temperature distribution inside of the object. And so that's where the heat diffusion equation comes in. It's an equation, it's a partial differential equation, and we'll derive that that enables us to determine the temperature within an object. And uh, sometimes people will shorten it and they'll call it the heat equation or the heat diffusion equation. So this is going to be kind of a long segment uh, because we've got to go through derivation and come up with this equation. Uh, but it's the best way to keep it continuous, and so that's why it's going to be a little bit longer. Uh, let me begin with an overview of where we're going with this. Okay, so there we go. Now, when we're looking at this, one of the main things that we're after, we want to know the temperature distribution within an object. And notice that I've put the temperature distribution as a function of the three spatial dimensions and time. Uh, we will be looking later in the course at transient analysis. Uh, and and that, that's where you have temperature within the object changing with time as well as with spatial location. And so we'll derive the heat diffusion equation in the most general sense. 
but in order to be able to calculate the temperature within an object, we need to know a number of different things. And, and the, one of the things is going to be the surface conditions on that object. And so we need to know either the temperatures and or heat transfer rates. So those are the boundary conditions on the surface. And, and so that's another piece of information that we need to know uh, along with the heat diffusion equation. So what we're going to do now, we're going to begin with the derivation of the heat diffusion equation. And we'll start by looking at a little infinitesimal chunk of, uh, of, of the object. And, and then we're going to apply conservation of energy to that. And then we'll derive the equation from there. So let's begin with our little chunk of object. Okay, so here we have an object, and remember our goal, we want to be able to come up with an equation that enables us to determine the temperature within that object as a function of time and space. And speaking of space, this is our coordinate system that we will be using. Okay, so now what we're going to do we're going to zoom in on a little cube within this object and we're going to expand it and within that cube I'm going to show the heat flux and energy generation and storage going on within that. So let me sketch that out now. Okay, so there we have our little cube and what I've shown is heat flux coming into and leaving all of the surfaces in our little cube. I've also shown on the inside uh, we can have storage, so energy storage is shown there, and we can also have energy generation. And so this object could be uh, storing and generating energy and we'll talk about how you can generate energy as we go on. Uh, but to write that out, the storage. And so our storage is going to be, it's essentially MC delta T per unit time. And so you'll notice dx, dy, dz, that is the differential volume of our little differential element here. Multiply that by the density. That gives us mass, and then we're taking mass times the specific heat capacity times the change in temperature with respect to time. And, and notice that I'm using the partial derivative of temperature. That's because temperature is a function of space as well as time. And then for energy generation, we're going to define Q dot. Q dot is going to be the rate of energy generation within our solid. And then that's going to be watts per meter cubed. And then we need to multiply that by volume dx, dy, dz. So what we're now going to do, we're going to take all of this and we're going to apply the conservation of energy equation, the first law of thermodynamics to this system. And that's going to give us an equation that we're then going to work with. Okay, so with the first law, what we can say is the energy flowing in plus the energy being generated minus energy leaving is equal to energy storage. And so what we're going to do, we're going to look at all of the mechanisms by which energy is coming in. Looking back here, where is energy coming in? Well, it's going to be coming from all of the surfaces where we have flow coming in, so or heat flux coming in, I should say. Uh, and then the last one is down there. So that's energy in, uh, energy out. That is going to be their energy is leaving, their energy is leaving, and their energy is leaving. And then we have the storage and the generation terms on the inside of the object. So uh, let's uh, expand this by subbing in the values. Okay, so we get this equation. I'm going to call this equation number one, and we will come back to this equation shortly. 
Uh, but that is going to be the, the basis for deriving the heat diffusion equation. Before we move on though, what I want to do, we're going to use Taylor series expansion in order to uh, work with this equation and to simplify some of the terms. So well, let's do a little bit of a math aside. I'm sure all of you have taken numerical methods courses or math courses and you've probably seen Taylor series expansions. Uh, they're, they're used quite often whenever we're dealing with equations like this. So let me just write out a little bit of a math aside. Okay, so in the Taylor series expansion, what we have, uh, it's written in terms of some arbitrary function. And we're saying that we're evaluating uh, this function at some point, a, a small distance away from where we know the functional value. So uh, we know the function at location x, but what we want to do is we want to try to find it at x plus dx. So here we know the function and here we don't know the function. So that's essentially what a Taylor series expansion is doing. And uh, this is in terms of one dimension expansion, so in one direction. And then what we're saying is that we take the function plus the slope. So the slope of this function, multiplying it by dx, which is the uh, distance between these two points. So if we know the slope of the function, and so let's say that is the change, so that is df by dx. And if we multiply it by this distance here, delta x, that enables us then to determine the value of the function at the next point. So that's just a linear uh, extrapolation essentially. And, and then higher up here, what we have here, we call these higher order terms. And we're going to neglect those in the analysis that we're doing here. Uh, but if you wanted to do a more precise analysis, you would carry those. So uh, looking at the Taylor series expansion, So if we have f being a function of x, y, z, which in this case uh, we do because we're dealing with a three-dimensional system, but in that case what you would do is you would just expand about one direction at a time. But then your slope is going to be the partial derivative because you're just interested in the slope in that one direction. And then we would have the higher order terms up there. So what we're going to do, we're going to take this and we're going to return back to our heat flux. And we'll consider the heat flux in the x direction to begin with. So we're going to look at qx plus dx. We're going to hold y and z constant and we're going to neglect the higher order terms. And so with that, we get this equation and then I can do the same for uh, the y and the z direction. And I'm going to call these equation two. So we have equation one, which was the energy balance. We have equation two, uh, which is basically using Taylor series expansion. And uh, we can take these, we can take equation one and we can take equation two. And the other thing we're going to do, we're going to recall our Fourier's law in three dimension. So in the earlier segment, we said that we could write the heat flux vector in terms of the gradient of the temperature. So we're going to sub that into equations one and two. So let's work through that. So first of all, uh, looking at the qx minus qx 
plus dx, which appears in equation 1. And I'm going to use our Taylor series expansion for that. So we have qx, and then writing out uh, how we evaluated using the Taylor series expansion. And we have plus partial partial by partial x, and in our Taylor series expansion we had qx there, so the heat flux in the x direction. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to make a substitution here from Fourier's law for that term, so let's plug that in. And we get that term. Now what I can do, I'm going to rearrange this a little. First of all, what we notice is Qx and Qx is going to cancel out. What I'm also going to do, I'm going to pull the area out. And the area, in terms of the x direction, is going to be the dimensions, uh, the two other dimensions. So the area, as far as x direction is concerned, is going to be dy dz. And so there is the area. the minus sign disappears because it's a minus minus and then we're left with dx and looking at this uh, what I can do I can do that for each of the three uh, directions so do it for the y and the z direction as well and then sub that into equation one so the energy equation and when we do that and I rearrange a couple of terms a little bit we get the following Okay, so that is our equation. We're getting places with this now. And uh, first of all, we notice dx, dy, dz is on both sides, and so that is going to cancel out. Uh, oops, I got a little error there. I'm sorry, that should not be dx. That should be dt, because we're looking at the uh, energy storage term. And so that's representing the energy that could be increasing or decreasing in our little differential element. So uh, this equation now uh, becomes the basis for our energy diffusion, uh, heat diffusion equation, I should say. And there are a couple of other simplifications that we sometimes make. And, and, and first of all, if the thermal conductivity is a constant in the object, we'll notice that it's there, there, and there. If thermal conductivity is a constant, we can pull it out of the uh, partial derivative operator for each of those terms. So let's do that. So that is if thermal conductivity does not vary around the object. If it's a constant, we can pull that out. And then I'm going to divide by the other terms. But what we end up with is the following. And these terms I'm dividing by the thermal conductivity because we pulled it out of the first three terms. And then the energy storage is this term. Okay, so this is becoming our uh, heat diffusion equation. And let's look at each of these term by term. And so it, what we have here could be a representation. Essentially, it's conduction or diffusion. And this mathematically can sometimes be represented as being del dot grad of T. And mathematically, that is also written as del squared T. That is a Laplacian operator. And, and so that is the first three terms that we cluster together. 
The next thing we have here is our Q dot term. And if you recall back, that was the generation term. So that is generation of energy. And where are we going to generate energy in a solid? Well, there are different ways you can do this. You, you might have nuclear decay. And that is then generating energy. You could have chemical reactions. And if it is exothermic, it'll be generating energy. Endothermic, it'll be absorbing energy. But no matter what, you're going to have a change. Uh, electrical resistance, we have the heating effect within electrical resistors. Uh, and, and that can also generate energy. And so there are other forms that you can generate energy. So those are examples of energy generation. And then finally, on the right-hand side, this is our storage term. So energy storage. So that is the heat diffusion equation in its most uh, uh, non-simplified form. So in its most general form. Now what we often do is we simplify this a bit. So I'm going to look at a number of different ways of simplifying the heat diffusion equation. Um, well, first of all, let's assume that we have steady state. So if we have steady state, what that implies is any term that is a derivative with respect to time is going to be zero. So looking back at the heat diffusion equation, the only place where we have a derivative with respect to time is our storage term uh, over on the right hand side. And so that term would disappear. So that would be if we have steady state. Another simplification we could have is if we had a transient, so uh, the time derivative remains, but no heat generation. And so that would be Q dot equals zero. And another simplification that we can have is we can have steady state and no heat generation. And that would imply the derivative with respect to time is zero and Q dot is equal to zero. And with that, then we are just left with the Laplacian and that would be equal to zero. So that is the heat diffusion equation. Uh, now, as with any kind of e equation, differential equation, be it ordinary or partial differential equation, we need boundary conditions in order to solve this. So uh, we need boundary conditions to solve for temperature x, y, z, or t. So boundary conditions are what are required. We take this equation, the mathematical physics equation, coupled with the boundary conditions, and then we can determine what's going on on the inside. Uh, and how you do that, that, that's another matter. It could either be numerically or you do it analytically for very, very simple types of problems. Um, but anyways, what we'll do in the next segment, we're going to take a look at the boundary conditions that apply to the heat diffusion equation. But that is the heat diffusion equation. And you can use this to determine the temperature distribution within an object uh, undergoing conduction. <laughs> All right, in the last segment, what we did, we spent quite a bit of time coming up and deriving the heat diffusion equation. And we concluded by saying that the heat diffusion equation enables us to determine temperature inside of an object, uh, provided that we know the boundary conditions on the surface. So what we're going to do in this segment, we're going to take a look at the typical boundary conditions that you can come across uh, when you're solving heat transfer problems.
And so it's with these boundary conditions that we're then able to solve with the heat diffusion equation for the temperature inside of an object. So what we're going to do in all of the cases here that we're going to look at, we're going to consider a uh, one-dimensional object or a surface. So we're going to look at a 1D object and we're going to uh, assume that the surface takes place at x equals 0. And we're going to begin with the simplest type of boundary condition. And that is where we have a constant temperature on the surface. So a constant surface temperature. And so drawing out our object, so this would be uh, the solid that we're looking at. So there we have our solid. This would be x equals 0 on the surface. And let's assume that we know the surface temperature. We're trying to solve for the temperature within that object. And so that is an unknown, but we know the surface temperature. So then this would be constant surface temperature. The way that we can write this out would be T at x equals 0. And for time is equal to the surface temperature. So how might you create that type of a boundary condition? Well, one way that you could do that is uh, with an ice bath, for example, or boiling water, although that would vary depending upon the elevation of where you are located. Uh, but a good example here would be that of an ice bath. So that's the most simple boundary condition that you can encounter. Uh, then what we can do, we can have conditions where uh, we have constant heat flux at the surface. So let's take a look at heat flux boundary conditions. So drawing out our object again. Now, if we know the heat flux on the surface, so that would be Qx, what that is saying is that we know the slope of the temperature on the surface. So what we would do is we would use Fourier's law right on the surface here, and that would then provide us with an indication of the uh, temperature, the, the slope of the temperature at that point. So when you say constant surface heat flux, essentially what you're saying is that you know what the slope is. And recall Fourier's law, Qx equals minus Ka dt by dx. So essentially what we're saying is that if we know this, we know that. And that is what we get the slope from. So that would tell us what the slope is right on the surface. And then as we go further into the object, it can deviate in some other way. And that would be our x of t for the temperature then. And, and so writing this out mathematically, we would say qx over a is minus k dt by dx at x equals zero. And that comes directly out of Fourier's law. An example, how could you create a constant heat flux condition? Uh, one thing that you could do, there could be a radiation from some source or an electrical resistance heater would be another example. provided that you insulate the outside of it so that you don't lose heat to the outside. So that is constant heat flux. And there is another form of constant heat flux surface, that of no heat flux. And we refer to that. So let's call uh, this here, sorry, I should have put an A. This is finite heat flux. And 
and we can have B, which would be adiabatic or insulated surface or no heat flux. And if you have an insulated surface, adiabatic, we're then assuming that there is no heat flux coming through the surface. In reality, you will, any kind of insulation, you will have uh, heat flux, but this is something we assume in heat transfer. Whenever it says insulated surface, uh, you usually assume that to mean zero heat flux going through it, or if it's adiabatic. And with that, we then get dt by dx at x equals zero is equal to zero. And so looking at that in terms of a schematic, I'll draw this a little more compact here. So what that is saying is that the slope of the temperature is going to be uh, zero at the wall. And so we would have a condition that might look like this, and then it can deviate off. Tx of t would then be our temperature distribution and x again is going in that direction. So that's the case of an adiabatic or insulated surface as well as one with a finite heat flux. The last boundary condition that, that we commonly look at is that where you have a convective boundary condition and so you have fluid outside of the wall and so we call that a convective surface condition. And if you have convection on the surface from Newton's law of cooling uh, and from Fourier's law, from Fourier's we know this, and then from Newton's law of cooling we can write this. And so uh, writing out a schematic of what is going on here, we have our wall, x is going in that direction, and then out here we have some fluid, And so what this is then telling us is it's essentially giving us relationship between the slope and the convective heat transfer. And, and with that, it is specifying the slope on the surface. And it is assuming that we have the temperature at x equals zero and time there, because uh, that can change as a function of time, but you would need that surface temperature uh, for the convective surface condition. So that is a, the third boundary condition that we can have. Uh, we can have uh, constant heat flux, constant temperature, or convective boundary condition on the surface. So with those boundary conditions, we use those to uh, solve the heat diffusion equation. Okay. So we use the heat diffusion equation in these boundary conditions and the boundary conditions are applied on the surface of the object and what that does that enables us then to determine the internal temperature distribution in the object and and so the way that we do that there are a couple of different techniques that we use we can do this analytically 
And that means that you solve a closed form mathematically for a temperature distribution. It would be a function then. There are a number of different uh, types of objects that you can actually do that for. And sometimes it turns out into being an infinite series. And we'll look at that when we, we look at uh, multidimensional conduction later on in the course. And the other way that we can do it is numerically. And there are different solution techniques for solving the heat diffusion equation numerically. We will look at one in this course as well that uses Excel. It's kind of a very basic one, but it's actually not bad. It solves for things in two dimensions. And so we'll take a look at that. And, and so that is how you would go about applying these boundary conditions. So that is, it provides an overview of the heat diffusion equation and the boundary conditions that you would apply. And we're going to be looking at these a little later on in the course. Um, what we're going to do in the next lecture, we're going to take a look at kind of an alternative mode of doing analysis. And that is for the case where you're only looking at one dimensional problems. Uh, it is steady state and no heat generation on the inside of the object. And we'll be able to do some analysis for those. Uh, and, but then if you want to do more complex, then you got to go to the heat diffusion equation and use these techniques that we have here, which we will look at later on in the course. So anyways, that is heat diffusion equation and the boundary conditions. What we're going to do in this lecture, we're going to take a look at a method of conduction analysis called the alternative method. And essentially it's a method that relies on Fourier's law. It applies to one dimensional conduction uh, without heat generation and for steady state scenarios. So, uh, but in general, when you're looking at conduction analysis, there are a number of different methods that exist and we'll be looking at in this course. One method is the heat diffusion equation, which we looked at in the last lecture. We haven't solved it yet, but we derived the equation. We'll be solving it later when we look at uh, two-dimensional conduction for very simplified cases. So the heat diffusion equation, numerical analysis, and we'll be looking at a technique later on in the course as well. That uh, uses Excel. And then finally, uh, what we call the alternative method. Uh, essentially, it's a method that relies on uh, Fourier's law. And so there are some restrictions in terms of where this will apply, but it kind of gives us a shortcut way of doing conduction analysis. And so that's what we'll be working on in this lecture. Uh, but looking at this alternative method, there are some heavy restrictions on this alternative method that we're going to be looking at. Uh, we have to have steady state conduction. So that means no transients. The d by dt term goes away. One dimensional. Although we will extend this to problems dealing with cylindrical and spherical coordinates, but uh, for those you consider them to be one dimensional and you'll see what we're talking about when we get there. So one dimensional conduction Basically what happens is the only change is in the radial direction for cylindrical or spherical. And the final restriction is no heat generation. So if we can make those three restrictions, uh, then we can use this alternative method. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to kind of set it up and, and then we're going to look at it for uh, three different applications, one being uh, just one dimensional conduction in a solid, then we'll look at uh, radial, cylindrical coordinate, and spherical. 
Uh, but let's begin in a generic manner looking what we're talking about here. So let's assume that we have some chunk of, of material, a very technical word for it, but it's some piece of material. Uh, we have insulated walls. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to assume uh, that this uh, object that we're looking at is aligned about the x-axis. So that is our x-axis there. And with that, x will be going in that direction. And so this would be x equals x naught at this location. And what I'm going to assume is that at each of the positions along the x-axis uh, that the temperature is constant across that entire plane. So we'll assume that we have T naught there. And the other thing I'm going to assume is that I know the area as a function of distance in the x-direction. And then on the back surface here, this here, I'll say I know the temperature there, and we'll call that T1. So what we're going to do, we're going to uh, draw out a little differential element here. So let me do that now. And so there is our differential element. And what we're going to do, let's take a look at what that differential element might look like. Okay, so there's our differential element. We're going to say the thickness in the dire x direction is dx. And then what I'm going to assume is we have heat flux in this direction, qx. And then on the back surface of the differential element, it will be qx plus dx. So that is the heat transfer in and the heat transfer out. Uh, let's write out Fourier's law. So this is one dimensional heat transfer. So I have an ordinary uh, differential here instead of a partial differential. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to rearrange Fourier's law. And essentially what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna bring the area over to the right hand side and the dx over, so let, let's rearrange this. So we have that if we rearrange Fourier's law. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to integrate this. So the integral on this side is going to go from x naught to x. And over here, we're going to integrate from t naught to t. Now notice what I've done is I've written uh, the thermal conductivity as being a function of temperature. Thermal conductivity is a function of temperature. Quite often for our analysis, however, we will consider it not to be a function of temperature. So sometimes you can pull that out and we will be making that assumption as we go on with this analysis. So let's take Fourier's law as written. And if we can assume thermal conductivity is a constant, And in this case, I'm saying it's a constant. It means it's independent of temperature. If we can make that approximation, then we end up with this equation here. Okay, so this is an equation that if we know the change in area as a function of x, 
we should be able to determine the temperature distribution in an object. Uh, we do have heat flux in there as well, and, and we'll show that that comes out of the boundary conditions, but we're able to figure that out. But what we're going to do, we're going to take this equation, we're going to apply it to a number of different scenarios. One is just a one-dimensional conduction problem, and then we'll look at applying it to uh, cylindrical and spherical coordinates. But that kind of sets up the alternative method technique. <laughs> In the last segment, what we did is we talked about a, an alternative method using Fourier's law for determining uh, conduction problems. And what we're going to do, we're going to begin by uh, solving an example problem. And this is for the alternative method. And what this will do, it will show what types of things we can calculate using this technique. And if you recall, uh, it was for the case of uh, steady, uh, so no, we, we don't have uh, time derivative, uh, no generation, and one-dimensional conduction. So let me begin by writing out the problem statement, and then we'll work through it. Okay, so there's our problem statement. What we have, we have a conical section, which is very similar to what we looked at in the last segment. Uh, we're told the thermal conductivity. Uh, we're given information about the diameter, and recall we needed to know the area as a function of position. So knowing the diameter, we can get the area. Uh, we are told the temperatures at the two surfaces of this conical section and then we're asked to derive two things. One is the temperature distribution as a, a function of position throughout this conical section and the second one is the heat transfer rate. So let's begin by writing out what we know, what we're looking for, and then a schematic. Okay, so that's what we know and what we're looking for, uh, our schematic. And I won't put it in three dimensions this time. Okay, so that is the schematic, uh, the assumptions that we're going to make. Well, they're going to be the assumptions that we used for the alternative method. So those are steady state. Two is that we're dealing with one dimensional conduction. So that means that the surfaces are well insulated as we've shown here. Three is that there is no internal heat generation. And the last one, which enabled us to pull the thermal conductivity out of the integral sign when we derived the alternative method, was K is equal to a constant. So K is not a function of temperature nor position within the object. So for the analysis, what we're going to do, let's begin with Fourier's law. And we're going to follow in the same steps that we did before. Uh, what we need to do, we need to figure out the area as a function of position, position being x. So it is a conical section, so it has round cross-section. So the cross-sectional area at any point is pi d squared divided by 4, subbing in the value for the diameter. Oops. 
So what we can do, we can take this area that we have here and we'll sub it into Fourier's law and then rewrite and rearrange. So we get that equation and what we're going to do, looking back at our schematic, we're going to integrate between this position and any particular x location. So we're going to come up with an expression for t as a function of x and consequently we'll be evaluating the temperature at an arbitrary x. So that's what we're going to do now. So we get this equation here. Uh, let's go ahead and integrate that. And recall the first thing that we're after. We want to be able to find t of x. So we have t of x in this equation here. Let's isolate for it. So we get that, and that gives us an equation for t of x, which was one of the things we were after. However, if you notice, in this equation we have the q of x, and we still don't know what that is. So uh, we need to uh, solve for q of x, and how are we going to get that? Well, we're going to use the boundary conditions. And so we've already used t at x1, uh, we do know t at x2, and that is t2, and so let's go ahead and do that in order to find what q is. So we have this equation here. What we want to do, we want to be able to isolate for the heat flux and going through this uh, conical object. So let's solve for q of x. So we have that. Let's plug in all of the values. When we plug them in, we get minus 2.12 watts. So uh, we have a minus. Why do we have a minus? Well, if we go back, let's take a look at our schematic, which was right here. Uh, we said that x positive was going in this direction. And notice we're going from a low temperature, 400, up to a higher temperature, 600. Consequently, heat's going to flow from the hotter temperature to the lower. So really, the heat flux is in that direction, opposite the direction that we've shown it. And so consequently, what that is telling us is that the heat flux is going from x2 to x1 and so it's consistent it makes sense and that's why it's a negative so that is the alternative method for one-dimensional conduction in a conical section what we're going to do in the next segment we're going to look at applying same technique to cylindrical coordinates and then after that we'll have another segment looking at applying it to spherical and then we're going to start to consolidate things and make this into a technique that we can use for uh, general 1D conduction analysis. So that's where we're going. All right, in the last segment, what we did, we took a look at a uh, conical section uh, with one-dimensional conduction. We used the alternative method, which uses Fourier's, uh, Fourier's law for 1D conduction. What we're going to do now, we're going to look at cylindrical So a system involving cylindrical coordinates. And for this, uh, what we have is a cylinder. Conduction is radial. 
which is what gives us the one dimensionality. So it's not going in the axial direction. Uh, we're going to assume that it is steady state. One D, no heat generation. And the last thing, thermal conductivity is a constant, so it's not a function of temperature. So those were all the things required for us to use this alternative method. Uh, what I'm going to do, begin writing out a schematic, and then we're going to apply it and see what we get when we uh, look at doing this for a cylindrical coordinate system. Okay, so here we have our cylindrical coordinate system. Uh, we have some object uh, and we're trying to determine the temperature at radial location R. The area, uh, so what's happening, we have the center, uh, the internal radius is Ri, the outer radius is R0, so there's R0 and there's Ri and we're trying to determine temperature at some given location. Our thermal conductivity, we're told, is K of the material, and Ti and T outer are the boundary conditions for the temperature. The area, in terms of what the uh, heat flux is going through, is going to be the circumference of this uh, cylinder at a given radial location R multiplied by the length and usually you do per unit length but anyways that is the scenario that we have now what we want to do we're, we're going to follow a very similar procedure to what we did uh, in the last example where we're looking at the conical section and we're going to write out Fourier's equation and we're going to introduce the area function that we have here and then we're going to integrate that uh, from the inner radial location to this arbitrary radial location that we're determining things. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so there's Fourier's law. What we're going to do, input the area. We'll bring it over to the left-hand side. So we get that equation there. Now we want to integrate that. So we have that, and now, uh, oops, I forgot a R, sorry about that. There should be an R there. So we're going to integrate that, dr over R, the integral, that's a natural logarithm. So we get that equation, and just like before, what we want to do, we want to isolate to get our t uh, an arbitrary radial location r. So let's go ahead and do that. So we get this equation here. Now we're not quite home free yet and the reason is is we still have the QR in there. So we need to determine that. How do we determine that? Well we have our boundary conditions. We have TI at RI and we have T outer at R outer. We've already used this one so now we're going to use that boundary condition. And when we apply that we get for QR we get this relationship here. So that then enables us to determine uh, the temperature distribution and the heat flux in a cylindrical coordinate system. 
In the next segment, what we'll do, we'll take a look at applying this to a spherical coordinate system. Okay, so what we're going to do now, we're going to look at the last geometric shape, that is a sphere for this alternative method of doing conduction analysis. So we're going to look at a sphere. And we are going to assume that it is radial conduction only. And the other assumption, steady state. 1D, no heat generation, and the last one is K is equal to constant, so it's not a function of temperature. So those were all the requirements that we had for this alternative method. I'll begin by drawing out a sphere, and then we'll work through using uh, Fourier's law. Okay, not a great sphere, but it is a sphere nonetheless. So what we have, we have some hollow sphere, and we're going to say we have internal radius Ri, we have outer radius R0, and we're interested in what's going on at some arbitrary radius R, and we're going to then try to solve for T at R. And temperatures, those are the boundary conditions that we're going to have. Uh, let's say that we know Ti and we know T outer. All right, so that's the information we have. The area of a sphere, you better know the area of a sphere. The volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed. And the area uh, would be the derivative of that with respect to r. So area is 4 pi r squared. All right, that's the area of a sphere. You have no idea how many times during exams I have students ask me, what's the area of a sphere uh, and what is the volume of a sphere? Those are things that you should have memorized. That and the quadratic equation. Remember, memorize those things. Okay, uh, here we go. Uh, Fourier's law We have Fourier's law, we're going to rearrange that. We put in the area of the sphere. And we're going to integrate this to our arbitrary R location. Okay, so we get that equation there. Now what we want to do is we want to integrate that. And looking at this equation here, remember this is the thing that we're after. We want to have a way to determine the temperature distribution within our hollow sphere. Uh, so we rearrange this and we can come up with the following expression. And we get this relationship. Now, like before, we have not uh, finally solved everything. So we still have that heat flux in there. How are we going to get that? Well, we have our boundary conditions. Coming back here, we have, we've used this boundary condition. We haven't used that one. So let's apply the boundary condition.
Okay, there we go. So that gives us the heat loss uh, for this uh, spherical object where we know the inner and outer temperature is OL. It gives us the temperature distribution. So those are three different things that we can do. Uh, we've looked at spherical, cylindrical, and we looked at one dimensional. That was for the conical section. As long as you know the area as a function of position and you can assume it to be 1D, uh, steady, no internal generation, and the thermal conductivity being a constant uh, as a function, not a function of temperature. If you have all of those, you can come up with these equations. So we've done a lot with this, but what we're going to do in the next lecture, engineers are lazy. Uh, not quite. We're, we're not lazy. We're efficient. So what we're going to do, we're going to package all of this stuff together and come up with a more compact way of being able to apply these ideas and apply them to calculations in a fairly quick manner. And, and so that's what we'll be looking at in the next lecture uh, as we continue on using the alternative method for conduction analysis. Okay, so what we're doing, we're doing conduction analysis. We're looking at this thing called an alternative method. Uh, but recall methods of conduction analysis, there are several. We have the heat diffusion equation. That's the big complex partial differential equation. You need to have boundary conditions. You can solve for the temperature inside of an object. Uh, and sometimes for certain shapes you can do analysis and, and solve that analytically, which we will be looking at later in the course. Uh, numerical analysis, I've already talked about uh, what we're going to be doing there. And we will look at numerical analysis and I'll give you an Excel spreadsheet tool that enables you to do two-dimensional numerical analysis, but there are other techniques as well. Uh, and then finally, what we've been focusing on uh, for the last, we did this last lecture, is what we call this alternate or alternative method. And essentially, it's using Fourier's law under some rather severe assumptions. But it turns out these are pretty good assumptions because for many of the systems that we study, um, these assumptions do apply. So let me just briefly overview what that alternate method was and then what the results were. And then we'll move on uh, looking at how to apply it for engineering problems. So if you recall the alternate method, uh, we started with Fourier's law minus Ka dt by dx. And if you know the area as a function of x, or it could be radial location as we saw for cylindrical and spherical coordinates, uh, but if you know that, then you can make a substitution into Fourier's law And then what we did is we rearranged that and we set it up to enable us to be able to integrate. But typically what we were doing is we were pulling the area over to the left hand side uh, in the denominator and then we were left with minus k dt. This is where we said that we're going to assume that the thermal conductivity is not a function of temperature so that enabled us to pull it out of the integral which I'll show you in a moment. So we have qx and we integrate from some boundary condition that we know what's going on to some x location that we're trying to figure out what the temperature is. And you divide that by a as a function of x. You pull k out of the integral from t1. That's the temperature at the boundary condition at 1. And then we have the integral dt. Now this works. It works subject to a couple of constraints. Uh, one of them we had to have steady state. The second constraint that we had was one dimensional. 
So that means that all the heat is flowing only in one dimension, not in two or three dimensions, which we'll look at later on in the course. Uh, third one, no heat generation inside of the material that we're studying. And the fourth was that K is equal to a constant. So the thermal conductivity is not a function of temperature. And what do we get out of this? Well, you get T of X and you get Q of X. So we were able to get the heat transfer and the temperature profile. In terms of engineering, this is usually the one that we are most interested in because we want to figure out what the heat loss is. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to summarize the three different systems that we looked at. And we looked at the plane wall. Well, it wasn't quite a plane wall. We looked at that example problem uh, with a conical section, but this would be what you would get if you were to look at the plane wall. So I'll draw out a schematic. So that's a schematic. Now what we were able to determine was the temperature distribution. We were able to determine the heat flux and so what we did for all three cases, we plug Q of X into T of X in order to give us the temperature distribution in the solid. Okay, so that was for a plain wall. We also looked at a cylinder So that was the geometry for the cylinder, RI, R outer. And what we obtained here was the temperature distribution. And if you recall for the cylinder, it resulted in a natural logarithm. We were able to solve for the heat flux. And just like for the plane wall, if you plug the heat flux into the temperature distribution, we were able to come up with the temperature distribution function in the cylinder. Okay, so that's what we got for a cylinder, pipe flow, and many, many engineering applications where we would have cylindrical coordinate systems and we're trying to determine heat loss. Uh, but that's what we got for the cylinder. And then finally, spherical. This might be something like a storage tank. Uh, you could have spherical coordinates. Okay, so that's a scenario for the sphere. Temperature distribution. And just like for the other two, you plug Q of R into T of R. And you get the temperature distribution in the wall of this sphere. Okay, so those are the three different uh, geometries that we've considered. And uh, the reason why I put them all out is because we're going to summarize them in the next segment. And what we'll do, we're going to look at the uh, form of them. And it turns out that there is some sort of commonality to all three of the forms that we have here for both the heat flux as well as the temperature distribution. And, and so what we'll do, we'll come up with a shortcut method that enables us to analyze what is going on for heat transfer either through a plane wall, through a cylinder, or a sphere. 
and it will be able to do more than just what we're looking at here. We'll be able to do scenarios where you might have a sphere with insulation on the outside of this sphere. So you might have some insulating layer and then there might be convective heat transfer going on out here. So you have wind blowing and, and that has an impact. We're going to develop a technique that will enable us to look at that and that is referred to as being thermal resistances. So that's where we're going with all this in case you're wondering. Uh, we don't want to have to solve these equations all the time and write out all these different terms. We'll come up with shortcut methods. And that's why I said engineers are efficient. I said engineers are lazy, but that's not true. Engineers are very efficient. We like to find shortcuts and ways to be able to do things more effectively and efficiently. So that's where we're going in the next segment. We're going to work towards thermal resistances based on the results that we got thus far with this alternative method using Fourier's law. Okay, so what we've been looking at is this alternative method. We've come up with the equations for the heat flux in uh, one-dimensional conduction uh, that is steady state, the thermal conductivity being uh, constant, not a function of temperature, and no internal generation. We looked at a plain wall, a cylinder, and a sphere. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take those results, we're going to put them together into this concept called thermal resistances. And, and this uh, part of the motive for this is the fact that heat transfer, in a way, is very similar to uh, the flow of electricity through a conductor. And if you recall, when we looked at heat transfer mechanisms, conductive heat transfer mechanisms in solids, we said that the conduction was through two ways. It was through lattice vibration and through electron motion. And consequently, it's natural to expect that there's some sort of relationship or analogy between electrical conduction and heat transfer. So let me begin by making a comment about that. So if you look in the uh, tables of thermal conductivity in the back of any heat transfer book, you'll find uh, things like copper, uh, aluminum. Aluminum is not as good, but it, it, it's still pretty good. Uh, but copper, gold, platinum, silver, those are all really good heat conductors. And they're also very good electrical conductors. And consequently, we have this uh, relationship here. And the reason is because conduction in solids is via both lattice vibration and electron motion. And the electron motion is the one that uh, enables us to have a good electrical conductor. So this is what brings up the idea of a thermal resistance. So this brings up the idea of a thermal resistance and we can use this when we have all of the restrictions that we had when we we're using that alternative method. So uh, you probably have them memorized by now. Steady state, one dimensional, no heat generation, And the last one was that the thermal conductivity was a constant, so it's not a function of temperature. So with that, what I'm going to do, I'm going to summarize what we found when we looked at the plane wall, the cylinder, and the sphere. And then we're going to look functionally for commonalities here. So let's look at all three of them. All right, so we have that for the uh, three different geometries that we looked at. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to rearrange each of these. And I'm going to rearrange them with the temperature differential on the left-hand side of the equation and Q in the numerator on the right and the other remaining items in the denominator on the right. So let's rewrite those. Okay, so we get those three different expressions and when we look at these, what we can do, and, and this borrows from electrical 
uh, conductors and Ohm's law, these relationships This looks a lot like V1 minus V2 equals I times R. If you recall from a course, if you've taken a course in electrical circuits. And what we have here, this is the basis of our analogy. And if we look at an electrical conductor, or a resistor I should say, we know that we have voltage one and then we have a voltage drop across our resistor or resistive element. We have current flowing in and we have current and continuity so the current continues flowing and it flows out uh, but there is a voltage drop. Well temperature drop is similar to the voltage drop. Uh, the current is similar to the heat flux and resistance is similar to the a thing that is in the denominator on the right hand side. So with this electrical resistance or thermal resistance analogy we can write T1 minus T2 is similar to V1 minus V2 and heat flux is similar to current, the flow of current. And so with that what we can do is we can rewrite our temperature difference and our heat flux and we introduce this new term here this RT we haven't seen this before but what RT is is everything that was in uh, the denominator on the right hand side of our equation so coming back here uh, we had this we had this and we had this one here so that's what RT comes out to be so what we're going to do now, let's take a look at all of these. I will go to a new slide just so that we have enough space. So looking at a plain wall, we have a thermal resistance, and that's what we're going to call this. And that is equal to the thickness of the wall divided by the area multiplied by the thermal conductivity and then repeating that for a cylinder and a sphere. Okay, so that is for a plain wall, a cylinder, and a sphere. And you'll see we have RT, and that stands for thermal resistance, and then we show conduction. Now, we haven't said anything about convection, but it turns out that convection, we can express it in a very similar manner as well. And if we look at Newton's law of cooling, again, we have a temperature difference or temperature differential. And here we have a thermal resistance for convection. I put CONV for convection. And that then is equal to 1 over HA. So that would be the thermal resistance for convection. So there we go. We have thermal resistances for conductions in a plain wall, a cylinder, a sphere, as well as for convection. And with this, what we can do, we can put these together. Uh, and first of all, we can say that high thermal resistance, if we have high thermal resistance, that would be analogous to being a good insulator. So RT equals good insulator. And we can do similar things as we do in electrical circuits. We can put the thermal resistances in series and we'll take a look at an example problem in the next segment that demonstrates this. So what you do is you sum up the uh, thermal resistances for all of the individual components. So you'd have one thermal resistance, another one, another one. And that might be a case where you have heat conduction through a wall that might look like that. And you have one material here, you have another material there. It would have a different thermal resistance and then a third material here with a third thermal resistance. So that's an example. And we also can do parallel, parallel circuit analysis.
And for here, very much similar to what we see with electrical circuits, it's 1 over the sum of 1 over all of the individual thermal resistance components. And, and so that would be the case where if you have a parallel circuit and you have another thermal resistance, that would be a parallel circuit. And what might that look like in terms of an object? That would be, uh, let me erase that. So let's say you have an object, you have a plain wall, but then half of it is one material and the other half is a different material and your heat flux is going in this direction. And same up here, the heat flux is going in that direction. So that is thermal resistance and what we'll do in the next segment, we're going to take a look at applying this to some example problems and then we'll talk about a couple of other things with thermal resistances, R values and contact resistance. In the last segment, what we did is we came up with the idea of thermal resistances and it is basically a, a bit of a shortcut technique for calculating uh, conduction problems. So what we're going to do now, we're going to work an example problem involving thermal resistances and heat loss through the wall of a house. Okay, and so there is our problem statement. What we have is we have a house wall uh, that consists of two 1.2 centimeter layers of fiber insulating board. Uh, and then there is eight centimeter layer of fiberglass pink on the inside between those two walls. So we have a layer, a layer, and then inside here uh, we have fiberglass pink. And then what we have is uh, we have a layer of brick on the outside. So there would be brick on the outside. And then what we're told is that we have convective environments on either side. Uh, so we have this layer of brick and then we have two convective environments. One is at minus 20 degrees C. So that's pretty cold. And I assume that is on the outside of the brick. So the outside of the house minus 20 degrees C, uh, we have convective environment. We're told the convective heat transfer coefficient is uh, uh, 15 watts per square meter degrees C. And then we also have another environment on the inside of the house. And so you might have forced air heating or, or you could have radiators. But in any event, you'll have air circulating inside of the house and the temperature inside the house, we're told, is 15 degrees C and H is equal to 8. H outside was 15. So that is what we have for this problem. Uh, and now what we want to do, we want to be able to figure out what is the heat loss, the rate of heat loss through this system. And, and so you can see we're going convection, conduction, 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 and then convection. So we've got a lot of stuff going on, but this is an ideal problem that you can use thermal resistances on. And it's a series problem. And, and so what we'll do, we'll work that uh, and we'll begin, like all the other problems, uh, let's write out what we know. Okay, so there is all the information that we were given in the problem. The last thing that I'm going to write out, uh, we were told to calculate heat loss per unit area and consequently what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign an area of one meter squared. So that is our unit area and the problem we're looking for the rate of heat loss or the heat transfer rate. So we're going to assume this is one dimensional 
And looking at the problem, all of the assumptions that led up to the thermal resistance technique will work. Uh, and those being we have steady state, one dimensional conduction, there's no internal generation in the wall and the thermal conductivities will assume are not functions of temperature. So with that, uh, what we'll do, we're going to come up with a schematic that has the uh, coordinates and the information in terms of lengths and, and things on it. So let me write that out. Okay, so there is the schematic for our problem. Uh, we have the convective environments on either side and then the wall. And just like I said earlier, we will assume the things that are required in order to apply thermal resistances. And that was steady state. One dimensional conduction. No internal heat generation. And the final thing is K is equal to a constant for all of the materials that we're dealing with. So given that, uh, what we're now going to do, we're going to perform the analysis using thermal resistances. And th this is a series problem. And so what we'll begin by doing is writing out what our a resistance network looks like and we're going to have uh, the number of resistances that we're going to have there will be one here uh, there will be two there there will be three here four five and then finally we're going to have six out here uh, I probably should have used different numbers because that's going to mess us up with the widths let me erase that So for thermal resistances, I will do A, B, C, D, E, and F. Each of those is going to have a thermal resistance, although we're going to have a different symbol for it. But anyways, that shows you the number of thermal resistances. So let's take a look at the analysis of this problem. So what we do when we're constructing our network we begin with the temperature at the one side, and that was T infinity I. And then we move along, and, and you'll notice we first get to the convective environment. So that has a thermal resistance associated with it. So we put a thermal resistance in. And the value of that is going to be RT for thermal resistance and then convection. And I'll do an I to denote that that is on the inside. And then we move along, looking back at our schematic. The next one that we hit is going to be the uh, wall board, which is on the outside of the wall. So that will have another resistance. And that will be due to conduction. So it will be thermal resistance, conduction, and I will give it the number one because that was the length scale that we had for that one. Then we move into the uh, fiberglass pink insulation and that had length scale two. So that will have its own thermal resistance and that will be RT again due to conduction three. Uh, looking back at our schematic, we then go through another wall board, length L3. And so that is going to have another thermal resistance, RT conduction 4. Next one, we're going to have the brick, which is on the outside of the wall. And so that is going to have another thermal resistance. Again, it's going to be due to conduction. And that will be 5. Oops, sorry, I missed a number here. It should be 1, 2, 3, 4. And then finally, what we're going to have is the last one right here. That is convective heat transfer. So we have a thermal resistance to end it here. And that is due to convection. 
and it is convective heat transfer on the outer surface so I'll put a zero there and then finally uh, just like with the voltage uh, you have a voltage drop here we have a change in temperature and we're going to have a temperature drop and we then get to T infinity outer so that is our problem or the scenario that we have and now heat flux is going to be flowing in this direction and that is QX and that's what we're after and the neat thing about thermal resistance is although we're not going to do it in this problem once you solve for the heat flux QX uh, you can use the equation for thermal resistances in order to figure out intermediate temperatures and and so that's kind of a quick way of computing temperatures at intermediate points and and you'll use the equation for the uh, thermal resistance, basically the equivalent of Ohm's law that, that we have, and, and that's how you could evaluate those, which you would do if you're doing electrical circuit analysis as well. You could calculate voltage at intermediate points. Well, here we can calculate temperature. So with that, what I'm going to do, I'm going to write out all of the different thermal resistances. We're going to sum them up because this is a series circuit. We'll put them in the equation and we'll solve for QX. Okay, so those are all of our thermal resistances. What I'm now going to do, I'm going to sum all of those. And so the total thermal resistance is going to be equal to sum of each individual component because this is a series circuit and we get 2.5757. And with that, we can now put it into the equivalent of Ohm's law that we have for thermal resistances. So let's do that on the next slide. And what we have then is QX is equal to, and it's going to be the temperature change from one part of the circuit, from the start of the circuit to the end of the circuit. So looking back at our circuit, we're going from here. Let me do that in red. We're going from there to there. So that's going to be the temperature change over all of the resistances that we've computed. And when you do that, we'll divide by the total of the thermal resistances for all of the individual components and if we recall the inner temperature was 15 degrees C the outer temperature was minus 20 and then that's going to be divided by the sum of all of the resistances which was 2.5757 and with that we get QX is equal to 13.59 watts per meter squared and so there what we've done we've calculated heat loss through this wall using thermal resistances it's quite a uh, uh, simple technique it, it's straightforward you're just putting these resistance values together and like i said if, if you wanted to go in and evaluate the temperature at one of the intermediate points you would just use this equation again but the endpoints would change and the resistance values that you're working with would be different. And, and that would then enable you to determine the temperature at one of the intermediate points within the circuit. So that is an example using thermal resistances, provided that the four assumptions apply, that of steady state, one dimensional, no heat generation and cost of thermal conductivity, you can apply this. And you can do this also for cylindrical or spherical coordinate systems. And so it's a pretty a quick and efficient method for doing conduction analysis. In the last segment we talked about uh, thermal resistances and we solved an example problem of conduction through a wall. Now there's another thing that can occur when you have two dissimilar materials that are in contact with one another and that brings up the idea of a thermal contact resistance. So that's what we're going to talk about now.
And we will give the idea of the thermal contact resistance a quantified value of being RTC to stand for uh, it's a thermal resistance and it's due to contact. And so this occurs when you have two different materials that are in contact with one another. So if you have two different materials in contact with one another, the temperature drop across that interface can be quite significant. And what I'm going to do now, I'm going to draw a schematic of, of a, uh, two materials that are in contact with one another. And we'll take a look at kind of an exaggerated version of what the contact might look like and then what the temperature profile may be uh, for that particular scenario. So here we have two materials, uh, material A and a material B, and they are in contact with one another. And, and what I've done is I've exaggerated the surface finish, but any material is going to have surface roughness. And what happens is where we have physical contact, we will have uh, conduction due to that contact. So in an area like that, we'll have contact and conduction. And then you'll notice there are gaps. So that would be what we would call an air gap or whatever the gas might be. And, and so other areas, you're going to have a gap and the conduction is going to be different where you have a gap. And, and consequently, this will inhibit the amount of conduction that is going from one material to another uh, when they're in contact with one another. And this would then lead to an overall uh, heat conduction that is going to occur across that gap and and sometimes what uh, we'll do is we put in thermal grease and, and that's basically a high thermal conductivity a grease material that goes in and it helps fill in those gaps uh, sometimes electronics for cooling fins they'll put thermal grease on the fins when they put it onto the uh, silicon chip that they're trying to cool but if we look at the temperature profile I'll plot that out now and then we'll take a look at what the temperature profile looks like So here we have a plot showing the temperature distribution and we can go from a temperature up here in material A, then we go down to a temperature in material B. But the thing that is notable is the fact that we have this big jump uh, that occurs across the gap. And, and that discontinuity uh, reduces the amount of conductive heat transfer that is occurring across that gap and, and so it's actually a bad thing that we don't want to have and the way that we quantify that gap is we use a thing called the thermal contact resistance and and so the contact resistance itself is related to the pressure between the two materials so if if we were to exert pressure uh, on the interface between the two materials so uh, we were to push them together, that would have an impact on the uh, amount of thermal conductivity that is occurring, or the amount of conduction, I should say. And if we also vary the gas pressure, so the, the pressure of the gas, that would have an influence upon the thermal conductivity of the gas, and, and that would then influence the gap uh, uh, heat transfer. So we can either, by increasing pressure, uh, have an impact on the physical contact or by changing the pressure we can have an impact on the uh, heat transfer across the gap. So with those two things we can write So those two things can have an influence on the contact resistance. Uh, remember we said a low resistance, low thermal resistance uh, it means that it is a good conductor of heat and consequently either pressure of the joint or increasing the gas pressure will lower the resistance and increase the conduction of heat. Now this contact resistance is, is very difficult to estimate and so we typically use empirical data. So it are things that are measured through experimentation and that is how we quantify it and then the contact resistance itself is going to be T2A minus T2B divided by whatever the heat flux is going to be through that system so looking back at our schematic 
uh, T2A was the temperature before the gap, T2B is the temperature after, and then Q is the total heat transfer going across that gap. So that's an equation that you can use. Uh, again, like I said, you can put thermal grease into the contact or the, the gap and then put your two materials together and that will enhance heat transfer. Uh, but this is just something that you should be aware of uh, if you're ever involved with problems where you have dissimilar metals or materials in contact. This is an issue that you have to be aware of. Okay, the last topic that we're going to talk about in relation to the idea of thermal resistances relates to R values. And if you go to any hardware store uh, and you're going to buy insulation for your house, uh, you'll find that they always talk about R values uh, in, in terms of the, the different types of insulation that you can buy. Consequently, what we want to do is we want to be able to relate that to what we're looking at in this course. So uh, the R values begin, they are related to thermal resistance, but there's a difference between British uh, units and SI, and so that's what we'll elaborate on in this lecture uh, in this segment. So if you recall, the equation that we've been using for thermal resistances is this one. Let's isolate for the thermal resistance. So essentially what the thermal resistance is, it's delta T divided by Q. If we look at the units, that's degrees C per watt. Now the R value, what it is quantifying is delta T divided by heat flux, so Q per unit area. And, and so consequently, the units of an R value are a little bit different from the thermal resistance in that what it will be is degrees C meters squared per watt. And so a way of thinking of the R value, if we're looking at this in SI, is it is essentially the temperature drop uh, for one watt of heat flowing through one square meter squared of a material. So one square meter in terms of the area. So what it quantifies so you can see if you have one watt and one square meter Q over A is then going to be equal to one. If you put one into this equation then R value is equal to delta T. And so that's how we get that relation. Now, the R values that you find in hardware stores, however, those are not in SI, so we'll take a look at that. Uh, before we do that, however, I'm just going to make a comment if you're dealing with pipes, and the R values for pipes are given by this relationship. Okay, so that's the R value if you're dealing with a pipe. Now, if you go to any hardware store, uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, any of those, uh, R values that are reported there, they're not in SI, and so we need to be able to convert that. And so if you go and you take a look, uh, you'll see things like R12, R16, R20, and this I'm assuming is for walls. For attics, the, the, the number would be larger. Uh, but any of these, uh, R12, R16, R20, any of those, those are done using the British thermal unit. And the conversion is that so, if we want to compute an R value in SI, we would have to multiply by 1 over 0 0.1761, which is 5.679, and that would equal the R value and 
in non-technical lingo, what I'm going to call it is our value from a hardware store. Okay, so let's take a look at this and what we're going to do, we're going to use a very common insulation that exists uh, fiberglass pink and trying to find the thermal conductivity of that can be a little bit of a challenge but anyways I'll pull a number out that should be pretty close so let's say we go to the hardware store and we're gonna buy some fiberglass pink and we're told the R value is equal to 16 so uh, what I'm gonna do I'm gonna guess the thermal conductivity will not quite guess I did look it up in a number of different tables uh, but let's say it's around 0 0.04 watts per meter degrees C. So with the R value of 16, that means that we can convert that into SI. And the way that we do that is we take our hardware store value and we divide by 5.679. And so we get 16 divided by... 5.679 and when you do that uh, you get 2.817 so that's the R value in SI and what we want to do we want to find out what is the thickness of insulation that corresponds to R16 so uh, drawing out a little schematic here we have temperature 1 temperature 2 our temperature differential we have some heat flux coming through uh, and this is R16 and it is, let me be correct, it is pink. So that is pink insulation. And what we're looking for here, we want to find what is the width of that. So L equals what? That is what we're trying to solve for in this example. So what we're going to do, let's write out Fourier's law. And so given our definition of R value, we said it was related to the temperature change divided by heat transfer per unit area. And that is going to be equal to L over K from Fourier's law. So that is going to equal the R value in SI. And with that, we can now solve for the length. So that's what we're after. We know this and we know that, so we can solve for it. And with that, the length is the width or thickness of this insulation. So we said the thermal conductivity for fiberglass pink was 0.038. That's an approximation. 2.817 was the R value. When we calculate, we then get 0.1071, and that's in meters. Uh, length is 10.7 centimeters, and I am going to convert that now into inches because in these dimensions, I think that way. Now, 4.2 inches is what we're getting. And if you look at a two by four wall, which is standard construction in North America, uh, that is the dimensions. It's not two inches by four inches. It's 1.5 inches by 3.5 inches. So what that means is that with a thickness of 4.2, a 2 by 4 wall uh, with 3.5 inches thick, if this thermal conductivity is correct, uh, it would be a little less than R16. So R16 would be someplace between a 2 by 4 and maybe a 2 by 6 wall construction, provided that this value of thermal conductivity is correct for fiberglass pink. So anyways, that, that puts something in, in close proximity. So for R16, it probably could be 2 by 4 or it could be 2 by 6 construction walls. Uh, chances are it would probably be more towards a 2 by 4. So... When you see R16, that means that it's probably two by four construction. Uh, and again, you don't want to compress the insulation too much or that will reduce the 
effectus, effectiveness of it, part of the in a way the insulation works is it, it immobilizes any kind of air currents in the gap between the wall. And we'll look at that later when we talk about convection. But essentially what you want to do, you want to minimize conduction going through the wall. So the conductivity of the insulation is very low. But you also want to minimize any kind of convective air currents that might occur between the walls. So there's the wall and you have the insulation in there. So that's the way that the fiberglass pink insulation works. You have the battings and you put them in the wall. Anyway, so there is an application of R value and how it relates to thermal resistances that we're studying in heat transfer. Okay, in this segment what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at uh, systems involving conduction where there is heat generation within the solid. And, and to begin with what I'm going to do is review the uh, heat equation or the heat diffusion equation. So that there is the heat diffusion equation that we derived in an earlier lecture. And what we're going to do, that will be the starting point uh, that we will examine systems with heat generation within them when we look at conduction. Uh, but I'm also going to write out the other forms of the heat equation that apply to other coordinate systems because depending upon the problem, uh, sometimes the starting point would be either the heat diffusion equation in cylindrical or in spherical coordinates. So there is the heat diffusion equation expressed in cylindrical coordinates. And what I have done here is I've introduced a new symbol. And this is one that we will find uh, quite often with transient conduction. And that is the thermal diffusivity. And it has the symbol alpha. And it is defined as being our thermal conductivity of the solid divided by the density of the solid and the specific heat capacity of the solid. So that is the thermal diffusivity. We put it into the equation as 1 over alpha. And then finally, uh, looking at the heat equation in spherical coordinates. Okay, so that is the heat diffusion equation in three different coordinate systems. It's a... Uh, partial differential equation and consequently in order to solve it uh, we either use numerical methods or we reduce it significantly and solve it analytically. Uh, but that will be the starting point by which we'll be looking at heat generation systems. So when we're talking about heat generation or heat source systems, so when we have heat source systems looking back uh, at our equation, the heat equation, the place where we have the heat generation is the Q dot over K term. And consequently for uh, heat source systems or heat generation systems, Q dot is not zero, but it exists. So that is the heat generation rate. And the units for that are typically expressed in watts per meter cubed in SI. And the source of that internal generation uh, could be from a number of different sources. It could be from a nuclear process. It could be from a chemical reaction. And the heat generation rate could be either positive or negative. So it could be an exo or an endothermic reaction. Uh, electrical resistance heating or joule heating. And there could be others, and I will just leave that as etc. So any, any kind of process that exists where you have this generation, you need to address that. And the way that we address it is through this Q dot term. So what we are going to do now is we are going to uh, work an example problem that considers a, a system 
uh, with heat generation in a slab. And so that's what we'll be doing in the next segment. And then we'll plug in some values and take a look at what it looks like uh, to see if it makes sense. But the place where we're going to start looking back here, we will start with the heat diffusion equation. Given that we're looking at a slab, we're going to be uh, dealing with the one in rectangular coordinates. So that's where we're going in the next segment. Okay, so what we're doing, we're looking at heat source systems. And what we are going to do, we are going to work an example problem involving heat source systems. So I'll begin by writing out the example uh, problem. And what we'll be doing is this will be an application involving rectangular coordinates. We'll be looking at a plain wall or a slab. So let me write out the problem statement. Okay, so there's our problem statement. What we have is a plain wall and we're told that it has uniform heat generation and the heat generation rate in watts per meter cubed is Q dot. Uh, we're told that it is insulated on one side. So that is a piece of information. And then the other side is exposed to a convective environment and the conditions of that convective environment are T infinity and H. And then what we are asked to do, we're asked to solve for an analytic expression describing the wall's temperature profile. So that's a bit of a hint there that we're going to be using the heat diffusion equation in this problem. And the last thing it says is knowing the wall's thermal conductivity K. So uh, that will be one of the parameters that we're going to use when we are performing the solution for this. So uh, what we'll do, we'll begin by writing out what we know. Uh, we'll come up with a schematic and then we'll work through this problem. Okay, so that has what we know. Uh, we know the internal generation rate, we know the convective condition, we know the thermal conductivity. Uh, we're looking for the temperature distribution as a function of position. We will assume this to be a steady state problem, 1D, and the thermal conductivity is a constant. Uh, we will also assume the width of the wall. And so the width of the wall that we will assume will be width L. And so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to write out a schematic. Okay, so there is a schematic of our wall. Uh, one thing I forgot to add here was our convective environment. Okay, so there we have our conditions. Now, uh, the boundaries on the walls, uh, what we are going to do, let's check the problem statement. It said nothing about the temperature on the right-hand surface, but what I'm going to do, another assumption I'm going to make, is I'm going to say that the temperature at that point is T1. Another thing that we can say, if you recall the boundary conditions that we had for the heat diffusion equation, whenever you had an insulated surface, that meant that there was zero heat flux at that point. So with that, we can make a comment here. We don't know anything about the temperature at the left-hand surface, but we do know something about the change in temperature with position, the slope of it from Fourier's law. And we know that Q is zero. If Q is zero, dt by dx is zero. And consequently, we can write out for the other boundary condition, dt by dx. And I'm going to say this is x equals zero. I didn't put the coordinate system, but I will. Uh, that is equal to zero. So the coordinate system in this problem, we will assume that our wall begins here and then moves in that direction. And consequently, this would be x equals L. This is x equals zero. So that is the schematic for this problem. In terms of analyzing this, we want to come up uh, with an analytical solution. And consequently, we'll be using the heat diffusion equation in order to do that. So let's begin the analysis. 
Okay, so that is the heat diffusion equation looking at this. We can reduce the complexity of it uh, right off the bat. So first of all, uh, partial with respect to y. Well, we said that this is a 1D problem. So consequently, partial with respect to y and partial with respect to z, those two are going to go to zero and they're going to disappear. And then on the right hand side of the equation, we said that this was steady state and consequently the temperature would not be changing as a function of time. So that term disappears as well. And with that, we uh, quickly are able to reduce the equation into something that looks a little more friendly. And I'm going to bring the heat generation term over to the right hand side of the equation. Now, looking at this, we can do a further simplification, and that is to uh, looking at this, the fact that it's only a function of x, we can change that partial differential into an ordinary differential. So we can write So given it's 1D, we can assume that T, oops, I apologize, that should not be an X and a Y, that should be a Y and a Z. So T is not a function of Y and Z, and consequently, uh, the partial with respect to X can be expressed as an ordinary uh, derivative with respect to X. And with that, uh, the mathematical physics equation governing this problem the heat diffusion equation reduces to the following. Okay, so that's something that looks a little bit easier for doing analysis. And so how do we solve for the temperature profile if we have an ordinary differential equation? We're looking for this. The way that we solve for that, we integrate and we integrate twice because it's a second derivative. Uh, so we will integrate this twice. And so on the first integration, we get a constant of integration. We don't know what that is yet. The way that we're going to solve for that, we'll apply boundary conditions. We integrate it a second time. And we get a second constant of integration. So in solving for C1 and C2, we will apply the boundary conditions. And if you recall back, let's look at our schematic, which was back here. Where the heck was it? There it was. Okay, so one boundary condition is what's going on on the left-hand surface over there. Another boundary condition uh, was at that location. And then there actually is another one, and it relates to the heat generation, basically doing an energy surface balance right here. Uh, and, and so we could do another one there. Uh, but let's take a look at the boundary conditions now. So those are three boundary conditions that we have for this problem. We only have two constants of integration and consequently we only need to use two of these. Uh, what we're going to do in the solution here, we're going to use the first two. So let's apply those and use them to determine. And you'll notice the third one here, uh, th this is the one that I said was related to an energy balance on the right hand surface. And that's Q dot times the volume. And that has to be equal to the energy that is flowing out and going into convective heat transfer. So that's the relationship that we've made with that third boundary condition. So let's go ahead and proceed to use the first two boundary conditions. So what we find by applying the first boundary condition, which is the one of the insulated wall on the left hand side of our slab, uh, when we apply the first one, we get C1 is equal to zero. And then applying the second boundary condition, and so this is what the second boundary condition reduces to. 
It's not as clean as the first one, but what we're going to do, we're going to take this and this, and we're going to plug it back into uh, our equation here. So let's plug those back in and see what we obtain. So this is what the temperature profile in the wall turns out to be with internal generation. So uh, recall we had a wall like this. We had insulation over here. Over here we had a free convective environment. And what this is telling us is it's telling us temperature as a function of X and X is going uh, starting at this location here. So it gives us the temperature distribution. And so what we will do, and it assumes that we know the temperature on that wall, and we know Q dot, we know K, and the width of the wall, L. So what we're going to do in the next segment, we're going to plug in some values, and we're going to see what this temperature distribution looks like. <laughs> Okay, in the last segment what we did is we solved a problem involving a heat source system. And what we did is we solved a problem where we had a planar slab. It was insulated on the left hand side. We were told that the right hand side there is natural convection taking place. T infinity and H describe that natural convective environment. The uh, thickness of the slab or of our wall was L. The heat generation uh, rate in watts per meter cubed was Q dot. K was the thermal conductivity. And what we did is we came up with an expression for T of X. And that expression came out to be the following. And T1 here was the boundary condition of the temperature on the external surface of this wall. So what we're now going to do, we're going to pick some typical values that you may have uh, for a wall with heat generation. And one area where heat generation often occurs is the curing of concrete. When, when you pour concrete, it cures, and the curing process is exothermic. So what we're going to do, we're going to pick some typical values, plug them into this equation, and then we're going to plot up that function and see what it looks like. So let's write out the typical values for concrete. Now the curing rate, we can say the heat generation is on the order of about 20 watts per cubic meter. We're going to assume our wall is 30 centimeters thick, so about 12 inches. The thermal conductivity uh, for the cement mortar that we're looking at is 0 0.72 watts per meter degrees C. And the last thing we're going to say is the temperature on the right hand surface is about atmospheric temperature, 25 degrees C. And if you recall when we came up with the formulation for this equation, we didn't use this boundary condition, we used this one. Uh, had we used this boundary condition, we would have had to then input the conditions for the convective environment into our equation. But what we're going to do, we're going to take these, we're going to plug them into the equation, and when we do that, uh, the following plot results. So let's take a look at that. This is what the temperature distribution looks like resulting for our equation. Okay, now T1 that was right here, T1, and we can see that is 25 degrees C, as it should be. So if I draw a line over, we can see that matches up there. Uh, another thing that we can uh, determine, and so th this is going from, let me write it out here. This here was X equals 0, and this was X equals L, which was 30 centimeters. So the left-hand surface here, this was the insulated wall. 
And if you recall, when we derived the equation going through solving the problem, we said that if the wall is insulated, that means that Q is equal to zero in this direction. So if Q is equal to zero through Fourier's law, that then tells us that dt by dx at x equals zero is equal to zero. So what does that mean mathematically? dt by dx is equal to zero. Well, that means the temperature does not change with spatial location. And consequently, you would then expect this to be a flat line or zero slope at this location. So dt by dx at x equals zero is equal to zero. And that's what we're seeing in the plot. So that's good. Uh, the final piece of information that we can extract out of here is if we look at the slope at this point here, so if we were to take this slope here and then apply Fourier's law, that would equal, that would be Q conduction. But if I was to put an energy balance there or do one of those infinitesimal surfaces and do the surface flux balance, what we could say is that that conduction then has to equal Q convection, which we haven't done anything with here, but that would then go into Q convective heat transfer, assuming that there's no radiation at 25 degrees C, there, there wouldn't be any radiation there. Uh, but anyway, so that gives us an example of applying energy generation. We derived this equation, uh, having the internal heat source. And once we had that, knowing our boundary conditions, we're able to come up with the temperature distribution inside of a wall. And what we can see essentially what happens is the energy generation inside the wall causes the temperature to go up within the wall. And so that's essentially the net impact of the thermal generation that is taking place inside of a concrete wall uh, while there is curing going by. So, that gives us an example of energy generation in a planar wall. In this lecture, we're going to take a look at the topic referred to as being fins. Now, fins are found in many, many different types of engineering applications. Uh, quite often, uh, we will see them in things like lawnmower engines, uh, electric transformers have fins in them. Uh, quite often, if you look at any electronics, there are cooling fins, and air conditioning systems have fins. But primarily, what we are interested in Our primary interest is how much heat they are removing from a surface. And so uh, that is a bit of a simplification of what the fin does. But that, that's typically what, what we're after when we're doing our engineering calculations. And, and it, there are all kinds of different fins. If, if you look at them from cross sections, you can have uh, straight fins that do things like this. You can have fins that do tapering. Uh, you can have fins that are wrapped around a tube, as we're going to see shortly in a video clip. Uh, but the fins that wrap around a tube might look something like this. I apologize for my artwork not being perfect. And, and these fins are quite a bit different from planar fins because here, uh, the area of them changes as you go further and further away from the fin. But uh, typically what we're going to do, we're going to assign a coordinate system, uh, X being in the direction away from the surface that we are trying to cool. And so let's say this is, we refer to it as having temperature of the base. 
and you could be heating it as well, depending upon the particular application that you're looking at. Uh, but then what is happening is we have a thermal energy coming out through conduction. So energy is conducting through the fin, and so that could be Qx. And at the same time, the amount of Qx going further and further out along the length of the fin is getting less and less because we're losing energy to convective heat transfers. So we have some fluid media here. And, and so consequently, Qx is going to go lower and lower as we go further and further towards the tip. And we refer to this as being the fin tip. So that is a kind of a very, very simple uh, view of, of how a fin is performing. And what we'll be doing in the next segment is we will come up with an equation uh, that enables, to, uh, enables us to model what is going on within a fin. But as a result of this, what a fin is referred to as being is a conductive, convective system. And the reason for that is we have conduction and we also have convection. So here you'd have T infinity H and that would give you the convective environment. So uh, what we're going to do now, let, let's take a look at a video clip of some common fin applications that you might find uh, in everyday life. And, and then what we'll be doing in the next segment is we're going to go into the theory and we're going to come up with what is called the Fin Equation, which enables us to uh, move towards estimating the amount of heat removed from a surface due to a fin. So let's move on to the video clip and I'll talk through uh, different types of fin applications. And the first one that we're going to begin with is this is a refrigerator with a thermoelectric cooler in it. And so if you open the door, you'll see in the back there's a grill, and, and that's where the thermoelectric cooler is. When you remove the panel, you'll see there's the aluminum uh, base on the left-hand side. That has fins on it. And if you flip the fridge around and you take the back off, you'll see uh, there's an electric circuit board at the top. And then there's a thing with the fan at the bottom. And if you go in closer, you'll start to see there are fins, and the fan is providing forced convection to cool those. When you look from the side, that gives you the profile of the fin. And so that's another example of a pin. This is uh, inside of a Dell computer, uh, cooling fins all over. This is an air-cooled uh, engine in a weed eater, and there you can see the fins. This is a lawnmower engine uh, cooling the head. And this is a compressor. And, and compressed air gets hot, and so we want to remove the heat there. Now, th this is a classroom in Reykjavik, Iceland, and there you can see a radiator on the bottom, and that has fins, which uh, enable us to transmit uh, heat into the room. And then up higher, there is another radiator, and there are fins there. And, and, and then this is another hot water radiator. You can see the uh, fins wrapped around the copper tube. Looking at the IR signature, you can see that the fins are getting hot as hot fluid is circulating through that radiator tube. So those are some example applications of fins. Uh, what we're going to do in the next segment, we're going to move into the theory and we're going to come up with an equation that enables us to uh, start to quantify the amount of heat removed from the base when you have a fin attached to it. Okay, so we're talking about fins and what we're going to be doing in this uh, segment is we're going to be coming up with the fin equation uh, which enables us to uh, start to calculate or start the process of calculating the amount of heat removed from a surface. So I'll begin by drawing out a schematic of a fin which will be the basis for our derivation.
Okay, so there is the schematic for the representation of the fin that we are going to be taking a look at. And uh, this fin uh, theoretically could have tapers, so the area of it could get uh, smaller or larger as we move in the x direction. And what I've done is I've sketched out a little uh, differential element of the fin, and that is written over on the side here. And a couple of things, uh, we're going to assume that conduction is in the x direction only. And the other thing that we're going to assume is that we have convective cooling from the external surface of the fin. So when we look at fins, we refer to a fin as being a conductive convective system. And the reason is because we have conduction going through uh, our little differential element or through the fin. And we also have convective heat transfer that is taking place to the surrounding environment. And consequently, there is going to be a difference between uh, Q of X in and Q of X leaving. And the difference is going to be related to the amount of convective heat transfer coming off of the fin. And that will be the basis by which we will come up with our relationship. Uh, one other thing that I should point out here is that we have two different areas that we have shown in this schematic. We have the cross-sectional area of our fin as we move out. And then we have the wetted surface area. So that is the area around the perimeter of the fin where convective heat transfer is taking place. And so don't get those two areas confused. They are different and, and just be aware of that. And so what we're going to do, uh, we're going to use this schematic to derive what we call the fin equation. And so we're going to consider the little finite or differential element. And we saw that Qx was coming in and what was leaving was Qx plus dx plus a differential amount due to convective heat transfer. So that kind of gives us the basis of an energy balance for that differential element. And now for conduction, we're going to use Fourier's law. And we're also going to use the Taylor series expansion, which we saw earlier when we came up with the heat diffusion equation. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to take uh, what we have here from Fourier's law and I'm going to make substitutions into our Taylor series expansion. And then with this term here, I'm going to use the chain rule. So that's what we'll be doing with the uh, conduction term. And for the convection term, So we have that. And looking back at our schematic, one other thing is, I didn't mention this, but we've assigned a temperature T that pertains to the temperature of that slice at that location. We're going to assume that the entire slice is at one, or the entire differential element is at one temperature T. So that is what we've used in Newton's law of cooling there. And with that, uh, we can put the terms from the Taylor series expansion and Newton's law of cooling into the energy balance and we get the following. And so now I'm going to expand out the first term. So this here is the most general form of the Finn equation. And you could solve this numerically for fins of a complex shape. Uh, we want to be able to come up with analytic representations. So what we're now going to do is we're going to make some simplifying assumptions that enables us to clean this equation up a little bit. And the first one we are going to assume is that we're dealing with a fin of uniform cross-sectional area. And for a fin of uniform cross-sectional area, what that means is that we're dealing with a fin, looking at it from the side, it would be a fin that the cross-sectional area, AC, is not changing. And so it's a fin that we would say without taper. And with that, we can then say that DAC by DX is equal to zero. Another thing that we can say 
is that the wetted surface area is going to be equal to the perimeter. So let's say this was evaluated at x. It's going to be the perimeter times x, where p equals perimeter. And with that, DAS by DX is then simply equal to the perimeter of the fin, whatever the perimeter of our particular cross-sectional area might be for the fin. And so those are some simplifications that we can make. Uh, we can come back to the very general form of the equation, making those simplifications, and we get something that looks like this. Okay, so this is something that is looking a little better. It's looking like something that you may have seen in your ordinary differential equation course. And what we're going to do, we're going to make a substitution to simplify. And for our substitution, we're going to introduce this new variable called theta, which is a function of x. And all it is, it's the temperature of the fin at that x location minus the free stream convective cooling environment. And, and so it's basically just a temperature difference. If we look at our fin, remember we were solving, so this is x. What we're after is t of x. And then out here we have this fluid environment at t infinity. So that's just taking t at x minus t infinity, and that goes into this new variable called theta. So when we make that substitution, now another thing that we're going to do, when you're dealing with fins, quite often this hp over kac comes up. So we're going to make another substitution. I'm going to call that little m squared. And it'll make sense in, in a few minutes why we did the little m squared. But anyways, that is what our equation is like. So what type of equation is this? Well, if you remember back to your ODE course, uh, we could say that this is a linear equation. Nothing is squared in there. We have no nonlinear terms. It is second order. And it is homogeneous due to the fact that the right-hand side is zero. So that's a differential equation. And if you look back in your ODE course, uh, you'll find solution techniques for that type of equation. And if you recall, for that type of equation, solutions of the form the exponential of ax, those should be solutions to that equation. So let's evaluate d theta by dx. And the second derivative and making substitutions now, canceling out this and that. What we're left with is a squared, and then we can solve for that. And you can see the HP over KAC continues to appear here. And what we're going to do we're going to bring back that m squared thing that I was talking about, that term. And with that, a is equal to plus or minus little m. Okay, so we have this uh, for our solution. Given that we had a is equal to plus or minus m. We can have the exponential of e to the mx or e to the minus x and linear combinations. So with that, so that's what we get out of the fin equation uh, for a fin without taper. 
we find that theta x can be expressed as two exponential functions where m is this hp over ak, I believe that's what we said it was, yeah, hp over kac. So what we're going to do in the next segment is we're going to try to determine what the boundary conditions are and with those boundary conditions we're then going to solve for C1 and C2. So that is uh, we're part way through the derivation uh, for the temperature profile within a fin and and the other thing that we'll be working with is trying to figure out the amount of heat flux coming off the fin because if you recall that's one of the main things that we're interested in is how much heat a fin removes from a surface. So. That is the fin equation for a fin without taper. Okay, so we're taking a look at fins, uh, conductive, convective systems, and in the last segment what we did is we came up with an expression for the temperature distribution along a fin. We had made a substitution of variables and we were expressing it in this theta of x, uh, but what we said is the temperature distribution could be expressed as a linear combination of the solution that we came up with. And in order to solve for C1 and C2, we need boundary conditions. So that's what we're going to look at now. And just to refresh your memory, we had this as being the base temperature of the uh, fin that we were looking at. And we made a bit of a simplifying assumption. We assumed that the cross-sectional area of the fin did not change with x and so we were dealing with what we call a fin uh, that has no taper or it has uniform area and and the things that we were specifying we specified the perimeter so there would be some perimeter at a given location x so let's say that is x and what we're after here um, one of the things that we're after is to know the temperature at that location and then we're also going to try to come up with the heat flux and, and the heat flux is going to be at the base because we want to know uh, how much heat the fin is removing from the base. So we need the boundary conditions. What we're going to do, we're going to assume three idealized cases and from that, uh, I won't go through all the math, but I'll give you the results of each of the cases and the results being the solution uh, basically uh, no, determining what the boundary conditions would be uh, and then determining what the constants of integration would be the C1 and C2. So we're going to take a look at three cases. Case one, that would be the case of a very long fin. So if you imagine we have a very very long fin uh, not fing, fin, and what will happen as the fin gets very, very long, eventually the temperature of the fin is going to become the same as the free stream temperature. So we can say temperature at this L, L being some very long distance, eventually we'll get to the free stream temperature. And with that, with our variable, theta at that L is then going to be equal to zero. So that's boundary condition uh, scenario or case one. Case two is a more realistic one because you'd never have a fin that long that it gets to the uh, ambient temperature. Well, you could, but usually you wouldn't. Uh, case two is finite length. And we're going to lose heat from the tip via convection. So this is the most realistic scenario because that is what actually happens and if you imagine here we have our fin and let's assume that it's round in cross section uh, so AC is the cross section as we come out along the length 
what we're assuming is that we have Q coming in here and then that's going to go into Q convective heat transfer. So let's try to express that and giving us a mathematical representation. So we have Newton's law of cooling on the end, HAC, because the area is not changing as we go along that uh, length of the fin. And it will be the temperature at the end of the fin minus the fluid temperature that the fin is exposed to. And then on the right hand side, we'll put Fourier's law and we'll apply Fourier's law right at the end of the fin tip. So that is going to be dt dx evaluated at x equals L. So essentially it's equating the slope uh, because what's going to happen here is that cross-sectional area is going to cancel out. And what we end up with is the following. at x equals L, not zero. Okay, so that's finite length. We lose via convection at the tip. And case three is another one that's a little bit of an idealization. That would be the case where instead of having free convection at the tip, you put insulation there. And so uh, there is no heat transfer from the tip. And if the tip is insulated, we know that when we look at the boundary conditions, we looked at this when we came up with the heat diffusion equation. Uh, if we have a case of insulation, that means that through Fourier's law, the slope of the temperature profile at that point is equal to zero. And therefore writing that in terms of our variable theta, we get that. So those are the three different cases that we have, case one, case two, and case three. So what you can do is you can take these and plug them into the solution that we had from the Finn equation. Um, and there is one other boundary condition that I forgot to mention before we go to determining C1 and C2. Now let me mention the other boundary condition. The other boundary condition is what is happening at the base of the fin. And if you recall from our schematic, we said that temperature at x equals zero is equal to Tb uh, for the base temperature. So we can write out a theta, a base at x equals zero, is Tb minus T infinity or the free stream fluid temperature. So with that, what I'm now going to do, uh, I'm not going to go through the math, but I'm going to give you the results in a table for all three cases, that of an infinitely long fin, that of convection from the tip, and that with an insulated tip. So let me write out all of those. And when I do that, I'm going to uh, give you two values. One is going to be the temperature distribution and the other is going to be the fin heat transfer rate which will be evaluated at the base. It basically tells us Q uh, leaving the base and that gives us the amount of uh, heat being removed from the surface. Okay, so those are the results that you get when you put in uh, the boundary conditions and you solve for C1 and C2. And in here, uh, we have a lot of hyperbolic sines, cosines, and tans. Uh, but recall theta was T minus T infinity. We said M squared was HP divided by KAC, so the cross-sectional area, convective heat transfer coefficient, perimeter and thermal conductivity of the fin. Theta B 
was equal to theta at zero, which is then the temperature of the base minus the free stream temperature. And the last thing, I, I haven't mentioned it yet, but you'll see in the table, we have this M term that appears in the heat flux coming out of the base. Uh, M is defined in the following manner. Theta. So those are the different terms. Uh, this here on the left gives us the temperature profile in the fin, and this gives us the heat transfer that the fin is removing from the surface. And when you look at these, uh, if you recall the long fin case, that wasn't really a physically realistic application. The convecting tip was the one that was very accurate, but when you look at the mathematical expression, it's rather complex, although in a computer it's not a big deal. Uh, and then finally, case three, the insulating tip one. Uh, that is a rather simple solution. And, and so what we'll be doing in the next segment is comparing these three different solutions and seeing how well they uh, compare for, for different uh, types of applications for a given problem. So that is the Finn equation and solutions to three different cases. And like I said in the next segment, uh, we'll be plugging some numbers into these and taking a look at what the temperature profile looks like. Okay, so in the last segment what we did is we came up with uh, expressions for the amount of heat transfer from a fan for three different cases. One case was for a uh, very long fan, uh, the second case was for where we have convection from the tip, and then the third was for uh, a tip that has insulation on it. And what we're now going to do, we're going to plug numbers into the equations that we came up with. So we're going to be considering an example of a rod fin. And what a rod fin is, it's a fin that has a round cross section. And so if this was our fin, it would look something like that. Uh, this here is the base. And the base, recall, has temperature T base. So this is our fin, x is going in this direction, uh, but essentially what it means is that the cross-sectional area at any point in the fin is round, and so we will have a diameter that describes the fin, and we will also have some length that we're dealing with, and that would uh, tell us what the length of the fin is. So that is what a rod fin looks like. Not the greatest drawing, but you can figure out what's going on there, hopefully. Uh, and so for a particular example problem, what we're looking at is a rod fin. Uh, the diameter, we're told, is 0 0.005 meters. Thermal conductivity of the fin material, 398. The base temperature, we're told, is 100 degrees C, and the free stream convective environment, which would be the fluid in here, coming through T infinity H, uh, we're told that the free stream convective environment is 25 degrees C. And we're told to consider a fin that the length is 20 diameters. So that is the length for the problem that we're looking at. And what we're going to do, we're going to consider this for two different convective environments. Convective environment one will be 100 watts per meter squared degrees C. And convective environment two is a thousand watts per meter squared degree C. So what we're going to do, we're going to take these numbers, we're going to plug them into the three different cases that we looked at. And what we'll be coming up with essentially is the temperature distribution along the fin. So we're going to be solving for T of X, although it's going to be in forms of this theta of X that we had from our equation. Okay, so let's take a look at the solution for a rod fin, and we'll begin by considering the convective environment H1 equals 100 watts per meter squared. 
So this is the result of that. And, and what we have here, uh, we have three different cases that the first one, uh, you won't see it here, but th this was for the long fin. So that is black. And then we had the convecting tip. And then finally we had the insulated tip. And what you can see is that the long fin is here and the convecting and insulated tip are here. So those two solutions are quite similar. And what we're looking at here, this is X over D on the horizontal. So this would be the base of the fin. And then we're plotting temperature of X minus T infinity. And so what we can see is that the solutions for the convecting and the insulating tip are, are really quite similar to one another. Uh, even though the insulated tip solution was quite a bit simpler analytically, it only had a hyperbolic tan, whereas the convecting tip had hyperbolic sines and cosines in it. Uh, another thing that we have plotted on here is this line here. And what this is showing is, let me erase that, uh, it is showing the slope at the base of the fin. So that is dt by dx at x equals zero. So what we're doing is we're quantifying the slope down here. And through Fourier's law, we know that everything that flows into the base is what is going to be uh, dissipated to the air by the convective system of the fin. And so uh, through Fourier's law, if you know that slope, you can then determine the amount of energy being withdrawn, uh, specifically QF, and that is the heat transfer from the fin. So that is the case of H equals 100. Now let's take a look. Let me see here. Did I? Yeah, I had the right units there. That's good. Uh, let's go on to H equals 1000. And that's what we have here. And uh, first of all, what you notice is our slope is a lot different. Uh, we, we have a much larger convective environment. So a lot more convective heat transfer is taking place. The other thing to notice is that the long fin uh, the insulating fin and the or the insulated fin tip and the convection from the tip they're all pretty similar here with the exception of a little tiny disagreement at the end and so with the higher convective environment we, we have a scenario where all three solutions are, are very similar to one another uh, this slope is dt by dx at x equals zero and again, we can determine the heat being withdrawn from the fin using the slope at the base at x equals zero. And so this here is the base of the fin, and this here is the tip. Okay, so looking at the two different solutions, comparing them, uh, first of all, we notice that our slope is changing significantly. And so with the higher convective environment at 1,000, we would assume that there would be more heat drawn away. And certainly there is because the slope is greater and consequently through Fourier's law, we would have increased heat transfer. Uh, the other one is that uh, for the lower convective environment, the convecting tip and the insulating tip are really quite similar. And we're going to take advantage of that in the next lecture. Uh, we kind of come up with a shortcut correction technique that enables us to use the solution for the insulated tip, which was very simple, by just correcting the length of the, uh, the, the, the fin itself. And that is a bit of a correction that we'll apply, and it's a bit of a shortcut for doing fin calculations. But anyways, that gives you an idea as to what the solutions look like uh, for the case of a rod fin.
Okay, at the end of the last lecture, what we did is we looked at an example problem uh, for a rod fin, and we looked at the temperature distribution in the rod fin, and what we found, let's just go back and take a look at that, uh, we found that when we had the case of the convecting tip or the insulated tip, the solutions were really quite similar. And the solution for the insulated tip, that this was case 3, was a lot simpler than the solution for the convecting tip, which is actually the more accurate and, and approximating the, the physical reality better. Uh, but it's a much more complex solution. So what we're going to do uh, we're going to come up with a method here that enables us to correct for the length of the fin and it approximates the solution for case 2 but we use the results of case 3 which was just the hyperbolic tan and so functionally mathematically a lot simpler. So what we're going to do now and we're not looking at the rod fin we're going to look at fins and correcting the length uh, but let me begin by saying what we're really after when we're looking at fins Okay, so uh, what we can say is that the main thing that we're after, we want to know how much heat is being removed from the fin. And it's either a cooling application or your, your heating space using these fins. And what we do know is that all of the heat uh, that goes through the fin flows through the base. And so uh, by applying Fourier's law at the base, we can then determine the total amount of heat leaving the fin. So with that, we can write the following. So that's one thing. Uh, now, another thing that we're going to do, we are going to introduce a concept or a term called the fin efficiency. And this makes it a little simpler when we're solving problems. Efficiency for engineers, it's always eta with the subscript F for fin. And that is going to equal the actual uh, heat being withdrawn by a fin or that is going through the base of a fin divided by some hypothetical theoretical maximum. And, and so QF is going to be in the numerator. And this maximum is going to be if the entire fin was at the base temperature. So if that was the case, then we would have H AF, that would be the uh, area of the fin, multiplied by T base minus T infinity. So here we're making the approximation that the entire fin is at the base temperature, and that is an idealization. So realize that that is an idealization. So that is the fin efficiency, and that is something that we'll use. You can also look it up in charts if you have more complex fins that uh, are not the type that we've been able to solve analytically in the last few segments here. Now, the other thing we're going to do is this approximation between case one and case two by correcting the length. So let me talk about that now. Okay, so what we found when we did the example problem with the rod fin is that the case 2 and case 3 solutions were very, very similar. Uh, case 2 is a more accurate solution because it's modeling convection from the tip. Uh, but what we're going to be doing is we're going to correct for the length and we're going to use the simpler case 3 solution in order to approximate a case 2 solution. And so uh, the correction depends on if we're dealing with a rectangular or a round fin. But if we have a rectangular fin, the corrected length, and we will denote that with capital L, little c uh, for corrected, is going to be the length plus the thickness divided by 2 and if you have a round fin again we'll correct the length 
and that will be corrected by taking the diameter and dividing by four. And, and so that is the way that we will correct for the length. And then we can use the simpler case three solution, which if you recall was just a hyperbolic tan. And with that, uh, we can introduce the fin efficiency. So this would be the fin efficiency uh, if we had the insulated tip solution. And then the fin efficiency if we have the corrected length. And if you recall, we defined m. I'll give us m squared here. So that is the corrected convecting tip. So essentially what we're doing here, let's say we have a fin, and what we're doing is we are saying uh, we're not going to have convection at the tip, but we're going to add this small length here, and that is going to be whatever the corrected amount is going to be. So here we would have L. And then this is going to be LC. So we're adding a slight increase, oops, a slight increase to the surface area here. But then we're saying that we're going to have insulation on the tip. So what we're doing to approximate for the convection, we just add a little bit of an area there and there to increase the convective heat transfer. Uh, and then we use the insulated tip solution by saying that we have insulation here, which was simpler. And with that, we can then come up with an expression for the fin efficiency and then compute the amount of heat being withdrawn by the fin. And if you have a more complex fin, such as an annular fin, uh, as we saw in the video, that would be if you have a fin that is something like this, where you have here it's more complex because if you were to model this, uh, what you'll find is the area, the cross-sectional area, is going to change as you move further and further out. And so consequently it's more complex. But there would be tables that you can look at, tables or charts. And so that would be the way to deal with more complex fins. Or if you have even a fin, perhaps with taper or anything like that, where the area is changing. And it does not satisfy the simplifying assumptions that we've used thus far in order to come up with these relationships that we're using. So uh, that is the fin efficiency. And what we'll do, we'll close out this lecture in the next segment by solving an example problem uh, where we will be computing the heat uh, being... Uh, withdrawn from a base by a fan. Okay, we're going to finish up our treatment of fins by solving another example problem. Okay, so there is our problem statement. What we're dealing with here uh, we have a stainless steel square cross-section fin. We're told it's one centimeter by one centimeter, eight centimeters long. Thermal conductivity is 18 watts per meter degrees C. The base temperature 300 degrees C. Convective environment H is 45. T infinity is 50. We're told to compute the fin efficiency and heat loss by the fin. So those are the things that we're after and what we know. So. Uh, let's begin by writing out what we know and what we're looking for.
Okay, so we're after the fin efficiency as well as the heat uh, being removed by the fin. So the analysis for this, what we're going to do, we're going to use our case 3 insulated tip solution, but we're going to correct the length. And so we're going to extend the length a little bit uh, in order to approximate the case 2, which was the more accurate solution, that with convection from the free tip. So analysis for this. So we have that for being the corrected length of the fin. The efficiency, and this is the uh, advantage of being able to use case 3 solutions. It is much simpler. And so the only thing that we need to do in using case 3 is enter the corrected length instead of the normal length. And in there, little m, if you recall, when we derived the solution uh, from the Finn equation, it's HP divided by K cross-sectional area AC. And so with that, we can plug in values. Now P, P is the perimeter, and we're dealing with a, a rod fin, so, uh, sorry, a, a square cross-section. So if we look at the cross-section of our fin, Perimeter is just going to be four times the length, and it's a square cross-section. Four times the dimension of the fin, which we were told was one centimeter by one centimeter, so that's 0 0.01. Thermal conductivity was 18. And then the area is going to be 0 0.01 squared. And we take the square root of that. Okay, so there we have all the values that enables us to determine the fin efficiency. So let's do that. And this is where you have to make sure that you have the hyperbolic tan function on your calculator. And make sure you know how to use it. So what we get, the fin efficiency, it's around 37%. And recall the fin efficiency was the heat removed by the fin uh, divided by some theoretical max. So we said the fin efficiency was Q fin divided by some hypothetical maximum. That would be if the entire fin was at the base temperature. So from that equation, we can then evaluate the heat transfer from the fin as being the efficiency and the 37% efficiency times that Q max. Q max, that is if the entire fin is at the base temperature. So the wetted area of the fin is going to be the corrected length times the perimeter. And then that's going to be multiplied by, assuming the entire fin is at the base temperature, minus the free stream temperature, plugging in values. And you'll notice here I used the corrective length, and so there we don't have to worry about the area of the tip itself because we've used the corrected length. So from that we get the maximum heat transfer the idealized case, 38.25 watts, and then the actual heat transfer from the fin. We're able to determine that this particular fin is capable of removing 14.1 watts. So that gives an example of uh, how to use fin efficiency. 
uh, and using the case three simplified solution for the case with the insulated tip by adding on this corrected length. And if you recall what I said last time in the last segment, so typically our case two solution would have that and we'd have free convection from the end. What we're doing here is we're taking that length and we're adding on another corrected length. And so that is uh, giving us our length corrected over the normal length. And it is assuming that this tip is then insulated. So there's no heat transfer there. So it's through this addition of this small area here and here that we're able to make that approximation and use the case three solution to approximate uh, the case two scenario, which is the more accurate one where you would have Q convection coming off here. So that is solving a problem with fins and that concludes our coverage of fins. In this lecture, we're going to be taking a look at uh, solutions to the heat diffusion equation. And we'll be looking at solutions that provide us with temperature distributions in two dimensions. So these are 2D solutions to the heat diffusion equation. Now, in order to proceed with the analysis that we're going to do, we have to make a number of assumptions. The first one, it's the obvious one I just said, we're assuming that we're dealing with two-dimensional heat transfer so temperature will only be a function of x and y. Uh, we will assume that we have steady state conditions and that will simplify the heat diffusion equation for us. And then finally what we're going to do, we will assume that there is no internal generation uh, within the two-dimensional object that we're looking at. So let's begin by looking at the heat diffusion equation and we'll make some simplifying assumptions. Okay, so with the approximations that we're making, uh, first of all, the derivative with respect to the z-coordinate system will go away. There is no generation, so that goes away, and we're dealing with steady state. Consequently, transient terms disappear as well. And so what we're left with is the following from the heat diffusion equation. Okay, so even though that uh, is simplified significantly, that is still a partial differential equation, and and consequently there are not a great uh, a large number of analytic solutions that exist to that equation. We'll be taking a look at a couple of solutions uh, in this lecture segment. So uh, there are a number of limited analytical solutions, but there are not that many. So if you go and open up pretty much any undergraduate textbook in heat transfer, you will find the solution for the temperature distribution in a square plate. And that's what we'll be doing here. I won't be going through and, and giving us the solution. You can look at any book and you'll find that. Uh, if, if you go to graduate heat transfer textbooks, they'll have more solutions to different types of geometries. Uh, but, but the one that we'll look at here is probably one of the simplest ones. So let me sketch out the coordinate system that we'll be looking looking at uh, for this problem. Okay, so there is the flat plate that we're looking at. Uh, the plate extent is in here. And what we're after, we're trying to determine what is the temperature as a function of X and Y within that plate. We're given the dimensions H and W. And the boundary conditions, uh, each side of the plate has a different temperature. 
this, this, and this are all at the same temperature, and the top of the plate is at a different temperature. And so uh, that is what then gives us a temperature distribution within this plate. So if, if you look in any book, you'll find uh, two common boundary conditions or two common solutions to different boundary conditions. So let me write out the boundary conditions now. So boundary condition number one, and this is the boundary condition that leads to a nice analytical solution for the problem, but it's not a very practical boundary condition as we'll see in a moment. And what boundary condition number one states is the temperature at the top of the plate, let's go back and look at the image, the temperature up here, T2, so we're looking at the temperature distribution along the top of the plate, we're saying that it is a sine function. How you would get a sine function for the temperature distribution, uh, you could shine a laser. A laser has a Gaussian function, which looks like a sine function, but that, that would probably be a tough thing to be able to actually fabricate experimentally. So you can see that this is a little bit of a hypothetical solution, one that the mathematicians dreamed up and it enabled them to solve the equations in a nice clean way. So what we're finding the width of the plate and goes from 0 to W and the temperature at 0 or at the base is going to be T1 okay so not a perfect sine wave but you get the idea uh, essentially we're saying that the boundary condition at the top is a sine wave uh, again, kind of a, in terms of reality, not really the kind of temperature distribution that you would find, but one that makes the math a little cleaner and easier. Uh, boundary condition number two is actually one that's more realistic, uh, but it's a little more difficult to solve as we'll see. And what boundary condition two states is temperature two at the top of the plate is simply temperature two. It's, it's a different temperature from the other three edges of the plate. And so that's boundary condition number two. Now, as I mentioned, I'm not going to go into the details of how you solve this. Uh, you use a technique called separation of variables, but I will give you the solution. And like I said, if you go into any uh, undergraduate heat transfer book, chances are you'll find the solution to this problem in it. So let's take a look at solution to boundary condition number one. So that's what we get with boundary condition number one and it's not too complex of a function. We do have hyperbolic signs in there. Uh, but let's take a look at what we get uh, to when we use boundary condition number two, and that will make this solution look a lot better. Okay, so that is solution uh, using boundary condition number two, and you can see it is a little bit more complex, mainly because it's an infinite series, and so it's very difficult to evaluate uh, by hand. You'd want to use a computer for that, uh, and, and consequently we can see that boundary condition number one results in a lot easier solution because that's one that we can calculate. It's not an infinite series. It's just plugging values in. Uh, but what we're going to do now, uh, we're going to take a look at these solutions. And so we will begin by looking at the solution using boundary condition number one to begin with. And then we will look at the solution using boundary condition number two. So let, let's go and take a look at a plot using boundary condition number one. So what we have here, th this is the temperature distribution in our plate with the sinusoid boundary conditions. So if you recall, uh, we said that this side of the plate was T1 100 degrees C. We said this was T1 100 
Uh, sorry, it's kind of hard to read that. Let me move that a little bit. We said that the lower surface here was also T1, 100 degrees C. And then up at the top here, this is where we had that sine distribution. T2 was 100 plus 10. And I've assumed the dimensions of this are one unit, whatever the unit might be. I guess it would be meters with what we're doing here. Uh, but that was the profile. And if you recall, we had something like this. And so that was our sine wave distribution. And we go from 100 degrees C up to 110. And when we look at the contour plot, it, it looks quite nice. Uh, we, we see that uh, the green, and, and here we have our temperature scale, so we can look at it. The green is around 100 degrees C, which we would expect for all of these walls because they're all at around 100 degrees C. And then with the sine temperature distribution, we would expect that in the center, we're gonna move up to about 110. And sure enough, if we look at the red color here, that's close to what we're going to. So that solution comes out to be quite nice. Uh, now let's take a look at the second solution that we had looking back and this is the one with the more realistic boundary condition and for that boundary condition we said uh, if we look back at our plate for that boundary condition we said that t2 was just some temperature it was not a sine distribution uh, and consequently it resulted in this infinite series which was much more complex so let's go take a look at what that solution looks like and this now is the solution uh, to that uh, boundary condition, the one where we had uh, 10, and what I've assigned is 10 degrees C up here, and then 100 degrees C here, 100 degrees C here, and 100 degrees C here. And, and you look at it and you think, well, that looks not bad. That, that actually looks pretty good. It kind of looks like the one that we just looked at. Nice, nice, smooth curves. But uh, what I should say is that this is only for one term in the infinite series. And in order to evaluate it, you have to have many, many, many more terms. So th this is not an accurate solution that we're looking at here. It just gives you an idea as to what it looks like uh, to begin with. And, and so I'm just going to sketch these. All of these temperatures are the same. And then this one up here, oh, you know what I should do? I should do a green because it's green. Uh, that one is at 10 degrees C, so it's at a very, very different temperature. But uh, what we can do, we can look at the convergence of this series. And so by convergence, that means let's increase N. N will go up, and so we'll go to 2, to 3, to 4. And looking back at our infinite series, which is here, what I'm referring to is the number of summation terms. So we started off with n equals 1. Now let's look at 2, 3, 4. And what we're going to do, we're going to walk all the way up to 200 terms. And, and so let's take a look at that now and see what it looks like when we go through this process. So uh, I've put it into video and we're beginning here with one term and there you can see what we were looking at earlier that's with two three four you see as you get more and more terms in the solution we get some weird things going off at the top and that, that's what they call ringing because what's happening there these hyperbolic sine functions are starting to approximate a step change a step discontinuity which is very difficult to approximate so there's 40 terms 50 it's starting to look pretty good there 70 80 90 100 all the way up to 200. So there we can see the final image has 200 terms and that one is actually getting to be close to 
uh, the actual temperature distribution that you would find in this flat plate. I, I'm not entirely sure what you would need in order to have a fully converged solution, but, but we're getting pretty close once we have these 200 terms. So anyways, that gives you an idea as to the fact that if you do want to calculate the temperature distribution in a flat plate, uh, it's 2D. It, it really is not that trivial of a solution technique, especially if you're going to apply boundary conditions that are, are more like what we'd find in reality. And so that's a demonstration of the heat diffusion equation for uh, two different boundary conditions for the simplest thing that we can look at, and that is of a flat plate. In the last segment, we took a look at the solution to the 2D uh, heat diffusion equation in the case of a uh, square plate. And in one case, we had an unrealistic boundary condition and it resulted in a nice solution. In the other one, we had a more realistic boundary condition. And the solution that came out of that was an infinite series. And, and so what we find is if, if we look at a lot of different solutions to the heat diffusion equation, there really are not that many for complex geometries that we would find in real world applications. And so given that, uh, the net result is that if we're studying complex shapes, numerical solutions are typically used to determine the temperature distribution in three, di uh, three dimensions within an object. And you can also do time as well. It could be a transient solution. Uh, but that is typically what is done if you have a complex shape. Now, there are some cases where uh, there's kind of an in-between uh, area that, that we can use things in. And this is referred to as being shape factors. Shape factors still do have use in, in certain things. If, if you're looking at pipe flow and you don't want to do as an example, uh, pipe flow, and, and you don't want to do full complex numerical solutions along the pipe to model the heat transfer, you could use something like a shape factor. And that, that's what we're going to look at uh, in this segment. So shape factors have been tabulated for a number of uh, two-dimensional shapes that are too complex to use the heat diffusion equation to solve. And and the nice thing about a shape factor is it gives us kind of a quick and dirty way of being able to calculate uh, heat transfer from one object to another. So, so let's take a look at shape factors now. So what the shape factor is, it's a technique or a method that enables us to compute heat transfer between a certain geometry and its surroundings. And the way that we do this is we have an equation Q equals KS delta T. So in a way it's kind of like a Fourier's law, uh, but delta T is overall. And what we have in here uh, K will be the thermal conductivity of the material that we're looking at. S is the shape factor. And, and so S itself is the shape factor. And K is the thermal conductivity of the material that we're looking at. And delta T overall is the temperature difference between uh, the two systems that we're transferring the heat between. And it'll make more sense when we look at an example problem. Uh, I said that this looks like Fourier's uh, law, but in the uh, looking at it closer, it does have thermal conductivity, but also kind of looks like Newton's law of cooling. So it's a bit of a mix between the two. Uh, but anyways, that is the shape factor. And, and so values of the shape factor are tabulated. You can find them in books. and for different shapes. 
I should call it objects because they are shape factors we're talking about, but for different objects, for example. So it might be a sphere buried below a surface and it's not very far below the surface. So here, uh, obviously we would not have uh, only radial conduction going on. We have the presence of this surface and, and that is going to uh, cause this to become a two-dimensional problem versus uh, just a one-dimensional problem. So that, that could be an example of what you'd find with the shape factor. But what we'll do next uh, in the next segment is we're going to take a look at solving a problem using the shape factor. But look in any textbook and you'll find many, many different shape factors uh, tabulated within the book. In the last segment, we took a look at the uh, idea of the shape factor, and what we're going to do in this segment is we're going to solve an example problem involving the shape factor. So if you recall, uh, the shape factor is kind of a quick way of being able to compute uh, conduction in a problem that cannot be approximated as only being one-dimensional, so it'd be for two-dimensional problems. And so what I'll do, I'll begin by writing out the problem statement, and then we'll work through uh, towards the solution. Okay, so there's our problem statement, uh, <clears throat> kind of a long one, but what we have, we have a hole uh, is drilled through the center of a solid block of square cross section, and the dimensions of the square cross section, we're told, uh, are one meter by one meter on a side. The hole is drilled along the length, so the length of this square cross section is two meters long. Uh, and we're told that a warm fluid passing through the hole maintains the inner surface at T1 equals 75 degrees C. So uh, a very simplified approximation for uh, convective heat transfer due to the fluid. And as a result, what we'll do is we'll assume the inner wall temperature of this hole is at 75 degrees C. And the other thing we can assume is the outer block temperature is at 25 degrees C. And then we want to find the heat transfer. So uh, let's go through the steps that we do for all the problems. We begin with what we know, and then we'll draw a schematic and, and work through the assumptions. So our known items are... Okay. So that's what is known and what we're looking for. Uh, let's draw out a schematic and that will help visualize what is going on in this problem. Okay, so there is the schematic for our problem. Uh, we have a block, it is dimensions W by W and length L, inner temperature T1 and the outer temperature T2. And, and so when you look at this, it becomes quite apparent that uh, we cannot assume this to be one dimensional conduction as we were able to do when we looked at thermal resistances where we could have a uh, pipe, a very poor looking pipe, uh, but if you recall when we had thermal resistances, we could assume that the conduction was in one dimension, basically going in the radial direction. Uh, here, given the fact that we have a square geometry around a circle, we're going to have edge effects going on, and consequently this becomes a two-dimensional conduction problem. And that's why we have to go to the shape factor in order to solve it. So uh, let's take a look at the assumptions, and then we'll work through the theory, basically using the shape factor. Okay, so we're assuming this is happening in steady state, uh, and that we have 2D conduction. And the other thing that we're assuming is that the ends of the block are well insulated because if we 
look at the schematic again uh, we have something like this and this is one meter that's one meter and this is two meters so the block is really not that much longer than it is wide and consequently in order to ensure that we do not have conduction going in the axial direction uh, what we'll assume is that the edges of the block are well insulated preventing any kind of heat transfer going in that direction and consequently we're assuming that all of the heat transfer is going in this direction well it's two directions because we have two dimensions that we're looking at uh, but then we'll have edge effects the fact that we have these corners here which I just mentioned okay so analysis how are we going to solve this what we're going to do we're going to use the shape factor so uh, you have to find a table that has a shape factor with this object in it uh, that's usually step one for solving these problems and I just happen to have a table that has this value in it so uh, we look up the conduction shape factor and this is for a cylinder centered in a square of length L and for that the shape factor we're told is the following Okay, so we're given that R would be uh, half of the diameter of the hole within the object. It's interesting to look at this because uh, we have the natural logarithm in the denominator and that was what we found when we looked at conduction through a pipe. We always found the natural logarithm in the denominator. But anyways, when we put in the values, uh, we know all of the dimensions here so we can determine this. And we get 8.588 meters is the value for the shape factor. And then it's a pretty straightforward and simple calculation with the shape factor. Really the biggest trick is to ensure that you have that shape factor for the shape that you're looking at. And then we plug in the values. We know the shape factor, so we can do that. Thermal conductivity was given, and then the temperature difference, it was 75 on the inside and 25 on the outer wall. And with that, we can then evaluate this. And that tells us that the heat loss for this particular object turns out to be 64.4 kilowatts. So that is an application of the shape factor, and, and it enables us to solve in kind of a quick and efficient manner problems that involve two-dimensional conduction but again the biggest trick is to ensure that you have a shape factor for the particular shape or configuration that you're looking at uh, and and one thing to say is that uh, shape factors only exist for a limited number of scenarios Okay, so what we can say is that uh, shape factors only work for a limited number of scenarios. You need to have a shape factor for it. So if we have a problem and we cannot assume it to be 1D and there are no shape factors, then what happens is you end up going to numerical methods. And so that's where we're going in the next couple of lectures. We're going to be taking a look at uh, two-dimensional conduction problems using numerical solutions. And, and we'll see the power of numerical solutions. It, it's not as uh, quick as you would get with hand calculations like what we've been doing thus far, 
but it does prove to be a very efficient method, especially for heat transfer, being able to calculate temperature distribution in objects. And what we're going to find is the biggest challenge with numerical methods is going to be estimating the boundary conditions. So what goes on in the solid is pretty easy, but what's happening on the surface is usually the, the biggest challenge. Uh, but that's where we're going in the course. We're moving into numerical methods for two-dimensional conduction. In this lecture, we're going to take a look at the topic of numerical methods. And numerical methods represents one uh, method by which we can solve heat transfer problems. So when we're solving heat transfer problems, uh, we basically have three different techniques or methods that we can use. And numerical methods, which applies to topics other than heat transfer, uh, but we'll be talking about it applied to heat transfer in this lecture. Uh, it, it, numerical methods is one of those methods. But the other methods, we, we've looked at some of them thus far. So if you uh, look back at a couple of the lectures that we've been going through uh, looking at conduction, uh, we looked at Fourier's law and that led to what we referred to as being the alternative method. And from that, we then came up with expressions for the thermal resistance. And, and so we looked at that method of being able to solve for heat flux as well as temperature at interfaces within uh, certain systems. And we also looked at the heat diffusion equation. That was a complex PDE. And we looked at one solution for that. That, that was heat distribution in a plate with different boundary conditions. And we saw that uh, if the boundary conditions were more lifelike, uh, the solution turned out to be an infinite series. So fairly complex solutions, uh, and you can get them for some uh, certain basic shapes. So uh, when we look at the analytical methods that, that we have studied thus far, we can say that uh, they apply to relatively simple geometries with fairly simple boundary conditions. So those were the shapes that we looked at. Thermal resistances, we had them for one-dimensional conduction. I call that the slab. Uh, we had it for cylindrical conditions as well as for spherical. So that was what we were able to get to with uh, analytical methods. We weren't able to get very far. We were able to solve some problems. Uh, another method of solving heat transfer problems involves just doing physical experiments. So setting up a system and uh, setting the boundary conditions correctly and putting thermocouples throughout the object measuring the temperature distribution. And so through experimental methods, uh, we're able to obtain certain physical quantities, mainly temperature and perhaps heat flux. And in some cases, you're forced to only be able to use experiments, uh, especially if you're dealing with convective boundary conditions, but we'll get to that later on in the course. But uh, one comment that we can make about experiments is that they're fairly expensive to set up and conduct. So we have analytical methods, we have experimental methods. The last technique that we can use for solving heat transfer problems are the topic of this lecture, numerical methods. And so that's what we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at. And when you look at numerical methods applied to heat transfer, uh, there are two main methods that, that people use. There is the finite difference method and there is the finite element method. Now, uh, we're going to be looking at the finite difference method in the next lecture or two, and, and that will be the technique that I will be presenting. Finite element method is a slightly different technique, uh, mainly used in solid mechanics, strength of materials, things like that, although not exclusively. Uh, but I'll be talking mostly about the finite difference technique or method. 
And so the nice thing about uh, numerical methods applied to heat transfer is you can handle complicated geometry. And, and so whatever you can put into the computer and, and grid, which we'll talk about, uh, you can solve. Uh, and they're relatively inexpensive. As computational power has come down and down and down, they, they become uh, less and less expensive to run these models. And so they all run quicker on, on computers, even small laptops today. You can do computational heat transfer fairly easily. Uh, now, there is a bit of a catch, and that's what I'll talk about in this next little bit. And so the, the catch or the downside is that the boundary conditions are sometimes difficult to estimate, especially uh, if you have a convective boundary condition, either free or forced convection, which we'll be looking at later on in the course, or with radiation. If you remember the lecture segment that we looked at, uh, Leslie's cube, and we had a cube that had different surface finishes, and we looked at it with the IR camera, we found that the uh, copper surface that was slightly polished had a very, very different emissivity from the other surfaces. And, and so you need to know that emissivity in order to get accurate results. And, and consequently, the boundary conditions are the place that uh, they, they sometimes challenge engineers when they're using numerical methods to solve heat transfer problems. So that is an overview of the three different techniques. We have analytical methods that we've looked at, experimental methods, and numerical methods. And what we're now going to do, uh, we're going to spend the next couple of lectures looking at the finite difference method applied to heat transfer problems. Okay, so that is where we are going uh, with numerical methods applied to heat transfer. We'll be looking at two-dimensional steady conduction problems. So we looked at the flat plate earlier. Uh, the PDE and we use separation of variables technique to solve. Uh, with numerical methods, uh, the method that we'll be developing, that problem is quite easy to solve. And, and so we'll be taking a look at that as, as we go through the next couple of lectures. Before we jump into numerical methods and heat transfer, uh, what I want to do is answer a couple of questions. And, and these are sometimes questions that help students understand a little bit better what uh, numerical methods actually are. So the first question, the first question is, what are numerical methods? Uh, I took a course in numerical methods when I was an undergrad, and I'll be honest, I, I went through the entire course. and didn't really know what was going on. Uh, it was able to get a very good grade, uh, do the programs, write programs, but it, it was a little bit on the confusing and abstract side, mainly because there weren't really any tangible applications that, that could provide uh, an understanding of how you would apply numerical methods. So I, I think it can be beneficial for students to answer these questions before we jump in. So to begin with, what are numerical methods? So from the perspective of engineering, engineering education, engineering programs, uh, we can say numerical methods are the solution to mathematical physics problems. And, and so we create mathematical physics problems in almost every engineering course. Numerical methods provides a method by which we can solve for certain aspects of these problems. Another thing that we can say about numerical methods Numerical methods provide us with approximate solutions to these mathematical physics problems. So uh, that's another point that is important to realize. And th this is opposed or different than if you are able to come up with an exact analytic solution. So that might be something like f of x is equal to x squared plus 2y. Uh, with an analytic solution, you come up with, actually that should have been f of x, y, because we have the two variables there, but you'll come up with an exact analytic relationship. With a numerical method, you have things on a grid at discrete points, and so you're just coming up with a solution at those discrete points, and that's where you know your answer. 
and and what goes on between those points you don't really know you you could guess uh, in order to obtain that you would have to have a finer resolution grid and then you would be able to figure out what is going on in the intermediate points so that that is another thing that is unique about numerical methods they are approximate solutions to the problems that we're solving and and so the next question is what types of problems can we solve with numerical methods so let's take a look at that and I'll also talk about what types of methods we might use. So uh, if you take a course in numerical methods, quite often it will begin with a very simple types of, of problems. And uh, usually it'll begin with interpolation of a function. And so if you're doing interpolation of a function, the simplest is linear interpolation. So you know two data points and you're trying to find out some value in the middle. You draw a linear line between the two and that enables you to get the midpoint. So that's linear interpolation. And then as we get more complex, you can have cubic spline interpolation. And that involves matching uh, conditions that go higher than just the slope. It might be uh, second order derivatives at the boundary points when we're doing our interpolation. So that, that's one type of problem that you can solve with numerical methods. Another one is uh, linear algebra, a system of equations. And with a system of equations, quite often what we end up doing is inverting a matrix. And so in numerical methods, there are ways that you can do matrix inversion. Now, I realize that we today have very modern tools such as MATLAB and Mathematica, things like that, that enable us to do this quite quickly. But with numerical methods, you can get programs that uh, you, you can uh, develop methods of inverting a matrix using these programs. Uh, other things you might be doing in a course in numerical methods, uh, and another topic is integration of a function. And example applications might be something like area under a curve or volume of a shape. And when you're doing these, you might use techniques like the trapezoid method or Simpson's method. So if you've taken a course in numerical methods, you'll recognize a lot of these. Uh, another very common application in engineering is integration of ordinary differential equations. And there are different techniques that we can use, but a very common one used in engineering is the, I'll probably say it incorrectly, I've heard Rungi Kata and Runge Kata. I'm not sure how to actually pronounce the first name there, so I apologize if I am saying it incorrectly. So that's a common technique. And then the uh, next, in, in this escalating scale of complexity of numerical methods applications, we get to what we're going to be looking at in this course, and that is solutions of partial differential equations, which we know the heat diffusion equation is a partial differential equation. And so we can look at heat conduction as we're going to in this course. Uh, you can look at fluid flow, external aerodynamics, So the flow over bodies. And these latter two here are quite often referred to as being CFD or computational fluid dynamics. And in solving PDEs or partial differential equations, uh, we have a couple of techniques. The one that we're going to look at is the finite difference technique. And the other one that I mentioned is the finite element method. 
So now this is not exclusive, but quite often finite difference is used for heat or for CFD, fluid flow problems. And finite element quite often is used in uh, structural analysis or in solid mechanics. Now what we're going to be covering in this course, we're going to be looking at the finite difference method and we will, in the next segment, go through the different steps of applying the finite difference method, which is a common technique within numerical methods, to the heat diffusion equation. And, and so we'll be going through all the steps that you go through uh, in applying numerical methods to solve heat transfer problems. So I just wanted to give you that segment to kind of go through uh, what numerical methods are and what types of problems you can solve with numerical methods. So from here on, we're going to dive in and, and start applying this to heat transfer. I'm now going to go through a relatively quick overview of how to apply the finite difference method to heat transfer. And then in the next lecture, we'll go into more detail about how the equations come about and how you set up the method. So the first step in applying the finite difference method to the heat equation or the heat diffusion equation is we do what is referred to as being grid generation. So uh, let's imagine we have a rectangular plate, which was the problem that we looked at when we were uh, looking at solutions to the heat diffusion equation. And any finite difference method that you apply to the heat diffusion equation, remember we're looking at in two dimensions steady, uh, we're looking for the temperature distribution within that plate. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to prescribe even more complex boundary conditions than what we were able to do using the separation of variable techniques. So there we have a plate with four different boundary conditions, one on each side. And this is the problem of a square plate. And then what we want to do, we want to convert that object into a grid of finite nodes. So we would recast that. So what we've done is we have represented our square plate through a series of grid points. And then what we would do is we specify the grid spacing. In this case, it's delta x, delta y. And then we go through and we assign node numbers to each of the individual nodes. So what I've done here is I've expressed this node as being some generic node m comma n. And we'll talk a little bit more about how the nodes relate to the equation in a moment. And, and so this process in any finite difference technique is referred to as being grid generation. The next step in the finite difference method applied to the heat diffusion equation is to rewrite the mathematical physics equation in finite difference form. So if we have a case of a steady uh, heat transfer in two dimensions with internal generation, the heat diffusion equation, a partial differential equation, would look like this. Now what we want to do is we want to be able to express that 
in finite difference form. And, and so going through a process that I will get into in the next lecture, uh, the following would result. So that's what the finite difference equation or version of the heat diffusion equation would be transformed into. And the TMN in these equations here, so there and there, that refers to the temperature at nodal location M comma N. And the M and subscripts are basically just a bookkeeping approach that we use in order to keep track of the temperatures at different points within our grid that we generated in the first step. So that is the second step. You recast your mathematical physics equation. The third step is to figure out how to handle your boundary conditions. So looking back at the plate that we're trying to solve, uh, our boundary conditions are here. And we can see what is specified for this particular problem is a specific temperature along each of the walls of the plate. So an example for one of the boundary conditions could be the temperature at nodal location 1 comma 0 equals 2 comma 0 equals 3 comma 0 equals 70 degrees C. And, and so that would be an example of how you would handle the boundary conditions on one of the sides. And the last thing that we do in this process is we need a way uh, to be able to solve uh, for the temperature distribution. And the way that we do that is the following. So what you do is you apply the finite difference equation, the one that we came up with here. So this is the finite difference equation, the finite difference form of our mathematical physics equation. Uh, you apply that to every interior node. So looking back at our grid, that would be all of the interior node locations. You apply the finite difference equation. The external surfaces have all had the boundary conditions applied there. Now the corners you've got to be a little careful with because the boundary conditions are uh, going to be essentially an average of what's going on on each of the walls. But those ones have been handled by the boundary conditions. It's the interior nodes that we're going to apply the mathematical physics equation to. And that is going to result in a linear, a series of linear algebraic equations that you need to solve with some technique. And uh, essentially you're using a matrix inversion technique. And if you look in numerical methods textbooks, there are different methods of doing matrix inversion for linear algebraic equations. And one is the Gauss-Jordan elimination technique. And this is a direct method. Another one is the Gauss-Seidel technique. And this one requires iteration. A final one, and, and this is a code that uh, hopefully I will be able to show you in two lectures from now. Uh, but it is using Excel. And that involves a circular reference. And iteration. So those are different techniques that we can use to uh, solve our set of linear algebraic equations that result from each of the interior nodes and applying the finite difference equation to them. And once we've done that, what will come out of that process, we will then obtain T, M, comma, N for all of the interior nodes. And that essentially is then giving us T, X, Y, where X and Y are at each of the discrete node locations that we established in the uh, grid generation step at the beginning. So if you want finer resolution, uh, make delta X and delta Y smaller and you'll get finer resolution in your solution. But of course, there'd be more points 
and it would take a little bit longer in terms of the numerical analysis. So that, in a nutshell, is kind of what the finite difference method applied to heat transfer looks like. And what we'll be doing in this course, we're only going to be looking at 2D solutions. That doesn't mean that we can't solve 3D problems. Uh, 3D problems we can solve using the same technique, uh, but essentially what happens is they require a little bit more bookkeeping because uh, then you have a third index on your index notation for the temperatures and, and it gets a little bit more complex, but nonetheless it would be the same technique that you'd be applying. So bookkeeping, not necessarily a technical term, but it just means that you got a little more things you got to keep track of because then you're going to have T, M, N, let's say O. Not the best thing to put for an index in numerical methods. Uh, you could do IJK. That would probably be another way. It doesn't really matter what you put there. Uh, it could be anything. Okay, so that is a quick summary of the finite difference method applied to the heat diffusion equation. What we're going to do in the next lecture, we're going to go into more detail. And I will go through a little bit more of an extensive derivation uh, coming up uh, with the translation of the heat diffusion equation into finite difference form. And then we'll take a look at a lot of the different boundary conditions that we can have uh, in heat transfer. And with that, we'll be ready to solve problems provided that we have it all set up, which uh, hopefully if all goes well, I will do in the following lecture and show you an Excel solution for that. So that is the end of this lecture. The next one we go into more details of this technique. In this lecture, we're going to work through the process of applying the finite difference technique to the heat diffusion equation. So we begin with the heat equation, and we are going to uh, come up with a finite difference technique for two-dimensional conduction. We will assume it to be a steady state problem. And we will also assume to be the case where we have generation, so internal generation within our two-dimensional solid. So beginning, what we'll do is we'll write out the mathematical physics equation. In this case, it is the heat diffusion equation. And so the next step that we can do, we can cancel out the terms that are not appropriate for what we're looking at. Uh, first of all, we're looking at 2D conduction, and consequently the term with respect to Z drops away. Uh, the other thing is that we're looking at steady, uh, steady state problem, and consequently the time derivative term drops away. So that is the equation that we want to apply the finite difference technique to. And if you recall from last lecture, uh, we said that it was a multi-step process. The first step is that of grid generation. So what we're going to do, we're going to go through the steps and come up with our grid. So what we'll begin by doing is dividing our region. And our region is going to go from 0 to L in the x direction and 0 to capital lambda in the y direction. And we're going to divide those into M and N subregions. And from that, we can determine our grid spacing, delta X, delta Y, as shown there. And with that, we are going to have M plus 1 by N plus 1 nodes. So what I'll do next is I am going to generate the grid. So applying the grid to the x-axis, we have nodes going from 0, 0 up to capital M, 0. And I will do the same for the y-axis. So 
So here we have a uh, simplified version of what our grid might look like. And what I've drawn in are uh, nodes, and I've tried to label those nodes. And what we're going to do, we're going to focus in on uh, five nodes in the middle of our object. And specifically, what we're interested in is the temperature at node TM comma N and that is at some point within our object and what we're going to be doing is we're going to be writing out uh, the finite difference form of the heat diffusion equation with the purpose of isolating and determining what TM comma N is and just like we said before uh, along the perimeter we apply our boundary conditions which we will be getting to uh, in the next segment and so the boundary conditions would be what is in these nodal locations around the perimeter. Uh, but we set up a grid on the inside, and that is what we then work towards solving when we do the finite difference method to the mathematical physics equation. So let's move on now to the second step of uh, applying finite difference to the heat diffusion equation, and that is of rewriting the mathematical physics equation in finite difference form. And if we look back at the heat diffusion equation, which is here, we can see that we have the derivative, second derivatives, with respect to the spatial dimension of the temperature. And we need a way to be able to handle those. And so uh, what we're interested in is how to express the second derivatives of temperature in finite difference form. And so that's what we're going to look at now. And the way that we commonly do this in numerical methods when we apply finite difference technique is we use Taylor series expansions. And, and we do the Taylor series expansions uh, with respect to our grid, our grid size, delta x or delta y. So what we're going to do, we're going to consider the second derivative of temperature with respect to x. And we are going to use Taylor series expansion in order to determine what this is. And we are going to do one expansion at x plus delta x and the other at x minus delta x. So let's take a look at what we get by doing that. So there I've written out the Taylor series expansion at x plus delta x, and we uh, can see that I've written it out to order delta x squared, and, and I've left uh, order delta x cubed in higher terms in this uh, last term here. And I'm going to do the same thing now, but I'm going to do that at x minus delta x. So you can see the minus delta x term is there. Then when we get to the plus, this is going to be squared. So it'll be a plus delta x squared over 2. And then again, we have plus order delta x cubed and smaller. And for those terms, we're going to neglect. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add these two. And when we do that, what happens is this goes to order delta x fourth uh, because, I didn't show it here, but maybe I should have, the, the delta x cubed term here would have been a negative, uh, but then you would have delta x to the fourth would be a positive. But the delta x cubed terms will cancel out in, in doing this operation, and that's why we can then write that this is of order delta x to the fourth. The other thing to note here is this term right here is the second derivative of our function, which is what we're interested in for getting the second derivative of temperature. So let's isolate that term. And so that's what we result with when we isolate. And then I say plus HOT. Those are higher order terms in this particular expansion. Those will be on the order of delta x to the fourth. 
and and higher. So those would be the higher order terms. So what can we do with this? Well, remember we're after the second derivative of temperature with respect to x. So what we can write So what I've done here is I've replaced f. Uh, the first one we had was f at x minus delta x, but you can flip it around. Uh, th th this here would be f at x plus delta x minus 2f at x plus f at x minus delta x. That's essentially, oops, I have a little error. No, that one should be minus. I apologize about that. Let me fix that and clean it up. So this here should be minus in order to be consistent with that minus there. But uh, you'll notice what I've done is I've held n constant, uh, the subscript n, which denotes one of the grid locations. I've held it constant in all of these terms, which is the equivalent of holding y constant. And, and consequently, what we're doing is we're evaluating the second derivative of temperature with respect to only changing in x. Uh, and, and that is what this equation here is giving us. And, and so that is essentially a finite difference representation of the second derivative. We can do that for uh, d, the, the second derivative with respect to y as well. And when we sub that back into the heat equation, and we do that with delta x equals delta y. So that's what they would call uniform grid spacing if delta x was equal to delta y. And you go through some rearranging. I'm not going to go through all of that. But uh, when you do this, you end up with the following equation. So that's the equation that we end up with. And Q dot in this equation is the generation rate. And we can also say that this equation applies for subscript m going from 1 to m minus 1 and n from 1 to n minus 1. So those are basically the interior nodes. We're not looking at the boundaries because those will be treated with the boundary condition. But this here is the finite difference equation. Uh, it's the heat diffusion equation, I should say, that has been transformed into finite difference form. And, and if you recall, what we said is that this is the term that we're after in this equation. And so what we would do is we would go and we would apply this to all of the interior nodes and you're going to get a series of algebraic equations that you then need to solve. And, and the solution of that uh, comes down to d different techniques. Uh, before we can solve it, however, we have to apply the boundary condition. So what we're going to do in the next segment is we're going to, the next two segments actually, we're going to take a look at some of the boundary conditions applied to finite difference form. And, and then when you put it all together, uh, that is when you then go about solving this and uh, that gives you the temperature distribution inside of the object that you're looking at. So uh, next segments we're going to start looking at the boundary conditions in finite difference form. So we're looking at applying the finite difference method to the heat diffusion equation. And in the last segment, what we did, we looked at grid generation and we looked at conversion of the heat diffusion equation uh, using the finite difference method. So we recast the mathematical physics equation in finite difference form. The third step, the third thing that we're going to start looking at now is how to handle the boundary conditions. So remember, boundary conditions uh, pertain to what is happening on the external surface of the object that we're interested in. And what we're after here, we want to be able to determine 
the temperature distribution within an object. We said we were looking at an object with internal heat generation. Uh, it was steady state and it was two dimensional. So those were the restrictions. So what we're going to do, we're going to begin with the simplest boundary condition that there is, and that's where you prescribe the external temperature on the surface. So let's take a look at that one. And what I'll do, I'll begin by drawing the surface of the object and we'll put uh, some nodes on it that we'll work with. And so I'll use the same convention that we had before, M and N for nodes. And this is a surface that we know the temperature, and, and that's why we say it's a prescribed temperature boundary condition. And it, writing out the uh, finite difference form of this is actually quite easy. What we say is temperature at node location, capital M, N plus 1, is just equal to the surface temperature and Tm little n is again equal to the surface temperature and finally T capital M kind of n minus 1 again is equal to the surface temperature. So you can see that's pretty straightforward, pretty easy. You could even have a, a temperature, a surface temperature that is changing and then all you have to do is just change the temperature at each of those node locations. So that's the simplest boundary condition that, that we'll deal with. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start increasing the complexity and so the next one that we'll look at is a boundary condition where you have a prescribed heat flux on the external surface. And again, what I'll do is I will draw out the surface with nodes. And I'm going to draw another node point inside of the surface. And that will be node location M minus 1N. And what I'm now going to do is I'm going to draw a control surface that goes like this and the size of that control surface the vertical extent of it is delta y that's our grid spacing in the y direction and the horizontal extent of that is going to be delta x over 2 And so we're going to use that in formulating the boundary condition for this surface. And the last thing that I'll do is I will draw the heat flux coming in. And so we said that this was a constant heat flux surface. And we will prescribe the heat flux at this node location as being QM comma N, denoting that it's coming in through that nodal location. So what we're now going to do that we've drawn this picture, we're going to do or perform, this is our control surface, we're going to perform an energy balance on the control surface and that will enable us to come up with a formulation for the boundary condition for prescribed heat flux. So uh, let's go ahead and do that on the next slide. So remember we said that we're looking at the heat diffusion equation when we can have internal generation and it is steady state. So consequently when we look at the energy balance of this surface, coming back here, what we have is we have the heat flux coming in this direction. So that is what the first term is representing in our energy balance looking here. That is heat in through boundary surface. The second term we have represents conduction. Conduction going across this control surface and that could be coming in or it could be going out depending upon the conditions. 
And so that's conduction across our control surface, and that is what the second term is. And the final one is rate of energy generation. If it turns out that we have internal energy generation, we need to be able to take that into account as well. So what I'm now going to do is I'm going to write out the energy balance in finite difference form, and that is what we're going to use in order to determine this boundary condition. So beginning with the heat flux in through the boundary surface, looking here, that's just QMN multiplied by delta Y. And we'll assume that it's a unit depth into the plane of the page. And then we have the conduction terms. And for conduction, we're going to have conduction on this surface, conduction on this surface, and conduction on this surface. Noting that for these surfaces, the upper and the lower here, uh, they're only delta x over 2y. So we'll have to account for that in our equation. And for that, we just use Fourier's law. And remember Fourier's law was Ka dt by dx. So the delta y here represents a. Uh, and it, technically it should be multiplied by one per unit depth. And the final term we have is the internal generation term. And I'll multiply that by the volume, and that would be multiplied by one for the unit depth as well. And all of this has to equal zero. So that becomes the equation that we work with in terms of determining the boundary condition uh, for prescribed heat flux. And we can simplify this if we have uniform grid spacing. That's where we said delta x was equal to delta y. And so doing that and rearranging, what we're going to do, we're going to rearrange for t, m, comma, n on the left. Because remember, that's what we're looking for through our finite difference method. Okay, so that is the equation that results for prescribed heat flux on the surface of a solid that we're uh, examining. And the prescribed heat flux is there, and that is the internal generation there. Now, there is one special case of uh, heat flux on the boundary, and that is the special case of an insulated boundary. So let's take a look at that. And for an insulated boundary, we know that the heat flux on the surface is equal to zero. So all we need to do is we set zero in the equation above, and we can rewrite it. And that becomes the equation for an insulated boundary. And that would be how we would handle the boundary condition of an insulated boundary. So that is the case of constant heat flux on the surface uh, for the boundary conditions. What we're going to do in the next segment, we're going to uh, increase the complexity a little bit. And we're going to take a look at the case where we have convection on the surface. <laughs>
And just like before, what we are going to do, we are going to prescribe a control surface. Before I do that, uh, let me denote our convective environment. So out here we have a fluid. Could either be forced or natural, doesn't really matter. T infinity and H is the convective heat transfer coefficient. So what I'm going to do, just like before, we're going to prescribe a control surface here. And that is going to be what we're going to use in coming up with the equation for our boundary condition. And just like before, delta x over 2 is the width and the vertical dimension or the height is delta y. So we are going to perform an energy balance on that control surface and that will be the basis for coming up with the equation. So let's start with that. And you'll notice when I'm writing out this equation, I'm always treating uh, heat flowing into the control volume uh, as being positive. And so we start off with heat in via surface convection plus heat in via conduction. And looking back at our schematic, uh, we can have conduction coming in let me put that, I'll use red. Uh, conduction can be coming in from this surface, or from that node, I should say, through there and through there as well. Convective heat transfer, obviously, is going to be coming in this way. And then finally, we have to uh, consider the fact that we may have internal generation within our little control volume, within the control surface. And given that we're operating at steady state, all of this has to equal zero. So what we can do, we can go through and we can sub in values and that will be the basis by which we will come up with our boundary condition equation. So let me go ahead and do that. Beginning with convection. And I'm multiplying by delta y, just like before. Let's assume unit width. So the width is equal to one. And with that, the area, remember uh, we have Newton's law of cooling, HA delta T. So that would be H delta Y times one. I'm not gonna draw out or write the one. And given that the energy is flowing from the fluid into the wall, we'll assume that the fluid is hotter. And then going through and applying Fourier's law for conduction. And that last term, this is essentially delta V, the volume of our control surface or control volume. So the goal that we have now is to isolate for TMN. So we're going to try to isolate for TMN everywhere in this equation. And we're going to bring that to the left hand side. And, and so I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to show you the result of that exercise. And this is under the assumption, again, of a uniform grid spacing. So delta x is equal to delta y. And if we can make that assumption, then TMN turns out to be the following. So this becomes the equation that enables us to handle the boundary condition where we have a convection, convective heat transfer, uh, through the surface. And we're doing this in a manner where we can have internal generation. That's why we have the Q dot term. Uh, but that would then become the equation that you would put in for that boundary within your finite difference uh, formulation for the heat diffusion equation. So that is convection at a boundary. The last segment, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the most complicated, and that is where we have radiation and convection on a surface. And so that's what we're going to do in the next and last segment for this lecture. <laughs>
All right, so we're now on to the last boundary condition that we are going to consider uh, by applying the finite difference technique to the heat diffusion equation. And it's the most complex one, but it is radiation and convection. Okay, so just like for the other boundary conditions, we're going to begin by drawing out a schematic of an internal node or a node on the surface and from that that is what we're going to use to come up with the equation for the boundary condition. So let's begin by doing that. And just like before we are going to prescribe a control surface and we will use that in coming up with our formulation for the boundary condition. And we have our convective environment. And for this one, we have radiation. So let's draw in radiation. I'll give it a big red symbol. So we have radiative heat transfer coming in. And in order to formulate that, I need to specify the emissivity and the surrounding temperature. And that leads to radiative heat transfer. Uh, coming into our surface and we will be looking at it uh, acting on the external surface at node location M comma N. And so with that we can now go ahead and we're going to write an energy uh, balance on the control surface. And just like before, uh, what we're going to have is heat in through convective heat transfer. We have heat in through radiation heat transfer. And then we're also going to assume that we have conduction coming into our little control volume here across the control surface. So we have heat in through convection, radiation, conduction. Uh, plus the rate of energy generation within our control volume. And all of that has to equal zero. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to write out the equation. And from that, we're going to try to solve for what's happening on the boundary at uh, location MN. And just like before, what we're doing, we're assuming a unit depth into the page. So I could write here unit depth. and that would equal 1. And so we begin with Newton's Law of Cooling. We then have our radiation term, the Stefan Boltzmann constant. And with this, we're implicitly assuming that our temperatures are all in Kelvin. And then we have Fourier's law handling the conduction coming in. And then finally we have our internal generation term. Sorry, that's a delta, not a very good delta. Delta x over 2 looks about the same as it did before. And all of this has to equal 0. And so what we want to do now is we want to find a way to be able to determine Tm comma N. And the reason why I said radiation was the most complex is because we have this fourth power term here. So we're not going to be able to find a, an explicit relationship for Tmn. But what I'll do is I will rewrite this and I'm going to assume that we have a uniform grid again just like we did before. So delta x is equal to delta y. And if we have that condition, then we can write out kind of doing a little bit of isolation, but not really because we still have a TMN in our radiative heat transfer term, which we'll see right here. Okay, so that's what we get. It got a little crunched over on the right hand side. I apologize about that. But uh, this then becomes the basis 
for the equation that we can use to determine what is going on on the surface when we have both radiative heat transfer and convection. So with that, that concludes setting up the finite difference uh, formulation of the heat diffusion equation. What do we do with all of this? Well, what you do, you put together all these equations for whatever object you're looking at, and you'll then get a series of uh, equations uh, that you can then solve and set up a matrix, and you solve by doing the matrix inversion technique. And what we'll be doing in the next lecture segment, I put together a tool using Excel and I'll show you how to use that tool. And essentially what that tool has done is it's taken all of these boundary conditions and uh, the finite difference formulation for the two dimensional heat generation equation or heat diffusion equation with internal generation. And, and we're gonna apply it to solve some problems. And, and we'll look at problems that uh, uh, perhaps we'll look at the one that we looked at earlier when we uh, did the heat diffusion equation using separation of variables, but you can do much more complex things than that. But we'll play around with that in the next segment. I'll show that and, and that will give you an idea as to what happens when you put all of this together. And, and that's what we'll be doing in the next lecture. So I've uh, gone through a lot of uh, derivations here with the finite difference technique. Don't get too hung up on it. Basically, it's just showing you the method. Uh, but once you put it all together, you just got to be careful and, and you can accomplish some pretty neat things when, when you put all this together. So uh, numerical methods and finite difference methods applied to the heat diffusion equation can be very, very powerful. And, and we'll see that when we start playing around with some of the solutions in the next lecture. In this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at an Excel template that enables you to solve the heat diffusion equation using the finite difference method. And uh, all of the equations that we've developed or derived in the last uh, couple of lectures involved the heat diffusion equation, applying the finite difference technique to it. And we came up with a number of, of equations that we could use for either interior nodes or boundary conditions. And so essentially what this spreadsheet does is it takes those and, and uh, converts it into an Excel format. And when you start the Excel spreadsheet, it may complain about a circular reference error depending upon the version of Excel that you're using. If it does complain about that, just ignore it uh, and just say uh, cancel. Uh, another thing is, is uh, if you come up under File, and you go under Options. Now, th this is going to depend on the version of Excel that you're using. Uh, but if you go under Formulas, you'll see Enable Iterative Calculation. You want to make sure that that is selected. And th this will determine the maximum number of iterations before Excel stops computing. So I'm going to change that to 5,000. And I quite often also have the maximum change being a little bit smaller, so I'll convert that, add another zero in there, and click OK. That will specify how many times Excel has to go through iterations in order to solve it. So what we have in the spreadsheet over on the left, uh, the first two blocks here, these are interior nodes, and that's where we'll set the interior node values, either an interior node without generation or an interior node with generation. If you see the divide by zero error, don't get too concerned. That's just because we haven't popped populated the values that go into that cell. Um, but what we do, we populate things here and then we copy and paste them into our grid. And, and here you can see a, a grid that has been set up. Uh, usually what I like to do is, we'll, we'll just delete that and do no color. Uh, so depending upon how many cells you need for doing your model, uh, the first thing that you usually do is you set up your grid, however many grid cells you might need. So let's say we're doing a problem that is uh, five by five. So one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. So that is a five by five grid. I'll color that orange just so that we know where our grid is. And what I also like to do is change the width. So let's change the width here. 
makes it a little easier to see. And then I'm just going to enter in 25 degrees C. It can be whatever you want, uh, but this is just a starting condition. It makes it easier when you copy and paste in your values. And it also ensures sometimes the Excel will complain if you don't have numbers in here. And for some of the formulas or the boundary conditions that we're going to copy in, it'll give you a divide by zero error. And that will mess up your spreadsheet. So you'll want to start by doing that. Uh, populate the values. Now, how many cells should you be entering? Well, that it depends on the grid spacing, your delta X or your delta Y. And for this uh, spreadsheet, we use uniform grid spacing. Um, but if you recall the way that we derive the equations for the finite difference, uh, if we had the way that we set it up, we had nodes on the surface, and 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 so for a system. Uh, where, let's say, if we had three grid points, that would be uh, two delta x for three grid points. So essentially what I'm saying is the number of cells that you need is going to be whatever length. So take the, the, the length uh, of, of your object here and divide by the delta x that you're going to set and, and that needs to come out to be an integer, so make sure that that's an integer. But take your length of the object, or the width in this case, divided by delta x, and add 1. And that is the number of cells that you need to have going across. Do the same thing for the vertical dimension. And the reason is, if you look at the nomenclature when we set up that grid, we went from 0 to m, or 0 to n. And, and so consequently, we have m plus 1 grid points or n plus 1 grid points, and that's why you have to add the 1 to that. So that's just a little uh, technicality with it. Um, another one is once you're running the Excel spreadsheet, you push F9 to make it go and, and do the calculation. And you'll see down in the bottom here, there will be a thing showing you how many iterations it's gone through. And we'll look at that later when we solve the problem in a later segment. So we begin, we set up our grid, uh, knowing delta x and delta y, and you enter in values to begin with. Once you've done that, uh, you might want to color the perimeter, whatever the perimeter conditions might be. And, and so let's say you have an insulated boundary here. Uh, what you can do, you can color code. We're not going to put anything in those cells, but it's just a way to remind you what's going on. So if you have an insulated boundary, uh, sometimes I use the fiberglass pink color to remind me that that's insulation. Uh, and then let's say the other boundaries are uh, natural convection or forced convection. So I'll make them blue. And that's a way that I can remember that I have convective heat transfer on those boundaries and the bottom was insulated. And, and so that's just a thing for you to do to know how to set up your grid. It gives you kind of a picture type thing so you remember what those boundary conditions were. Uh, you don't paste the boundaries here. You're actually going to put them into your grid. And, and so the boundary nodes or cells are the ones that I'm highlighting here. Those are the boundaries. And your interior nodes are going to be those cells there. And, and so what you do after you have set this up and, and you put these colors, then you need to go over here and determine which of the boundary conditions apply for your particular case. And so uh, what I'll do now is I'll scroll through and show you the boundary conditions that have been established. We have uh, a couple of different convective boundary conditions so that you can have two different values of convective heat transfer. Maybe you have natural convection on one surface and maybe you have forced convection on another. But whenever you set these up, what you need to do, you need to enter in the value of the convective heat transfer coefficient. So let's say uh, we have natural convection. I'll put something low. 10 watts per square meter Kelvin. Thermal conductivity, I'll say it's 200. And delta X, delta Y, 0 0.001, that's for one millimeter. Um, that depends on your grid that you want to set up and how big your object is. Q dot, I'll assume that we don't have generation. Um, but even if you enter it in, uh, well, no, it will have an effect here, so we don't want to enter it in yet. And, and then T convection, let's assume that the ambient convective air temperature, 25 degrees C. So you put that in, and notice when I did that, all of these cells went from divide by zero to some value. And, and that means that we've entered in all of the values that we need to. If I click on one of those cells and go up to the formula bar, it shows what it is pulling from. So it's pulling from all these values 
values up here. Uh, the bio number obviously is pulling in from values above, and that's why these other cells aren't highlighted. But if I click in the bio number, then you can see that those ones have been pulled in. So that is a convective boundary. Let's take a look. Uh, now I put little pictures here. And, and this spreadsheet, uh, the, the model originally came uh, out of the appendix of a textbook by J.P. Holman. And it was a McGraw-Hill textbook, heat transfer. And they had an Excel spreadsheet model in the back. But what I've done, I've kind of uh, amplified it, giving you a lot more boundary conditions, uh, draw these little pictures, which hopefully make it a little easier to figure out which boundary condition to apply for which condition. Um, but what the picture is showing is here, this is the node where we're operating on. So this would be a right-hand surface with a uh, convection, a convective boundary condition. You can see the air or the fluid flowing over, a T convection and H1. And it shows the node spacing. And then if you click on this cell, you can see that it's pulling from the nodes that we see in the pictures, so the bottom, above, and then the left. And if we go to the next uh, boundary condition that we have here for a right surface, it's pulling from the right cells, the above, below, and to the right. Uh, click down here, and it's pulling from below. Click here, and it should be pulling from above, and that's what we see. So those are some of the boundary conditions. And then we have corners. So if you have a corner boundary condition with convection, you would use that cell. And what you will do, uh, you have to paste in, copy and paste all of the boundary conditions. So you'll be doing those, you'll be doing those, you'll be doing those, and finally you'll be doing those. And, and so you would then click on one of these cells. So let's say we want to copy and paste uh, one of these here. So what I'll do is I will do control C and then I'm going to drag over those three cells and control V. And now if I click in there, you'll see that that formula has been pasted into that cell and it's pulling from the appropriate adjacent cells in order to solve that. So that's the way that you handle the boundary conditions. I'll show you the other boundary conditions. This is another convective boundary condition here. Uh, this is one with an insulated boundary. So in our problem, we do have insulation, but we would have to enter in the values. Thermal conductivity, I think we said it was 200.001 delta x delta y, no internal generation. So I would need to find the appropriate boundary condition. This is the one because the insulation on the outside. I click there, control C, I go up to my object, and that would be these ones here, control V, I paste it in. And if you click on those cells, sure enough, it is pulling from the appropriate ones. It's not going outside of our grid, and it should not. Uh, now, I haven't done anything about the corners yet. I'll get to that when we do the other uh, segments later on where we look at more specific cases. But let's keep looking down at the other boundaries. We looked at insulated. Now, constant heat flux with convection, that would be if you have like an electric resistance heater with convective heat transfer on the outside. Uh, what else do we have? Constant heat flux with no convective, so that would just be if you have constant heat flux on a surface. Composite solids, you might have a case where you go from one solid to another. You can specify the uh, internal and external thermal conductivity. Uh, just be careful to note which one is which, and I've tried to uh, color code it as well as say which is external or internal on the picture. And if we keep going down, we, we have some with composite solids and some convective boundary conditions there. Another composite solid, so if you have different cases for your object, you can implement those. Now, this is radiation with convection. And, and so for radiation with convection, one thing that you need to be careful with, uh, even after entering the values, so let's say emissivity is 0.8, surrounding temperature, this has to be Kelvin. Be careful with that, 298 uh, H. Uh, let's say we have 25, doesn't really matter. It can be anything 200 for K, 0 0.001, Q dot, no internal generation. And I'll say 25 degrees C for the ambient air temperature for the convective heat transfer. But notice after I've entered all those values, this still shows divide by zero. And what you need to do, you need to click in that cell, 
come up into the formula bar and click enter in order to get rid of the divide by zero. If you try copying and pasting the divide by zero up into your, uh, your grid, it's going to mess up and, and it won't work. And so make sure you do that before you copy and paste one of the radiation boundary conditions. And that's just one of the nuances of the spreadsheet. A little bit of a quirk with the way Excel works. And I can't remember exactly why. There might be some sort of circular reference error there or something that, that causes it to do that. Uh, we have another radiation and convection boundary condition. And then finally, we just have straight radiation without convection. So those are the boundary conditions that I put together. Uh, if you feel so inclined and you figure out how they're set up, you can come up with your own boundary condition. Uh, it does take a little bit of time to set them up, and it is a little bit of a headache given that you got to make sure that you're getting all the proper cells when you do this. Hopefully there are no errors in the spreadsheet. I've used it quite extensively a number of times, and it seems to be working properly. Um, but anyways, those are your boundaries. And then what you need to do, let's say we've specified all the external boundaries, then you have to handle your interior nodes. So depending on if you have generation or no generation, those would be the ones that you would copy. If you do have generation, you would have to enter in your generation rate. So that's in watts per meter cubed. K we said was 200. 0.001 for delta x, delta y. Then what you do, you do a control C and you would paste in. And so there we go, it did some calculations for us. Um, but I didn't specify all those boundaries. And then if you wanted to see it run, you, you keep pushing F9 and you'll see that that seems to be pretty much converged already. Uh, let me try here. Yeah, it seems to be. What I'm doing is hiding the numbers because sometimes that can slow it down. But that's what you do. And let's say you had no internal generation, then you would have copied and pasted these ones in. And you see it returns back to 25 because nothing is going on here. There's nothing driving this process. I think everything was at 25 degrees C. So that is an introduction to the Excel spreadsheet. After you have that, then you can plot it, which I'll show you in the examples that are coming. Uh, it is not the greatest, but it's not bad. It's for doing kind of quick and dirty calculations. But what it does is it will demonstrate the use of the finite difference method applied to heat transfer problems. And that's what we're going to be looking at in the next three segments. <laughs>
and I'll make that orange as well. And we'll begin by putting in some arbitrary number. I like to put 25 degrees C as being the starting point. And we may not necessarily need that for the current problem, but if you're doing radiation conditions, sometimes the copying and pasting of the boundary conditions can cause problems. And so by putting in numbers at the beginning, it makes it a little uh, easier and you avoid those problems. So what I'm now going to do, I'm going to modify the perimeter boundary conditions. And if we want, we can make those different colors. So let's do... Uh, we'll just make all the perimeters a different color. Now they're going to be different temperatures because remember we said that the four walls are at different temperatures but this is kind of just a way to visualize it a little quicker. Um, and now the upper wall we said was 100 degrees C so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy and paste all the interior or the upper wall. Uh, the corners I'm not going to treat yet. The corners will have to do the average of uh, each of the walls. Looking at the left wall, it was 75 degrees C. So I'll copy. Boy, that red is sure hard to see. Maybe I should change that. I probably will in a moment. Uh, 25 degrees C here. Well, that's already done because that was the one that we started with. And then 90 here. And I'll fill in the rest. Let me get rid of that red. It's kind of hard on the eyes. And we'll put another color there for that boundary condition. Uh, what well, looks good? You can't see anything with the blue. Yellow. You know yellow's not bad. Let's do that. And then finally we'll do that one there. Okay. So what we have now, we have the boundaries, uh, with the exception of the corners, the corner there, the average of 175, that's 87.5 degrees C down here, you know, the average of 75, 25 is 50, and then this corner it's 90 and 25, 57.5, and then finally up here, 190, the average is 95. Okay, so there we have all the boundaries specified. And, and this is quite a simple one because we have no internal generation. Uh, we don't have any kind of boundary conditions other than specifying the temperatures on the perimeter of the object. So all we need to do now is copy and paste in the interior node cell. So clicking up in the formula bar, that shows us that the interior node is being computed from uh, the upper lower left and right, which is what we found in our finite difference formulation of the energy equation, or the heat equation, I should say, the heat diffusion equation. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take that, I'm going to do control C, and then I'm going to drag in the middle, and I'm going to do a control V, and there you can see it does a calculation. I'll push F9 a number of times, and we'll see that it slowly converges. And what it's doing is it's doing the calculation over and over and over again. And there we go. Looks like it's pretty much converged. So that is the solution of the uh, square plate that we're looking at with the boundary conditions as we've imposed. Now, it's sometimes nice to be able to graph this up in a contour plot. So let's select that data and then we'll go up on to insert and depending on the Excel version you're using you might have different ways of doing the contour plots you'll have to figure that out on your own uh, but I want the contour so I'm going to select that it puts it there let me put it right below now one of the things that Excel does and I still don't know why I'm sure some of you out there know why but uh, what it does is it inverts the plot so let me show if I change this temperature at the top let me put it 50 degrees you'll see that it's actually at the bottom of the contour and we don't want that uh, what we want we want it to actually represent where we think the object is with our grid so the way to correct that if you come up under chart tool uh, not design layout then you go under axis depth axis and then show reverse axis and there now we can see the little anomaly that I introduced this up at the top which is where it should be let me change that to a hundred and I'll hit F9 a couple of times that it converges and there we go what we can see here this is a contour plot showing us the temperature distribution in our plate uh, we had temperature scales as shown over on the right hand side in the legend so the bottom of the plate was at around 25 degrees C 
And when we look here on the contour plot, 20 to 40 is red, and that's what we see at the bottom of the plate. And, and then the, the, the blue, light blue, is actually the hottest section of the plate. And when we look at our boundary conditions, the hottest is there, and it's also quite a high temperature over here on the right-hand side. A lower temperature over here at 75, and we can see that in the purple, so that would be from 60 to 70 degrees C. So anyways, that, that's a very, very uh, quick demonstration of the Excel model. And there are many, many other boundary conditions that exist within the Excel model but you can see it's pretty easy to do calculations that uh, were, were taking quite a while when we were trying to do the separation of variables technique and solving the heat diffusion equation for a plate with different boundary conditions and the problem that we looked at earlier in the course was one with I, I think we had a hundred degrees C on three of the walls and then 110 on the fourth wall or something like that it wasn't as, as uh, different as, as what we're seeing here and, and so anyways, that, that shows a demonstration of the Excel model. We'll take a look at another example in the next segment, uh, and we'll be introducing slightly more complex boundary conditions for that one. We're now going to solve the, another example problem using the Excel spreadsheet, which uh, is, enables us to solve the heat diffusion equation using the finite difference technique. And what we're going to do, we're going to take a look at, uh, again, a square plate. Um, we're going to make it a little bit more complex than what we had in the last segment. The last segment of your call, we just had uh, constant temperature boundary conditions. We're going to mix it up a little bit this time, and, and we're going to change the boundary conditions. Uh, the plate is going to be the same size, so we're dealing with a plate that is 0.6 meters wide by 0.5 meters high, and we will have a grid size of 0 0.05 meters and consequently in the x direction 0 0.6 divided by the 0 0.05 uh, that gives us 12 plus 1 so 13 cells going across in the horizontal direction and then in the vertical direction the 0.5 divided by the 0 0.05 gives us 10 and remember we have to add one more and so that would give us 10 plus 1 cells that we have in the vertical direction so let me begin by sketching out the plate and then I will describe the boundary conditions that we have around that plate. Um, so what I am going to do, I'm going to color the first square orange just so that we know where the upper corner is and then I'm going to go across 13 cells. So there we have 13 cells. I will color those orange. And then in the vertical direction, uh, we said that we had 11 cells. So there's 11. And now I will color in the entire plate. All right, so you can see it's a rectangular plate, 0.6 meters wide, 0.5 meters high. And the boundary conditions that we're going to have, on the upper surface, we are going to have a convective boundary condition. And on the right surface, we will have another convective boundary condition uh, with the same uh, convective heat transfer coefficient and temperature, and that being uh, 25 degrees C and 100 watts per square meter. So what I'm going to do, uh, just to color code it and make it a little easier for us to remember what's going on with this, I oftentimes like to uh, color code the boundary conditions so that we can easily remember what we had there. And we'll do the same with that. That cell, for some reason, got colored. So let's do a no fill. OK, so that is the upper and the right boundary condition. Now for the left boundary condition, we're told that we have insulation. So we have insulation over on this side. So let's color code that. And insulation, I'm going to pick fiberglass pink. 
There we go. Uh, and then for the lower surface, we are told that we have a constant heat flux boundary condition. So what is going on there? We could have an electric resistance heater or something like that. So that is hot, a high temperature most likely. So let's make it red. Okay, so there we have all of our boundary conditions. I'm going to make that blue just to give us two. There we go. Okay, so we're interested in what is going on inside of the, the plate, obviously. Uh, and although I've drawn the boundary conditions on the outside, really the boundary conditions are in these cells here. Because if you recall, let me take a look at the picture. Our node, the node where we are solving, this is a convective boundary condition on a right-hand surface, so it would be perhaps a cell like that. Uh, this node is on this surface, and, and consequently the outer perimeter cells, this is where we will be applying the boundary conditions uh, when we build our Excel model and then solve it. So those are where the boundary conditions are. So let's begin by entering in the values. Um, what I will do, I will begin, I always like to put a temperature at the starting point and sometimes the Excel model has problems especially if you have a radiation boundary condition uh, because when you paste in the boundary condition it'll complain about a divide by zero error. And by putting in these numbers, I found that it actually alleviates that problem. So whenever you use the Excel model, I uh, recommend, and uh, not recommend, that you need to do this or it won't work. Uh, put in these values and, and then you can construct it from there. So there we have our initial setup for this problem. Now what we need to do, we need to enter in the boundary condition values over here and then find the appropriate cell and copy paste. So what we're going to do, let's begin by working these boundary conditions here and, and here. Now another thing that I should say our corner cells, sometimes uh, if you recall from the last example where we had the fixed temperatures, we just took the average between that wall and that wall when we were assigning the corner. We're not going to be able to do that in this case. And, and so what I'm going to do, uh, I'm just going to assume that the corner... Uh, because I don't think I have built any kind of boundary conditions that would have convection and insulation or insulation and constant heat flux or constant heat flux and convection. So uh, as a result of that, what I'm going to do, uh, I'll probably just make that one convection. I'll make this one maybe insulation and that one convection. Uh, and then this one is going to be easy to do because that's convection on both sides, so it's just convection on a corner. But just be aware of that, that uh, you have to make a little bit of an approximation and your model will will have a little bit of error as a result of that. But if you make your grid spacing really small, as in all finite difference approaches, the smaller the grid, the better the solution, uh, that little error is going to be quite minimal. And consequently, it should not have significant impact on the solution that you produce. But let's begin uh, putting our convective boundary conditions in. And we have to determine what material we're dealing with. And, and just for kicks, what I'm going to do uh, rarely in heat transfer are we solve, or, uh, working with problems involving gold. And so I'm going to say that we're dealing with gold. And the thermal conductivity of gold is 317, so I'm going to put that in there. Uh, I said the convective heat transfer coefficient was 100, so 100 watts per square meter Kelvin. Delta X, delta Y, that was 0 0.05 meters, so we enter that. There is no internal generation in this problem. Convective environment temperature in degrees C, that is 25 degrees C, so let's enter that. And you can see when you do that, you enter those values, our grid, uh, grid values, uh, cells, the ones we're going to copy and paste in, they have all become populated now with values. So what we now need to do is we need to scroll down and find the appropriate boundary condition that we can copy and paste in. And the one that I'm going to begin with, let's begin with this corner cell because that's kind of unique. So let's scroll down and look for where we have an upper, there we go. So th this one here, 
is an upper right corner and what we do then is we click here and let's see yeah it is the upper cell the one that it pertains to the wording so top right convective corner I click there I can go in the formula box and it'll show us what it is computing that particular cell from and if we scroll up you'll see that it's also pulling in the values that we had up here uh, for this particular problem. So what I'm going to do, let me do control C and I will paste that in here. So you can see that it's changed color and it doesn't look as if it's done anything. However, in that cell, if I go in the formula box, you can see that it's taking in the values from in here for this particular problem. Uh, and it hasn't changed anything because we said the external temperature is 25 and the initial temperature is 25. So there's no temperature differential. So nothing's going to happen in Excel as a result of that. Uh, now let's work on these upper boundary conditions. So there we go. It would be this one right here. So I'm going to click there. I'll do control C. And then what I'm going to do, I'm going to copy and paste into that entire row. And there we go. And, and you can see here it's doing something. Ah, yeah, the reason why it's doing something here. Let me click on that cell. And yeah, that's strange why it's starting to change there. Uh, I thought it would have been 25. Uh, I, I guess it's because there's an edge effect. And oh, it's pulling in this cell. Uh, you, you can't see it because that is pink. But uh, this cell is highlighted as well, and we have no value there. So when I said that there's going to be a little bit of an error, you know what I should do? Uh, what we're going to do uh, in order to correct for that, let's find the boundary condition for a left corner, this one right here. So let's click on that, copy, and we'll paste that in there. And there you see it restores it back to 25. But that's because what it's doing is it's thinking that this is now a convective surface, but it really isn't. There's insulation there that, as I mentioned earlier, is a minor error in the way that the uh, Excel spreadsheet works. Uh, now what we're going to do, we're going to handle these boundaries here. And so let's look for convective on a right surface. So that is this one right here. It's right at the top. So that's kind of an easy one to work with. So what we're going to do, we're going to click, copy, and then I'm going to control paste. I'm not going to do the bottom one because it's going to give us that uh, strange effect again. Uh, for the bottom one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down and look for a lower uh, bottom right corner. So I'll click on this one here and we paste in. There we go. Okay, so now what we're going to do, let's work with these boundaries here. This was all insulated and it was a left facing wall. So what we need to now do is scroll down in the spreadsheet. Uh, we don't need a second convective. Insulated boundary. There we go. So uh, K, we said the thermal conductivity, we're dealing with gold. So let's put that in. Delta X, Delta Y, 0.05. And Q dot, there's no internal generation. And it would be a case where we have this type of boundary where we have insulation on the left. So I'm going to do a copy and then I'm going to go back up and I will paste in all of these cells. And there we go. And now the bottom one, I'm going to look for the corner. So let's look for insulation in a bottom corner. Uh, yeah, so what we're going to do, we're going to assume there's insulation on the bottom. We know there really isn't because that's a constant heat flux boundary. Uh, but I haven't gone through and come up with insulated on the left and constant heat flux on, on the bottom. If, if you're so inclined, you could come up with all those boundary conditions. But uh, I did not do that when I created the spreadsheet. Uh, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to paste that one in. And now what we need to do, let's handle these ones. These are constant heat flux from the bottom. So we scroll down in the spreadsheet looking for constant heat flux. It's not insulated. Uh, constant heat flux with convection. No, we don't have convection in this case. Uh, constant heat flux boundary. There we go. Uh, and what was the value? Uh, we were told it was 100 watts per square meter, so I'll enter 100 there. Uh, we said that we were dealing with a gold plate, so 317.05 for delta X, delta Y. There is no internal generation. 
And so I leave that blank. And now we look for the appropriate boundary condition. It's this one right here because we have the bottom surface with constant heat flux. So I click there, I do control C, and then I go up. Uh, there we go, there's our spreadsheet. I drag across and I do control V to paste in the value for the boundary condition. Uh, it's interesting, went to uh, 25.01, not really sure why. Uh, close to 25, there must be some sort of anomaly. Uh, let me see here. Uh, if I click there, what is it pulling in? It's pulling in those values. So I'm not sure what would be driving that. Uh, it could be round off errors somewhere in the spreadsheet. Not a big deal. It's close to 25. And the last thing we need to do, uh, now that we've done all of this, we copy and paste the internal cells. So what we do, we click on the interior node, and if we look at the formula bar, we see the interior node is being represented by all of the adjoining ones. So we click on that. Uh, we'll do Control c And then I'm going to copy, and I'll select, and then do Control v and there we go, look at that, uh, heat transfer taking place before our eyes. And, and so what this is going to do, it's going to uh, work, it's trying to converge. I will keep pushing F9. So there we go, we're, we're getting to convergence and that's a pretty boring looking solution. Uh, the temperature going from 25.29 at the bottom to 25.23 at the top. And I wonder if this is not because we've used such a high thermal conductivity. So let's give something a try here. What I'm going to do, I'm going to drop the thermal conductivity in all of the boundary conditions that we've assigned. Let's drop it down to 100. So we'll change that and then let's look for all the other ones. Uh, there's one, a hundred. Maybe that's why heat transfer textbooks rarely use gold. Uh, there's a uh, heat flux was a hundred watts per square meter. We'll put a hundred there. And let's see, were there any other boundaries that we used? No, I think those were all of them. We didn't use radiation. Okay, so let's go back up to our grid. And I'm going to hit F9 again, and we'll see where that takes us by changing the uh, thermal conductivity of the plate. Again, that's pretty boring. Not much going on. Let's try reducing the convective heat transfer coefficient. So let's drop that to more of a natural convective heat transfer. Let's try 10. I see a lot of stuff going on there, but uh, were there any other places where we had to enter the convective heat transfer coefficient? Insulated boundary, no, that just had thermal conductivity. Uh, that one, surface heat flux, no, we had nothing with the, okay, so I think that was the only one. Let me go back up. So we've dropped the convective heat transfer coefficient now, and I'll keep pushing F9 to see what we get on convergence. So this is taking quite a while. What I'm going to do, let me go into options and what I'm going to do is look at options, uh, was it under, yeah, here we go, under formulas, older versions of Excel might be under calculation, uh, but iteration, I'm going to bump this up. Uh, let's see, maximum, enable iterative calculation. So I'll bump it up to 5,000 and I'm going to reduce the minimum. So minimum change, I'll put it there. Now let's see what that does. 
Okay, so there you can see now it's marching. Okay, now that's only so interesting. Again, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to bump up the surface heat flux. Let's make that a thousand. And so that's moving the temperature up. While that's going, what I'm going to do, let's bump the convective heat transfer coefficient back up to 100. And were there any other places where we had convective heat transfer? Not insulated, not there. Constant heat flux, no. Okay, I think that was the only one. We'll go back up. I hit F9. All right, so that seems to be convergence. Now what I'm going to do, let's select our data, insert, we'll do a contour. That is what it is showing us. Now if you recall from before, one of the things about Excel is it flips this around. So I got to go layout, axis, depth, and then show reverse. And so that is more like what we're simulating. And so this surface over here is our insulated boundary. This is the constant heat flux. And you can see that that has the highest temperature. Uh, we have convective and convective here. The lowest temperature is in this upper corner, uh, which is where we have the largest amount of convective heat transfer. So that is an example of using the Excel spreadsheet to solve the heat diffusion equation where you have more complex boundary conditions. And it also shows that you can really play around with this quite a bit. And, and watch if I change this to 50. Now we'll run that. And so what it's doing is going through, trying to converge. And automatically our plot updates. So it shows uh, the utility of this because pretty much everybody has Excel uh, in their office computer or if you're a student. Uh, and, and it's pretty easy to use this. You, know, you can share it. You, you can do quick kind of back of the envelope calculations using finite difference. And uh, you don't need to have very expensive commercial software in order to do it. Uh, the interface is not the greatest. Uh, and that's because I developed it, but it works. It's functional. Uh, and it was originally based off of an Excel code that uh, was in the back of a textbook by Holman, a McGraw-Hill textbook. And, and that's where this idea originally the motivation came from but then I added a lot more boundary conditions, made it a little bit more user-friendly, I guess you could say. So that is the Excel model. Uh, in the next segment, we'll play around with radiation and see what that does. All right, the last problem that we're going to look at using the Excel spreadsheet for solving the heat diffusion equation using the finite difference technique is going to be uh, a problem that involves radiative heat transfer. And what we're going to uh, work on here is we're going to work on a problem involving a bar of copper that is 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters and it is sitting on an insulated surface and, and uh, so there is insulation on the bottom of the bar and then the 10 millimeter by 10 millimeter bar will be uh, there's internal generation in the bar at a rate of 5 times 10 to the 5 watts per meter cubed. Uh, the copper bar thermal conductivity is 401 and there is radiative and convective heat transfer from the three upper exposed surfaces of this square bar. The environmental conditions that this bar is sitting in, uh, the free stream ambient temperature 25 degrees C as is the surroundings and so converting that to Kelvin that's 298 Kelvin. Convective heat transfer coefficient, we have a mix between forced and natural, about 20 watts per square meter uh, 
uh, Kelvin. Emissivity will assume this copper bar has an emissivity of 0.75, so maybe it's a little tarnished. And the grid spacing that we're going to use is one millimeter for both delta X and delta Y. And with that, uh, the 10 millimeter by 10 millimeter bar, so in the horizontal direction, 10 millimeters divided by the one millimeter grid spacing gives us 10 cells plus one, so 11 cells in the horizontal. And for the vertical, again, 10 millimeters divided by the one millimeter grid spacing plus one gives us 11 cells in the vertical direction. So let's go ahead and set that up and then we'll see how it operates when we use Excel. So I'm going to begin by clicking in a cell in a corner here and I'm going to color it just like we've done with all the others. And we said that there were 11 in the horizontal. So there we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I'll color code those and you know what I'm going to do? Let me set the width of all of them to the same. So we'll do something like that. There we go. And then 11 in the vertical. And I will color code that. And then we fill it in here. And again, enter in the values. Uh, starting initial condition for our grid, just like we did with the other examples. All right. And if you want to put your boundary conditions on here, I'm just going to put the lower one. That was an insulated boundary, so we'll make that a gray. Now let's do pink. Pink for fiberglass pink. Okay, so there we have our bar. It doesn't look square, but it is because we're going to set delta X and delta Y equal to one millimeter. And let's go in and start entering in the values. We said that the internal generation was five times 10 to the five. So uh, five E zero five. K was 401. And delta X and delta Y was uh, one millimeter. So 0 0.001. Now, one thing that we should do, let's go under options here. And depending on the version of Excel that you're using, uh, if you go under formula, sometimes it's under calculations. There's so many different versions of Excel. Uh, but enable iterative calculation. You want to have that checked. And here you can specify the number of iterations. I'm going to specify it to be 5,000 or the maximum change to be uh, 0 0.00001. So that's a very, very small change. Uh, you can play with this and that will set, uh, when you push F9, it will either get to 5,000 iterations or this being the maximum change. So we'll, we'll set that for this particular calculation. Uh, other boundary conditions we have, let's go find the insulated and then the radiative and convective. So scrolling down, that's a convective boundary. Insulated, there we go. Okay, so we need to set 401 delta x.00, what did I say, one millimeter, so that is 0 0.001, and q dot was 5e05. Okay, so we've done the insulated boundary. Now we have to find the radiative heat transfer with convection, constant heat flux, composite solids, another composite solid, radiation and convection. Okay, this is the one that we want. Emissivity we said was 0.75, so we enter that. Surrounding temperature, be careful here. I mix units, I have degrees Celsius and Kelvin, so this one is 298K. Uh, Stefan Boltzmann constant. Oh boy, I deleted that. Uh, let me pull it from down below. It's right here. I deleted that earlier. That should be in your spreadsheet. There we go. Uh, H was the convective heat transfer coefficient, 20 watts per meter squared Kelvin. Thermal conductivity, we said copper, pure copper, 401.001 for the delta X, delta Y, one millimeter. And Q dot was five to the zero five. And T convection, now this is in degrees C, it was 25 degrees C. Now, one thing when, when you're dealing with the Excel spreadsheet and radiation, you'll notice these are still showing divide by zero. And what we need to do is find the boundary conditions that we're going to use. So we're going to use this one because if I go to our object, that would be the boundaries over here. So we're certainly using a right uh, boundary 
with convection and radiation. So I'll scroll back down to that. Okay, here we are. So what you need to do, once you've entered these values, you need to go into the cell, go up into the formula bar, click there and push enter. And then it converts it to a number. If you try copying and pasting this into your spreadsheet, into your grid, it's going to mess it up. Uh, I don't know why Excel does that. Don't ask me. That's just the way that it works. And probably some of you out there know why. Uh, send me an email if you know why. Uh, and I'll fix it in the spreadsheet. And now top boundary condition. There we go. Uh, bottom, we don't have a bottom. We do have an upper right-hand corner, so I'm going to click there, go up into the formula bar, hit enter. Uh, we do have an upper left, so I'll click there, up in the formula bar. And the right, we don't have a lower right, we don't have a lower left, so I think I've done all of the ones that we need. So what I'm now going to do, I'm going to copy and paste in the boundary conditions into our grid, and we'll begin with the insulated boundary. And so what I will do, we had a lower surface, so these are the middle ones. So I'll copy going up to our grid. There we go. So I'm going to paste into those. And then what I'm going to do for the corners, let's go back to the insulated boundary. Insulation. I'm going to pick this corner and this corner. So this will be the lower, uh, the bottom right. So I copy. I apologize for the bell, but that's the quickest way for me to get around Excel. Uh, then the other one down here, I'll copy, and then I'm going to paste into that one. And if you want to see what cells are being used, just like I said before, go up in the formula bar and you can see that it's using those cells there. Uh, these ones in the middle, they're just using the ones around there. Okay, so now what we need to do, we need to handle the radiative boundaries. I'm going to begin with the corners, so let's start with the upper left, and we'll scroll all the way down to where we had the radiation. Where was radiation? Uh, oops, I'm gone too far down. Radiation is here, so let's get the upper left, so I'm going to click there, control C. I'll go up. So that's the upper left that we're dealing with. And it's going to complain here. And the reason is because it's scientific. So change that to number. Everything is good. And then the other one, let's get the upper right. Where's upper right? There it is. Okay. Going back up to our grid. There we go. Again, it's playing the game and by the fact that it's giving us a scientific. I guess I must have set that cell scientific when I set up the Excel spreadsheet. Anyways, you can change it. Now what we need to do, we need to do the left, the right, and the upper. So let's go get those cells. Let's start with the left. Finding our radiative condition with convection. There's the left. Click there. Control C. Go back up. And then there, this is kind of like playing Minecraft. Okay, uh, uh, let's see, I don't play Minecraft. I watch people play Minecraft and I'm puzzled by it. But anyways, okay, the right surface, control C. Uh, okay, and I apologize if you're a gamer and you feel offended by that comment. I used to spend a lot of time playing video games when I was young. I guess I got it out of my system. Okay, there we go. That's the last one. Radiation and convective boundary. Upper, we click there. Control C, going back up. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy and paste. Control V. And if you're wondering again, are those cells correct? Are they pulling in the right conditions? Yeah, that looks good. Clicking there, yeah, it's pulling in from the inside. That one looks good. These ones here, yeah, they're pulling in from there. That's pulling from the inside. Everything looks good. So the last thing that we need to do here, let's check the corners. I think I've already done these, but I'll do them again. 
corners look good. Okay, the last thing we need to do, we need to copy the interior node. So we've done the boundary conditions. The interior node was with generation. We have it right here. So I do control C, I do control V, paste it in. There we go. Let Excel run. And what you're noticing down in the bottom here, you see the number of iterations. Uh, it's kind of slow. And the reason is because we're watching it. Uh, if you scroll down and don't watch it, and we'll do that in the next run, uh, you'll notice that it moves much, much quicker. So we'll let this one do its thing. It's trying to converge. And, and so what it's doing is it's going through uh, calculation after calculation, applying the finite difference technique, uh, an iterative convergence process is what we're essentially doing here. So I'm going to hide it. I'm going to push F9. Now watch down here, the number of iterations much, much quicker. So that's the way to move the simulation a lot quicker than watching the numbers. And it's just because it takes time to generate those numbers and display them. And if you're not displaying them, the computer is much quicker. And so what we do, we keep pushing this. Let's take a peek. Oh, look at that. We're already at 67 degrees. So it's getting warmer. That's good. I know what the answer is, but I know where we should be going. Average, oh, that's kind of neat. It's showing us the average there. So we know what the temperature is, average in our grid. As we can see, it's still changing. And you'll notice that it's starting to converge when, when you push F9 and it no longer does the iterations. So we're still going. And now you can see it's changing very little each time I push F9. So we've exceeded uh, the thresholds that we set. So that means that we're pretty close to having a converged solution. Let's go take a peek. There we go. That's what it looks like. So this is a copper bar, 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters with internal generation, radiative heat transfer around the perimeter, insulated bottom. So let's select it. Uh, coming up insert, we're going to do a contour plot. There we go. Let's position the contour plot down below. Uh, the color, yeah, that's probably as good as we're going to get. We can try other colors if we want. Yeah, that one's not bad. We can see the difference. Now, the thing about Excel, I talked about this earlier with the contour plot. It does funny things. So go under layout, axis, depth axis, and show reverse. And that is what we're looking at. That's the actual result of our simulation. So that is an example of using the Excel spreadsheet for solving a problem with radiative heat transfer. The most important thing to remember when you enter the radiation value, go into the cell and click and enter up in the formula bar. Uh, if you recall what that was, where were we? right here. So for example, if we wanted to use this bottom, you'd have to go into this cell here, go up into the formula bar, click enter, and it populates it. If you try copying and pasting this into your spreadsheet, it's going to mess you up and it won't work. So that is the Excel spreadsheet and that is the finite difference method. It's kind of a, a neat little tool for quick and dirty calculations. Uh, not always the most convenient, but it works and it's quick. So. Uh, that gives you an introduction to finite difference and heat transfer calculations. All right, we're now going to move into a new area. And what we're now going to consider is the case where we can have uh, boundary conditions or conditions within our system changing as a function of time. And we refer to that as being transient conduction. So looking over what we've covered thus far uh, in all of the different lectures within this course, 
So we looked at 1D conduction analysis, and for that uh, we uh, quite often would use thermal resistances enabling us to examine those systems. Uh, we also looked at what we refer to as being systems that are conduction convection systems, and specifically an application of that was fins. We also looked at the case of one-dimensional conduction with internal generation. And again, uh, for that, we were able to look at slab. When I say slab, that's a 1D system, uh, basically a chunk of material, a cylinder or a sphere. And we also have looked at 2D conduction. And with analysis there, we use shape factors. And we have finally looked at 2D numerical analysis. So those are the systems that we've looked at thus far, and you'll notice that none of them deal with transient solutions, where your boundary conditions may be changing on the surface as a function of time, and if the boundary conditions are changing, what's going to happen within the solid as a function of time? And so that brings us to the area of transient conduction and transient conduction analysis. Okay, so we know that these are solutions, or this is what happens when you change the boundary conditions on an object. And so you go from one initial boundary condition to some new boundary condition, and then you're studying what happens as a function of time. And what we're going to do, we're going to take a look at a number of different methods of solution uh, when we look at transient conduction analysis. So we'll be looking at the heat diffusion equation. Again, that's the partial differential equation. And we'll be able to look at a limited number of solutions, uh, given that it is a partial differential equation. We have to make some rather uh, severe uh, simplifications for that equation. We'll be looking at another analysis technique referred to as being the lumped capacitance technique. And that basically assumes that the entire solid is at the same temperature as a function of time. Then we're going to be looking at uh, some approximate solutions to the heat diffusion equation. And for these, we can either look at them uh, using tables and looking at values in tables, or we can use a graphical technique that uh, uses what are called Heisler charts. And then finally, although we won't be covering it, another way that you could do this analysis is using numerical methods or solutions. And I won't cover uh, transient numerical solutions just because it gets a little bit more complex. Uh, and the Excel model that we developed earlier is not really appropriate for this type of solution. Uh, it would be more appropriate if you are doing this in some programming language, be it C or Fortran or something like that, where uh, you can store very large data sets. Uh, Excel is, is, you can do it in VBA, uh, but we're not going to be covering VBA in this course. So uh, that uh, those are the different techniques that we have for doing transient solution analysis. And uh, what we're going to do in the next segment, we're going to begin by looking at a fairly simple solution uh, that involves the heat diffusion equation. And then we'll get uh, move on and look at lump capacitance and then finally the approximate solutions in Heisler charts. So that's where we're going in the next couple of lectures. We're dealing with transient conduction analysis.
Okay, so we're looking at transient conduction, and what we're going to do, we're going to begin by looking at the heat diffusion equation. And what we'll be doing is considering a case with the simplest possible boundary conditions that, that we could encounter, and we'll come up with a solution for this technique. Well, I'll give you the solution. We won't go through the math, uh, but it essentially uses the separation of variable technique. So uh, what we're going to do, we're going to begin, we're looking at a slab or what we call an infinite plate, and the boundary conditions are at fixed temperatures. So these are probably the simplest boundary conditions that you could have. Um, and then the boundary conditions are suddenly changed to another temperature. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so there is the problem statement that we have. What we have is an infinite plate. And when we say infinite plate in heat transfer, uh, we're not assuming that it's infinite thickness. What we're doing is we're assuming that the plate goes in this direction and that direction to infinity and into and out of the plane of the screen uh, going towards infinity. And the plate itself actually does have a finite thickness, and so here we will define our x-axis. And the width of the plate, we will assign it to be 2L. So that is the width of the plate. So this here is our plate, and we say it's infinite because it goes up and down into and out of the plane of the screen to infinity. And what we're told is this plate is initially at temperature Ti. So the entire plate is at a fixed temperature at time zero. And then suddenly what we do is we change the boundaries at time T greater than zero. We change the boundaries here so this is T1 and this becomes T1. And so with that, what's happening is we're changing our boundary conditions and that change in temperature is going to move inwards towards the center of the plate with time. And so what we've looked at thus far in the course has been looking at things steady state. Finally, we're dealing with the problem dealing with transients. And so uh, let's take a look at how we would approach the solution to this problem. Now what we're going to do for the solution, we're going to begin with the heat diffusion equation. Okay, so we've worked with this equation uh, quite a few times already in the course. And what we can say off the bat, looking back at our schematic here, x is one of the variables and t, time t, is another one. So let's look at the heat diffusion. So this term and this term go away because we said that they go to infinity into and out of the screen and up and down. And so there's no change in those directions and there's no internal generation in this problem. So consequently that is neglected. And what we're left with for the first time, we get to keep this term on the right hand side. We've always neglected that thus far but we're dealing with transient conduction and consequently that is going to remain. So what we can do, we can rewrite the heat diffusion equation and it is then recast to look something like this. And you'll notice that we still have a temperature, we cannot convert this into an ODE like we did for some of the other solution techniques because uh, temperature is a function of x and time in this solution. And so that's the equation that we're going to be working with. Another thing, what I've done, I've made a substitution here. You might be wondering, what is alpha? Well, alpha is a very common uh, parameter that we use when we're doing transient conduction analysis, and that is referred to as being the thermal diffusivity. And what that is, it's the thermal conductivity divided by the density and the specific heat capacity of the solid that we are considering. And so that is the thermal diffusivity. 
And you can find that in tables. Uh, if you're if you have a heat transfer book, look in the back. I'm sure you'll find thermal diffusivity there with thermal conductivity, density, and all the other uh, variables that we're using. Uh, for the, the different substances that we're solving. So that is the equation that we're going to work with. We have the thermal diffusivity. If you were to go through a solution technique to this, the solution technique is similar to what we looked at for 2D conduction. And, and if you recall for 2D conduction, temperature was a function of X and Y. Here we have temperature as a function of X and time. And so that's what we're looking for. Uh, that is the nature of the solution that we're looking for. We know the boundary conditions for this uh, current problem. Uh, the boundary conditions are fixed temperatures and they just change from the initial temperature. So the solution to this uh, can be uh, determined using the separation of variables method. And just like before when we looked at 2D conduction, I am not going to go through and give you uh, the method of solving that, if you get any textbook in heat transfer, I'm sure they will go through it and you can look at it there. But what comes out of this is going to be the temperature as a function of position in the solid and then as a function of time. And we'll denote time by tau. And so I'll write out the rest of the solution. Okay, so that is the solution to our problem and we were told that it was initially at Ti and then the boundaries go to T1. So those are the temperatures on the boundary. Other things we notice here, this is an infinite series and so it is going from n equals 1 to infinity and there is a restriction on n. n has, it's for odd values. So we have one, three, five, and so on. So we only use every second value of n in that infinite series. So very similar to what we saw earlier when we looked at 2D conduction analysis and, and we looked at the uh, square plate with different boundary conditions. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to show you the solution to this equation and I'm going to come up with the solution for different numbers of uh, terms in the series. So we're going to look at a solution with one term. We'll look for n equals 3. That would be a solution with two terms. And then n equals 5. That would be three terms and so on. So we're going to look at uh, solutions for a different number of terms. The parameters, alpha, are thermal diffusivity. L, I'm going to set equal to 2, and that is going to be in meters. And then time, T, or actually in this equation here we had tau, but uh, I use time. So tau is, I'm going to go from 0 0.1, and then I am going to go in steps up to 50 seconds. So we're going to look at the evolution of temperature within a substance. And essentially what we're going to have is a plot like this. This is going to be X and this is going to be temperature. And then what you're going to see, we're going to go from the initial condition. The initial condition here would be something like that. Uh, we have a step change. And then what happens is we initially we are at TI. And then what we do is we drop the temperature on the wall down to T1. And, and so what we're going to be doing is looking at the evolution of that. And for the particular example that we're looking at, uh, let's see here, what do I put T? I put TI is equal to 100 and T1 is 15 degrees C. So those are the conditions that we're going to have. We drop the temperature down and then we're going to see this system move in with time. And so that's what we'll be looking at in the solution. So let, let's take a look at that now and we'll look at what the solution looks like with different numbers of terms. So here we have one term, two terms, three terms, four, five, six, and I've really sped this simulation up. We're going to look at it quickly. And, and you can see 
down in the bottom right hand side where we have six terms, we'll look at it slower now, uh, there's a bit of ripple at the beginning when we have the square wave because remember we're, we're filling in using sine functions but uh, as you get uh, further on in time that ripple goes away and, and then slowly you can see the step change moving to the right and, and that is as uh, conduction is taking place within the solid object that we're looking at. So that is what that solution looks like. You can see that you need uh, obviously more than six terms because you, you have quite a bit of ripple. And and even, it, I didn't show you really, really small time steps. I just showed you uh, that the first time was 0.1 seconds. Had I done 0.001 seconds, you would have even needed more terms to be able to resolve that step change discontinuity uh, right at the beginning of that simulation. And so even with 50 terms, you still get quite a bit of ringing going on. And uh, we refer to that as being Gibbs phenomena when we take sine waves and we try to approximate a step discontinuity. And we saw that as well when we looked at the uh, solution for the heat diffusion equation for 2D conduction analysis. So that is the simplest approximation to a solution to the heat diffusion equation uh, for transient conduction. What we're going to do in the next segment, we're going to move on to a, a different technique and that is called the lump capacitance method. And that's where you assume that there is no temperature distribution within the object. You're assuming that uh, the entire object is at the same temperature and then we just model the temperature as a function of time. So that's what we'll be looking at next in the lump capacitance method. Okay, in the last segment we took a look at a very uh, basic solution to the heat diffusion equation and transient conduction analysis where we just changed the surface temperature conditions for a slab. What we're going to do now, we're going to look at a simplification technique that uh, takes us actually uh, quite a long ways with many different types of analysis and that's called the lump capacitance method. Okay, so what the lump capacitance method does is it assumes that our object, uh, we're going to change the external condition on the object and that is by changing the convective heat transfer environment. And what we're assuming is that there are no temperature gradients within the object and consequently we're assuming that the entire object is at one temperature and the entire object cools at whatever rate if we're doing a cooling or it could be heating in the case where we put it into a warmer environment. So let's begin with a little schematic and then we're going to come up with uh, an equation that enables us to characterize what is going on with these approximations. Okay, so what we have is we have some chunk of mass uh, using a technical term. Uh, here is our mass and at time less than zero the temperature of the mass is at temperature Ti. And then what we do is we take that mass and we drop it into a liquid or it could be any other change in convective environment. Here I'm showing it as being going into a liquid. Uh, but essentially what we're doing is we're changing the external convective heat transfer uh, parameter or boundary condition on the object. And with that, assuming that this liquid is at a lower temperature than the initial temperature of the object, so let's assume that, we know that this object with time is going to cool uh, when we put it into this environment. And that's what we're interested in finding out. So uh, let's take a look at how we can come up with an equation that describes what is going on. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to draw a little picture of our object over here. So this is our chunk of mass. We'll bring it over here. And what I'm also going to do is I am going to say that the energy inside of that object, we'll say it's energy storage, but it could be changing with time. And I'm going to put a control surface around that entire object 
And remember, we've used control surfaces before, and it enables us to quantify any energy transfer going across the surface, the control surface itself. And that will be the basis with which we'll use to come up with our equation. And when we look at this object, where is energy transfer going to be taking place? Well, it's going to be taking place across that boundary and it is going to be leaving the uh, convective heat transfer. So we can then write that E out, and I'll put a time rate there, is going to be equal to the convective heat transfer value for that particular object. So with that, what we can do is we can express an energy balance across the control surface And the energy balance is going to simply be the energy leaving is equal to the change of energy within our chunk of mass. And we know the energy leaving. We said it's leaving via convective heat transfer. So this has a minus sign. So that's going to be minus HA. And it's going to be the temperature of our chunk of material minus the uh, ambient temperature of the liquid, which is T infinity. And that is going to be equal to the change in energy within the uh, object itself. And for that, uh, we basically use MC delta T per unit time. So that is going to be the density times the volume, that gives us the mass, times the specific heat capacity, times the change in temperature per unit time. And so we get that there as being a differential equation. Now, quite often what we do in heat transfer, we want to convert these differential equations into uh, homogeneous ordinary differential equations. And in order to do that, we make a substitution. And we will introduce theta. We saw this technique with fins. We went through and introduced a theta value. We quite often do that in heat transfer. Taking the derivative of that, d theta by dt, the time derivative. Okay, so we get that. Now, that's fine. That's fine. But what about this? dt infinity by dt. Well, what that is, is we have to ask ourselves, is the temperature of the liquid, or whatever medium that we're putting it into, changing with time? And for lump capacitance, we always assume that it's not. We assume that it's much, much larger and, and capable of storing energy, uh, or, or taking energy without changing in temperature, and consequently we neglect that term there. Uh, and we say that that's zero because the ambient or free stream temperature is not changing. And so with that, what we can do, we can come back to our equation here, making the substitution for theta. Let's rewrite our energy balance. And so we get that there. Now AS here, that is the surface area of our object, the wetted surface area. So what I'm going to do now, I'm just going to rearrange some of the terms in here. And we're going to put this into a form of an equation that we can integrate. Okay, so we get that equation there just by rearranging. And now what I'm going to do, I'm going to integrate this equation. And I'm going to apply the limits of integration, what I'm going to integrate between. So I'm integrating in time from 0 to t. Oops, sorry, I forgot a minus there. There should be a minus on that side. I'm integrating from 0 to t, and in that uh, time, at time 0, uh, what we will say is that theta is theta i, and then we're going to some value of theta that we're interested in. So theta i would be with the initial temperature of the material. Theta i would be t i minus t infinity, so that's what theta i is. And what we can do, we can integrate that. d theta over theta is going to be natural logarithm. So let's go ahead and do that. And then the right-hand side is just minus t. And we can now 
introduce the uh, limits for a natural logarithm and we end up with the following. So we obtain that and now I'm going to take an exponential of both sides to get rid of the natural logarithm. And I am going to reintroduce uh, the substitution that we made for theta. And so when I do that, so we obtain that equation there. And this is our solution. This is an equation that tells us the temperature in an object as a function of time under the lump capacitance technique. And so the temperature that we're usually after is right here. And typically we will know everything else in this equation. Now, one thing that we do, uh, we introduce a thing called the thermal time constant. So I will rewrite the equation in terms of the thermal time constant. And I'll call that tau. And so looking back at our solution, it's basically just one over this term here. Uh, is the thermal time constant. And with that, we can again rewrite our temperature And so it just makes it a little more compact. Quite often people will write it in terms of a thermal time constant, but it tells you how quickly a system will re uh, respond to a change in, in the input condition, in this case, the uh, convective heat transfer environment. And what we can do, we can plot that as a function of time. And so if we have time, and then on the vertical, we put T minus T infinity divided by T I minus T infinity. And we'll start at one, because if you exponential of zero, that is going to give us one. So this here is zero. And then what we can do, we can do one time constant, two time constants. And just quickly plotting this, uh, if you put exponential of minus one, and you take that, you get 0.368. So we're going to be around here. And then for 2 tau, that would be about 0.135. So you can see that fairly quickly the temperature in this system is going to drop. And so it kind of looked like that and then asymptotically it's going to go to zero as time goes to infinity. So that would be what the response or the temperature would look like if you were to recast it in terms of the time constant instead of putting it for time. So that is the lump capacitance technique. And what we're going to do in the next segment is we're going to apply the lump capacitance technique to solve the problem. And so it's kind of a handy, quick technique. There are restrictions and we will be looking at those uh, in the next two segments. We'll be talking about the restrictions uh, for the lump capacitance technique. But it enables us to get temperature in an object provided we can assume that the temperature within the object itself uh, spatially is not changing. That, so we assume that it's a constant or lump temperature for the entire object. So that is the lump capacitance method. Okay, in this segment what we're going to do, we're going to work an example problem involving the lumped capacitance method. So I'll begin the example problem by writing out the problem statement. Okay, so there's our problem statement. What we have, uh, we have a can of soda pop, and let's say it's sitting in the refrigerator, cooling, and then what we do is we take it out and we put it into a room at a given natural convective or small convective environment, 7.5 uh, value for H, that would be kind of a low convective heat transfer environment. The room temperature 19.5 degrees C and we're told H is 7.5. And what we want to do, we want to find how long, so the time for the temperature to go 
from uh, 1 degree C all the way up to 15 degrees C. So how long is it going to take for this soda pop just sitting in a room to go from 1 degree C to 15? So you could assume you're taking it out of the refrigerator, you put it on a table, and you monitor how long it takes for that temperature to change. So let's begin by what we know for this problem. So the following is known. So we know that uh, 355 milliliter can, uh, we'll assume it's an aluminum can, and although that's not critically important for what we're doing here, because we're not going to consider that, and we're looking for the time T when temperature is equal to 15 degrees C. So let's begin by drawing out a schematic for what this looks like. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that this can is placed on an insulating material at the base. Okay, so that is our can of soda pop. Uh, we take it out of the fridge, put it on a table with an insulating base. So I'll say insulation here, so we assume there's no heat transfer. And so with that, another thing that we're going to need for the lump capacitance, we need to know the area, the surface area. So we're going to take the top area, pi d squared divided by 4, plus the perimeter area of the cylinder, so pi d h. And when we do that, and when we plug in the values, we get 2.82 times 10 to the minus 2 meters squared. Okay, so that is uh, the different parameters that we need to solve this. What we're going to do, we're going to use the lump capacitance technique to uh, analyze the problem. So let's go forward and do that. And writing out the equation for lump capacitance. And the expression for the thermal time constant. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to plug in all of the values. We know everything and we can evaluate the uh, thermal time constant. So let's go ahead and do that. So when we do that, we get the thermal time constant to be 7016.3 seconds. So we can take that and plug it back up into this equation here. We know everything on the left hand side and we can solve for small t. And that would be how long it takes for the soda pop to reach 15 degrees C. So let's put in the values for that. And so when we solve that equation for time, we get very close to about 10,000 seconds. And so I'm going to divide that by 60 and then I'm going to convert it into hours. So that translates into 2 hours 45 minutes. So that's the amount of time that it's going to take this can of pop uh, starting at 1 degree C in a room at 19.5 degrees C to get up to 15 degrees C. So uh, it takes quite a bit of time when, when you look at that. Uh, now with the lump capacitance technique, so that is our answer. Uh, there is a thing that we have to be careful with, the applicability. There are certain limitations to when we can use lump capacitance and when we can't. So the lump capacitance technique <clears throat> is only valid if our bio number, and in heat transfer the bio number is given the symbol BI, and what that is, that is the external convective heat transfer coefficient some characteristic length scale and we determine that by taking the volume divided by the area divided by the thermal conductivity. If that is less than 0.1 then we are okay with our approximation. If we look at the above example, the bio number there turns out to be 0 0.159 so really we were pushing things. We were above the 0.1 and consequently the approximation of, of saying uh, that we could use the lump capacitance technique is not entirely valid. Another thing is in the case of the can that we just looked at, this is our can and it's sitting there. 
uh, we have a liquid on the inside and so it's not really a solid and consequently you can have fluid motion going on uh, be it natural convection or other things and and consequently that could also kind of stretch the results that we we just used but we're pretty close but that is something that you have to watch for uh, usually when you're dealing with solids you're okay but when you have a liquid in the system like we just did uh, you're kind of pushing things in order to be able to try to use the lump capacitance technique so anyways that that is an example showing how we can use the lump capacitance technique what we're going to do in the next segment uh, and that will conclude this lecture is we're actually going to do this experiment. We're going to take a can of pop out of a fridge. Uh, we're going to uh, do two different ways. One where we open it up, another one where we don't open it and, and look at it with the IR camera as well as we're going to stick a thermocouple in it and we're going to see whether or not this solution actually makes sense. So that's what we're going to do in the next segment. We're doing an experiment involving a lump capacitance technique. <laughs> In this segment, what we're going to do is we're going to do a physical experiment and we're going to investigate the lumped capacitance method. So if you recall from the last segment, what we did is we solved a problem where we took a can of pop and we brought it out of a cool refrigerated environment. So it was initially at one degree C and we put it in an environment that was at 19.5 degrees C and we asked the question, how long does it take to get to the temperature for this can of pop up to 15 degrees C. And we said that we had this can placed on an insulated pad. And what we did is we performed the calculation using the uh, lump capacitance technique. And with that, we had the following relationship that enables us to determine the temperature as a function of time within our system under the assumption that the temperature within this can is uniform. So we were assuming that there would be no temperature variability within the can as a function of time. And so what we're going to do in this little experiment is we're going to investigate that a little bit further. And the other thing we had here was the time constant, and that had rho V C sub P divided by H A S. And H being the convective heat transfer coefficient for the environment that this can was sitting in, and that would be T infinity and H. So that was the problem. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to check and see if the assumptions we made were valid. And at the conclusion, we did say that the bio number uh, should be less than 0 0.1, but for this experiment, bio number was approximately 0 0.159. So we, we do know that we were uh, that, uh, violating that restriction on the bio number and consequently we may expect that our experiment may show something along those lines. So let's begin and what we have here is a can that has just come out of the refrigerator and it was opened and there was a thermocouple stuck inside of the can on the left hand side we have the temperature distribution as a function of time and then superimposed on that we have the results from an infrared camera viewing the same can sitting on the table and, and so there you can see on the left we're at 40 minutes, 50 minutes and the IR camera is showing us the temperature is going up as well as the thermocouple is showing that which is the plot on the left hand side and there is something interesting going on there. There's a bit of a pattern or a wave that comes through. And that is indicating that actually the temperature is not uniform throughout the can as we had originally uh, assumed and enabling us to do the lump capacitance technique. So the fact that we get that wave going through the can 
of, of different temperatures suggests that there, there is strong spatial variability within the can. Uh, we can continue running the experiment. We go on and on. And the reason why it was running is we let it go until we got to approximately 15 degrees C. And there you can see on the IR, it's measuring around 13.5. And that's what the thermocouple was measuring as well. So that's uh, 110 minutes. Actually, that's 160, 170, 180. And the experiment stopped at about 195 minutes. And finally, there you can see at the end of the experiment, the can wasn't quite at uh, 15 degrees C, but it was pretty close to that. So with that, the, the, the next thing that we're going to do, we're going to take a look at the, the data that we collected. So this is the raw data that we got uh, from the thermocouple. And superimposed on that now, that is a lump capacitance model with a convective heat transfer coefficient of 6.4. And there you can see two lines that are indicating uh, where that temperature wave started to come across the uh, pop can. And it began at a time of, it was approximately 30 minutes, and it went all the way up to 110 minutes. And, and in there, that is strong indication that the lump capacitance technique does not apply in that region. And consequently, that's probably also why it's kind of hard to be able to fit the curve as shown by the difference between the raw data and the red curve, which shows the results of the lump capacitance, assuming that the convective heat transfer coefficient was 6.4 watts per square meter Kelvin. Uh, what is the cause of that? It, it's difficult to speculate. I think we need further experiments. Uh, one thing that was interesting, I didn't show you in the results here, I did do the experiment uh, without opening the can first. And in doing that experiment, the wave that, that we saw going from top to bottom began immediately uh, and, and then eventually the can came to a new thermal equilibrium and so that wave started very quickly which makes me wonder if the first 30 minutes of the open can uh, that wave was not prevented by the fact that we had gas coming out of the pop and, and so there would be CO2 bubbles rising and causing mixing. Uh, but again, it would require further experimentation to be able to investigate that. So what that tells us is the, the number that we had with the bio number it being a little bit greater than 0.1 is kind of validated by this experiment. It shows that uh, the lump capacitance technique is not perfect uh, for this particular application, mainly because the object we're looking at is a fluid, and we know fluids can have all kinds of convective processes inside of them. Uh, usually you'll want to have that inside of a solid. So anyways, that is an example of the uh, lump capacitance technique uh, being investigated experimentally. Okay, uh, in this lecture what we're going to be doing is taking a look at uh, solutions to the transient heat diffusion equation for certain geometrical configurations. And we're going to begin with the semi-infinite solid. Now, uh, for the semi-infinite solid, it turns out that the heat diffusion equation, if you cast it in a form uh, 1D uh, transient heat conduction, uh, you can come up with solutions for semi-infinite solids by the introduction of a similarity variable. And the similarity variable, eta, is introduced and essentially what it is, is it's a combination of spatial location x and time. And with that, we collapse the two variables into one and cleanly then what that does is it turns the partial differential equation into an ordinary differential equation. And this is a technique that 
is used in, in mathematical physics problems. It's used in fluid mechanics, heat transfer, uh, but it's just a way to solve partial differential equations. That's the best way to think about it. And what we're going to do, we're going to take a look at three different solutions. We're going to begin with the simplest boundary condition for a semi-infinite solid. So let's take a look at that one. Okay, so we have a semi-infinite solid with a sudden change in external temperature. So let's draw out what our solid might look like. We will introduce spatial location X coming from the surface of the solid. And what we're going to say is what we're after is we want to determine the temperature as a function of spatial location X time tau and that's what we're looking for as uh, for the solution for this particular problem and what we do is we change the external boundary condition by changing the temperature on the surface and so I'm going to give that the symbol T naught and that's going to be for time greater than zero so as we start the time uh, we'll change the surface condition and the other conditions that we have at time zero for all x, so for the entire solid, we will say that the temperature is Ti and the surface condition that I just uh, wrote was zero and for time greater than zero we specify the surface to be T zero and that is for time or tau greater than zero. So when you start the uh, you change the surface condition and then what happens is that change uh, propagates inward into the solid. So I'm not going to go through the similarity solution for this. You can look in pretty much any textbook on heat transfer and you can find it. I'm just going to give you the final result and we're going to do that for all three cases that we look at in this segment. So that is the temperature distribution and notice what we have here. We have an error function and the error function inside of it, that is our similarity variable, the eta that we referred to. Uh, we have brought the four outside of the square root and that's why it's two square root alpha tau. Uh, but you can see the similarity variable and you're going to see that in all the solutions we look at in this segment. And the other thing that can be calculated with that is the heat flux at any X location in the solid. So that's heat flux at any specific location within the solid. And then finally, if we want to find heat flux on the surface of the solid, uh, you would obtain that by setting x equals to zero. All right, so there we go. So that is the solution if you change the surface boundary condition and it is the simplest case that we'll be looking at for the semi-infinite solid. The next one uh, increasing complexity of the surface boundary condition is one where we change surface heat flux. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so for this one what we're doing is we're changing the surface heat flux on the surface of the solid, so right here. And what we know is that the heat flux, it could be an electric resistance heater, maybe you shine a laser on it, radiation, anything like that, uh, that you have a heat flux on the surface. That is going to be equal to, we can use Fourier's law right inside of the surface, and, and that represents Fourier's law with conduction inside of the surface. And so with that, we can rewrite out what the boundaries are for this problem. Again, we start at T initial throughout the entire solid. So for all X at T zero, it's T initial. And then uh, we change the heat flux on the surface. And we can say that that is then going to be related through Fourier's law. Essentially, it specifies the slope of the temperature uh, right inside of the surface. And that is for tau greater than zero. 
And the solution for this one, it gets a little bit more complex, so let me write that on the next slide. Again, we have temperature as a function of spatial location and time. Okay, so that is the solution that we get for uh, the change in surface boundary condition. And one thing that we're starting to see, uh, we, we saw the error function earlier, and the error function is typically tabulated. Uh, you look it up for whatever value that you are assessing. And the uh, other thing that we're seeing here is this one minus error function. That is sometimes represented as being the complementary error function. So uh, the complementary error function, you may see sometimes something like this, and I'm going to write it in terms of some generic variable w, but that is one minus the error function of w. And so sometimes that will be re-expressed. And again, you can see uh, the uh, 2 or 4 alpha tau, that appears in a couple of places in this solution. It's there and it's there. That was the similarity variable that we used for this particular problem. And consequently, it's starting to appear in the solution for the temperature distribution. So that is if you change the uh, external heat flux. The last one that we're going to look at is going to be where we change the convective boundary. And so assume we have a semi-infinite solid and we have a sudden change in the convective boundary condition. So just like for the other ones, what we're interested in is determining the temperature distribution as a function of spatial location and time. Uh, we're told the initial condition for all x at time zero is Ti. And for the boundary condition here, we have convection. And, and so again, what we're going to do, we're going to kind of do something similar to what we did just uh, previously for the constant heat flux. We're going to equate that using Fourier's law. And I've canceled the area out here, if you're wondering what happened to area. But this is going to be right on the surface. So right when you come inside of the solid, uh, the slope of the temperature is going to be related to the convective heat transfer. And we have to account for the fact that the surface temperature can change with time. And so we do t at zero, x equals zero, and for time as time evolves. And, and let's see, should that be tau? You know what, that probably should be tau to be consistent with what I have in the other thing. So I'm going to put tau. Okay, so that are, those are our boundary conditions. Looking now at the solution, and this solution will be the most complex one that we look at. Okay, so that is the solution that we obtain for the surface convective condition for a semi-infinite solid. Uh, again, you can see uh, some resemblance of a similarity variable embedded within there. Uh, you probably don't want to calculate that all the time. And, and consequently, that is something that you'd probably want to put either into a computer program or sometimes what we do is we plot this data. And, and in the plots, I'll show you one in a moment here, but typically what we do is we plot our temperature. So what we have up here is plotted on the vertical axis. On the horizontal axis, what we do is we plot the similarity variable itself, x. or it could be 4 alpha t if I pull the 2 inside of the square root symbol. And then what we do is we plot this as a function of different values of time, the uh, convective heat transfer coefficient, thermal diffusivity, and the thermal conductivity of the solid. And, and so that is represented with this variable. 
So that is uh, how we can plot it and then depending upon what particular location you're looking at you find the appropriate curve, you go to the X location, you get the value yeah, so you would go there and you go over, it's quite obvious, you read the value there. Oops, sorry about that. Disappears on me. And, and then we get the value from there. So let's take a look at what some of those curves might look like for this last solution. And, and this becomes a trend in transient heat conduction uh, just because the equations start to get quite complex. And, and so what we do is we plot the equations in curves. And so we'll begin with this one. So there you can see on the bottom we have the similarity variable and then our temperature on the vertical axis. And then you're going to see curves of increasing uh, the, the, the time, thermal diffusivity, uh, convective heat transfer coefficient, and the thermal conductivity. And, and going uh, all the way from 0 0.05 up to infinity. And, and all you would do is you just go up into that curve, whatever the particular parameters you're looking at, and, and you'd read off the specific value. So those are three different solutions uh, for the case of uh, different boundary conditions for a semi-infinite solid. And what we're going to do next is we're, we're going to uh, now look at uh, three specific geometries and we're going to stay on the convective idea. So for this last one we looked at a convective boundary condition. What we're going to do in the next segment is we're going to move into three other geometries, one being a slab, a cylinder, and then a sphere. And we're going to look at uh, the temperature within the center line and as a function of position within those objects for transient convective boundary conditions and and those will be in the form of Heisler charts or tables and, and charts that we'll be looking at so that's where we're going We're now going to take a look at uh, solutions for convective boundary conditions under transient conduction for three different shapes. We're going to look at a slab, a infinite cylinder, and a sphere. So in the previous segment what we did is we looked at the semi-infinite plate for three different boundary conditions and we came up with solutions. Uh, it, it was using a similarity variable and a similarity solution. Uh, but in this case there are other solutions. We'll be looking at approximations uh, and it's actually a, a series solution but we look at the first few terms and, and that converges re relatively quickly. And so the solutions we're going to look at will be in the forms of charts and in terms of a approximate solution using the equations. Before we can get to the solutions, however, what we need to do, we need to introduce the nomenclature that we're going to be using for these solutions. So that's what we're going to be doing in this segment. And then in the subsequent segments, we'll look uh, step by step. We'll begin with the slab, then we'll look at the cylinder, and then the sphere. So the geometry that I refer to as the slab, which is probably not technically correct, but it's an infinite plate, 2L thick. And what we're going to be doing, we're going to be solving for temperature, first of all, at the midplane as a function of time. And from that, we will be able to get the spatial temperature. So temperature at some point off of the midplane at a specific time. And the last thing we'll be able to calculate is the heat loss from this slab uh, up to a certain point in time, whatever point in time we are examining. Now that's the infinite plate, 2L thick. And as I mentioned, we're also going to be looking at a cylinder. And just like for the slab, uh, we will start by being able to determine the center line temperature. Uh, 
And from that, we'll be able to estimate the spatial temperature distribution as a function of radial location. And then, just like for this lab, we are going to be able to evaluate the heat loss. And the last shape that we will look at is that of the sphere. And just like for the previous two, we will have the exact same three things that we will be able to estimate. Okay, so those are the shapes that we're going to be looking at. And what I will do now is let's go through and take a look at the nomenclature. The nomenclature is very important uh, when solving these problems. Beginning with the infinite plate. So the infinite plate is 2L thick and X is denoted from the center line of our infinite plate. And in this, T naught is going to be the center line temperature. And we will introduce a variable X star. And that is going to be our spatial location, non-dimensionalized, divided by the length scale L. And the length scale is just L. And so that is the infinite plate looking at the cylinder. Okay, so the cylinder is going to have an outer radius R0, and we will be interested when we look at the spatial temperature at location R, radial location R. And just like for uh, the infinite plate, we had X star. Here we will have R star, which is going to be R divided by the outer radius. And the length scale that we deal with here is just the outer radius of our cylinder, R0. And finally, for the sphere, the geometry that we will be using is as follows. Okay, so we're interested in what is going on at some radial location R. The outer radius is R0, just like we had for the cylinder. T0 is the center line temperature. R star is the non-dimensionalized radial location, non-dimensionalized by the characteristic length scale, which in this case is R0, the outer radius of our sphere. Okay, so those are the, uh, so the some of the temperatures and spatial uh, variables that we will have in our solution. Now, a couple of other things that we need to be aware of, and those are temperatures. We've already looked at the center line temperature, T0, but we have other temperatures, the initial temperature, and that's going to be the temperature at tau or T less than zero. So before we change the convective boundary condition, T infinity and H, that describes the convective environment. So we assume that there is no convection at the beginning. And then when we start, we uh, expose our, uh, either the slab, the cylinder or the sphere to this new convective environment, T infinity H. T naught, we already saw, and that is the center line temperature. And then we introduce some uh, values of theta, which are differences in temperature. And theta could either be the temperature at a given location, so spatial and time, minus the free stream. That's if we're dealing with the slab, or if we're dealing with either the cylinder or the sphere it would be expressed in the following way, where we'd be evaluating temperature at a radial location. Theta i, that is going to be our initial temperature, minus the free stream. Theta naught is going to be the center line temperature, minus the free stream. And we can also have a theta star, and that is going to be theta divided by theta i, or the initial temperature difference. Other numbers that we will be working with, we have a couple of non-dimensional numbers that are very important in, in heat transfer and especially transient heat transfer. 
And those are the Fourier number. And it is given the symbol capital F O. And it is the thermal diffusivity times time divided by our characteristic length scale squared. So it could either be L or R naught. And another number that we have, we saw this earlier when we were looking at the lump capacitance method. It is the bio number, and that is BI, and is the convective heat transfer coefficient times some characteristic length scale divided by the thermal conductivity of the solid that we are examining. So those are two other numbers that we'll be using. And then finally, uh, we'll be evaluating heat loss in the solids and heat loss is referenced to some uh, value Q naught and what that is rho CV so that is basically MC times delta T and the delta T is going to be the initial minus the free stream so that's basically the total change, potential change in energy, possible change I should say, going from the initial state to the new free stream state and ultimately in time the entire solid will eventually go to the value of T infinity but that's after all the transients have gone away. So those are some of the uh, values that we're going to be using for the analysis here and what we're going to do in the next uh, three segments we're going to look uh, starting with the infinite plate and I will give you the approximate equations as well as the charts which are called the Heisler charts and then we'll do the same for the cylinder and then for the sphere. And then in the next lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to solve a problem with a sphere uh, using both the approximate technique that we'll look at as well as the highest floor charts. That's where we're going. Okay, in this segment what we are going to do, we're going to take a look at uh, the approximate solutions for a change in convective boundary condition for the infinite plate. And, and so we'll look at approximate solutions and the graphical technique. And the graphical technique uh, referred to as being the Heisler charts. So we're looking at the infinite plate. And what we'll begin with... Uh, Let's see, just remember the infinite plate, this was the geometry, we specified x from the center and then l and l, so the thickness was 2l. Uh, but we will begin with the approximate solutions. And we start with the center line temperature. And this is where we're going to use a lot of the nomenclature that we presented in the last segment, so theta naught star. That's going to be theta naught divided by theta i. And the approximate solution, we get this constant, exponential, minus zeta squared. I apologize for my zeta, it's not perfect. And then Fourier, Fourier number. And the Fourier number, if you recall, was alpha t over l squared and c1 and zeta where do we get those from well we have to evaluate the bio number first and the bio number for the slab is h l l is our characteristic length divided by k the thermal conductivity and then knowing that if a function of bio you go to tables and so your textbook should have tables and from that you can get zeta and you can get C1. So you would look up at a, a specific bio number and it would give you C1 and zeta1. Make sure you're reading it for the infinite plate, not for the cylinder or the sphere because they most likely will also be in the table. So that's how you get the center line temperature. You use that expression there. And then to get the spatial temperature, again we use a theta star 
but we take theta this time instead of theta naught, and theta denotes temperature at a given spatial location other than the center line. And in this solution, what we do is we use theta naught star from our previous solution. So you got to evaluate the center line temperature first. And then once you've done that, then you can get temperature at a, a location off of the center line. And it is expressed in terms of cos and zeta 1 times x star. Uh, zeta 1, that is a function of bio number from the tables. And x star is equal to the spatial location that we're interested in evaluating divided by L, which is the thickness. Now, one thing that you got to be careful about here, this is evaluated in radians. So make sure your calculator is in radians when you evaluate that term or you will calculate it incorrectly. Uh, and then the final thing that we're going to get uh, using the approximate solution is the heat loss. The heat loss from our slab to the surroundings. And again, we're using zeta 1, which is a function of the bio number and from tables. And be careful, radians. So don't get that wrong. And then Q0, we talked about Q0 with our nomenclature. It refers to the total amount of heat loss if the entire solid was to go from Ti to T infinity. So that is using the approximate technique and using the Heisler charts. I won't show you the Heisler charts yet. We'll do that when we work an example problem in the next lecture. But what I'm going to do is just uh, sketching them so that you get an idea as to what they look like. So using the graphical technique, and these are referred to as being the Heisler charts. They may or may not be in your book, depending upon what textbook you're using. But just like before, we start with the center line. And the center line is plotted as a function of the Fourier number. And then the curves are going to do interesting things. And these curves, there are a number of them. And they go uh, by 1 over the bio number. So there would be different curves that come along. I think they all have similar breakpoints. So I'll just draw one. So that would be the center line temperature. And just like before, you have to do the center line first. And then you can move on to the spatial. Spatial is a different curve. And here we have theta over theta naught. So you need to evaluate theta naught first before you can go in and evaluate theta, which would be temperature at a given point. And it is plotted as a function of 1 over the bio number. And the curves, there will be different curves as a function of spatial location. And x over L is how those are plotted. And then finally, you can use charts to get the heat loss. And this is plotted as a function of the Fourier number times the bio number squared. And then these charts will be plotted uh, for different bio numbers. So that is heat loss um, for the infinite plate, uh, giving us the temperature as a function of time at the center line, spatial locations, and then total heat loss using both the approximate and the Heisler. So it might be a little abstract now. Uh, it is. Uh, and we'll look at the sphere and, and the cylinder next. But uh, when we work this in an example problem, it'll become a little clearer. Uh, basically, the when would you use the graphical versus the equations? Uh, the equations are pretty easy, although for the cylinder we'll see there are bezel functions, and so you got to go and look up values in another table, which can be a bit of a pain. Uh, the, the graphs are not as accurate, but they're quicker, and and so it's you know a, a bit of a mixed call, which is better, but uh, you can use either technique, and and you'll see in the example problem I'll work both techniques and. We get very, very similar results out of them. So anyways, that's the infinite plate. We'll next move on to the cylinder.
Okay, in this segment, uh, we're continuing on looking at uh, transient solutions, uh, convective boundary, and we're going to be looking at an infinite cylinder. And so we're looking at approximate solutions as well as a graphical solution using the Heisler charts. So let's begin with the approximate solution. So this is the infinite cylinder. Sketching out the geometry, remember we had R0 is the outer radius and we're interested in what's going on at some radial location. And we're assuming that this cylinder goes off to infinity. Uh, beginning with the approximate solutions. So we have the center line temperature. And whenever you're working transient problems, you always got to start with the center line. If you're wanting something spatially, you start with the center line, you get that, and then you move to your spatial temperature. Uh, as well as for heat loss, you need to know the center line temperature. So let's take a look at that. Uh, using our theta designation, it's theta naught star. And that is going to be theta naught divided by theta i. And defining what those are. Center line temperature minus T infinity divided by the initial temperature of the entire cylinder divided by minus T infinity. Uh, and the solution here, just like we saw for the slab, is going to look like this. That is zeta and then the Fourier number, Fourier number. very important non-dimensional number in transient conduction analysis. Now our length scale you'll notice before when we had the slab it was L squared now we're dividing by R naught squared and the bio number H times the characteristic length scale which is the outer radius for the cylinder divided by the thermal conductivity of the cylinder. Now C1 and zeta where are you going to get those from? Well you get them from a table and they will be as a function of the bio number and those are listed in a table. Okay, so that is how you can evaluate the center line temperature. Let's take a look at spatial temperature variability. And you'll notice that this is quite similar to what we saw for the slab, but there are slight differences in the equations, so just be careful with that. Uh, so spatial temperature, theta star, theta over theta i. And that's going to be the temperature at our radial location and specific time, the radial location that we're interested in that's off the center line, minus t infinity divided by the initial temperature minus t infinity. And that is going to equal the center line temperature, so the uh, theta naught star that we just calculated in the previous part, or I showed you the equation. And then this is where you get the fun bezel functions. So that's bezel function of a first kind times zeta r star. Where do you get the bezel functions? Well, there should be a table in your book. If not, search it out on the internet. I'm sure you'll find them. Bezel functions of the first kind. And then R star, what is R star? That's our non-dimensionalized radius. So that's going to be R divided by R naught. So that's spatial temperature. You'll notice you have to evaluate uh, what's going on at the center line first before you can get what is going on there. And this is what you'd be looking for in that equation. Uh, let's take a look at heat loss. Heat loss is Q divided by Q naught, and I'll give you Q naught in a second. Again, this is a bezel function evaluated at zeta 1, and Q naught, that is the total heat loss that would occur if your solid, your cylinder, was to go all the way from T in original, Ti, all the way to T infinity, T free stream. Now we say heat loss. You can have cases where the object is getting hotter. 
Uh, so just be aware of that. Uh, sometimes T infinity can be larger than the initial temperature that we're looking at. So it doesn't always have to be heat loss. It can sometimes be heat gain. Uh, so that is the approximate. Let's take a look at the Heisler, Heisler charts. That's the graphical technique. And this is quite similar to what we saw for the slab. First of all, we start with our center line. And you'll have a plot of theta naught. That is at the center line divided by theta initial. And that's going to be plotted as a function of the Fourier number. And you'll have these interesting curves that have breakpoints. And that is 1 over the bio. I'll show you these in an example problem in the next lecture. So if you're wondering what do these look like. Spatial. You have to do your center line first. And once you've done your center line, then you can do the spatial. And that's plotted as a function of 1 over the bio number. And here we're going to have curves like that. And they are in order of increasing radial location. So as you go out towards the uh, outer radius of your sphere. And then finally heat loss. There will be curves for heat loss. And these are Q over Q naught. Again plotted as a function of Fourier bio squared. And these curves are plotted for different bio numbers. So those are the curves that pertain to the cylinder for the Heisler charts. And very similar to what we saw for this lab. The only difference is that you're using R0 for your characteristic dimension, whereas before we were using L. Okay, so that is the cylinder. The next segment, we'll look at the equations for a sphere. And that will uh, give us all the equations that we can use for convective boundary conditions. All right, so we're now going to look at the last geometric shape for change in boundary conditions with transient uh, conduction. And so we're looking at convective boundary conditions where we're changing them. Uh, and this, we're going to look at a sphere in this segment. Okay, so geometry of the sphere. We have R0, which is the outer radius, and then we're interested in what is going on at some radial location, R. And we'll begin, just like we did for the slab and the infinite cylinder, we'll begin with the approximate solutions. And we begin with the center line temperature. So here we're evaluating theta naught star, which is theta naught divided by theta i, and those are defined as being the center line temperature minus the free stream convective environment, and then ti, our initial temperature minus the free stream convective environment temperature. And just like for the slab and for the infinite cylinder, we have the expression C1 exp minus zeta 1 squared, and then we have the Fourier number. Fourier number, alpha, and the thermal diffusivity times the time divided by the outer radius of our sphere squared. Bio number, we need the bio number, and that is H R naught, and that's your convective environment, uh, convective heat transfer coefficient, R naught is the outer radius divided by the thermal conductivity of the solid. And the reason why you need bio is because C1 and zeta come from tables. And those tables are functions of the bio number. And so you would look those up. You compute your bio number first and then you look them up. So that is our center line temperature function. Uh, spatial distribution. We have a function for the spatial temperature. And this one's a little simpler. I guess you could say it doesn't involve bezel functions like we saw for the cylinder. 
However, in order to solve it, you do need to know what happens at the center line, which we have in the theta naught star term. And so here we have a trig function. Remember to be careful, that needs to be evaluated in radians. And R star, just like we saw for the cylinder, that is basically just the radius non-dimensionalized by the outer radius. So that's how we get the spatial temperature. You solve, first of all, uh, for that using the centerline temperature and then you using the values that you looked at for the bio number and for the spatial location, you calculate R star and it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and remember what we're after here is to get that because that gives us temperature at a given spatial location at a specific time. And then finally, heat loss. How do you calculate heat loss from this sphere? So you get that. That's a little bit more complex than we've seen for the uh, slab and the cylinder. And then Q0, that is just like we had for all the other ones. Total amount of energy, assuming that your sphere goes all the way to T infinity with time. So that is heat loss, spatial temperature, centerline temperature. Uh, just like before, we also have the Heisler charts that we can use. And so that's the graphical solution. Starting with the center line temperature, we have this plotted as a function of the Fourier number. That's going to be theta naught divided by theta i. And here we're going to have these curves and they are functions of 1 over the bio number. Spatial distribution. You have to determine what goes on at the center line first before you can get to this one. Because you'll notice theta naught is in there and that's what you're getting. So this theta naught that you determine here goes there. That's what's going on. Uh, and this is as a function of 1 over the bio number. And we have a number of different curves that change depending upon the radial location that we're interested in. And so that would be R over R naught. That's our R star value. And then finally heat loss. We have curves for that. And those are going to be Q over Q naught. Fourier bio squared. The bio number. And then we have this here. And that's a function of the bio number increasing in that direction. So those are the Heisler charts. We will be looking at those in the next lecture because we work an example problem. We won't look at the heat loss one, but we'll look at the central line and the spatial Heisler chart. So, Anyways, those are the different techniques for calculating uh, transient heat conduction in an infinite slab, uh, in an infinite cylinder, and in a sphere when you change the external convective heat transfer uh, boundary conditions. So in the next lecture, we'll go on and, and we're going to use uh, one example, but we're going to work it twice. Once we'll use the approximate solution and then in the second segment, we'll use the Heisler charts and we'll compare them and see how well they compare to one another. So that is where we're going with transient conduction. All right, uh, so in this lecture, what we're going to do, we're going to solve two different, well, they're the same example problems, but we're going to work them in two different techniques. One, using the approximate solution techniques we saw in the last lecture for transient conduction when you change the convective boundary condition on an object. Uh, we'll use the approximate solution in this segment, and then in the next segment, we'll use the Heisler charts to solve the problem. So let me begin by writing out the uh, problem. I'm not going to give a problem statement. I'll just basically write out what we know. So this is an example of approximate solution.
Okay, so there is our problem statement written out. Uh, what we have is a fused quartz sphere. So we're dealing with a sphere uh, diameter 2.5 centimeters. We're told the thermal diffusivity as well as the thermal conductivity. Uh, so we know the diameter. Originally it's at 25 degrees C and then it's suddenly placed in a convective environment of 200 degrees C and the convective heat transfer coefficient 110 watts per meter squared Kelvin so that would be a pretty good uh, flow coming across it in order to get that high of a convective heat transfer coefficient and then what we are told to do is to evaluate the temperature at the center line r equals zero at four minutes and then also at some point off of the center line 6.4 millimeters off the uh, center line at that radial location also at four minutes so uh, and we're told to use the approximate solution technique so that will be the one for the sphere so let's begin by drawing a schematic of what this looks like and it won't be that complex because all we have is our sphere and r naught radial location r we're interested in what's going on at 6.4 millimeters and then this is exposed to some convective environment okay so the analysis let's begin the analysis and we'll start with part one and that's where they ask us to determine what is going on at the center line so t at r equals zero at four minutes which is 240 seconds and so we'll use the equations that we presented in the last lecture and so we have to evaluate the Fourier number as well as the bio number because that is we need the bio number in order to get C1 and Zeta1 and those will come out of a table so let's begin with the Fourier number we get the Fourier number to be 1.459 let's take a look at the bio number and from that we get a bio number of 0 0.9046 okay so with the bio number th this is where we go and we find the table in our books that enable us to get c1 and zeta so what i'm going to do i'm going to write out the values uh, it turns out that the table is listed there's a value of a bio number of 0.9 and one at one so we're going to have to do linear interpolation so let me write out the table values okay so those are the values that are in the table and we're interested in what is going on at 0 0.9046 so we can see that it's going to be closer to 0 0.9 than it is to 1 and with that what we need to do we need to do linear interpolation and so when you go through and do the linear interpolation you find the following values and whenever you do interpolation, do a sanity check. 1.5075, that's close to 1.5044, so that makes sense. 1.2499, that's close to the 1.249 or 2488. So that uh, probably means that we did the linear interpolation correctly. Uh, and then the next thing we do, we go back, let's go back here. So we've done the linear interpolation and that has enabled us to get C1 and Zeta. So we can now use this equation here to evaluate Theta naught star. So let's do that. So we get that and what I'm now going to do, uh, let's see, did I, I did. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take that value of Theta naught star and we're going to use this equation and what we're looking for is this here t naught because that will be the center line temperature at 240 seconds so let's try to evaluate that so we plug in the values and we get t naught 192.1 degrees C so that is our center line temperature after 240 seconds and that is answer to part one what we now need to do is go on and evaluate
Uh, what is going on at radial location? What do we say? 6.4 millimeters. So for that we have to use the spatial distribution solution. Okay, and we'll notice in this equation we have R star. R star is the radial location. We're interested at 6.4 millimeters divided by the radius of our sphere. So R star is 0.512. And with that, uh, we can plug in the values because we have theta naught star. We solved that in the first part of the problem. And we know zeta 1 because we looked that up knowing the bio number uh, from the table. So now let's write out what theta star would be. And it's at this point that if you're sleepwalking while you're doing this solution, you're going to make a mistake. And the reason is, this needs to be in radians. So remember, when you do solutions to engineering problems, be awake. Don't sleepwalk your way through them. Okay, so you got to convert your calculator to radians. You plug in those values, and what do we get? Get 0 0.0410, and we can then evaluate. What are we looking for? We're looking for this here because that's going to be the temperature at the radial location that we're interested in. So let's isolate for it. Okay, so there we go. We got 192.8 degrees C. Now let's see if that makes sense. What did we get? We got 192.1. So we had 192.1 degrees C, and that was at the center line. So that was at R equals zero. So does this make sense? Uh, we have at a radial location 6.8 millimeters. At the same time, these are both at T is 240 uh, seconds. And what did we say? We said the convective environment was T infinity 200 degrees C and h was equal to what was it 110 and t initial was 25 degrees c so what's happening here is our sphere begins at a low temperature it's exposed to a very hot convective environment so the temperature is going to go up consequently what we should expect we should expect at a radial location r equals what was it it was 6.4 millimeters we should expect that uh, a radial location further out, so something out here, should be at a higher temperature before the center line. The center line is the thing that will take the longest to warm up because we have a heat transfer moving in and it takes time because we have the time constant uh, uh, there's a transient term in the heat diffusion equation and consequently it'll take the longest for the central line to warm up. So based on uh, my hand-waving arguments here, it means that uh, we, we should be able to say that this does make sense uh, because the center line temperature is lower, which it would be because it's going to take longer for the center line to warm up to whatever temperature it's going to. Well, it's going to eventually go to 200 degrees C if we let this go to T infinity. So anyways, that is an example using the approximate solution. In the next one, what we're going to do, we're going to use the Heisler charts to solve the exact same problem. Okay, what we're now going to do, we're going to solve the exact same example problem that we just solved. Uh, however, now what we're going to do, we're going to use the Heisler charts in order to come up with the solution. So I'll begin by, just like we did last time, writing out what we know and what we're looking for. We're dealing with that uh, fused quartz sphere that is going through a change in convective environment 
and we're looking at transient conduction analysis. Okay, so there's our problem statement, fuse quartz sphere. Uh, we're given the thermal diffusivity, thermal conductivity. We're told the diameter is 2.5 centimeters. We can get the radius from that. Initially, it's at 25 degrees C, and then it's placed in a convective environment, uh, hot convective environment. So it's going to be increasing in temperature, the convective environment, 200 degrees C and H of 110. And we're told to ask, uh, told to calculate two things. One is the temperature at the center line after four minutes, and then the temperature at a radial location of 6.4 millimeters after uh, four minutes. So let's begin by drawing out a schematic for what this looks like. Okay, so our radial location R, and this is being exposed to a convective environment. Okay, so analysis for this, we're going to use the Heisler charts, and we'll start with part one, which we're looking for the temperature at radial location R equals zero and 240 seconds. And so in order to do this, in using the Heisler charts, we're going to begin with the one that gives us the center line temperature. And for that, uh, we need to evaluate the x-axis value, which is just the Fourier number. And for that, we get 1.459. And the curve, the curve that we read is, I believe I said it was 1 over the bio number, so K over HR naught. Okay, so those are the two values. Once we have them, then what we can do is we can go to our Heisler chart. So let's take a look at the Heisler chart. And here we are, a very, very busy chart, a lot of stuff going on, but it's not as bad as it might immediately look when you first look at it. Uh, what we have here are our curves K over HR naught. So we have to find the appropriate curve. And we're dealing with 1.106. And so looking... Uh, there is 1 and there is 1.2, so we're halfway between those two. And then what about the Fourier number? Where are we with the Fourier number? We had 1.459, so there is 1.5, so there's 1, 1.1, 1 .1, 0 0.2. Oh, what are the increments of this? 1. So I would say 1.459, it's probably somewhere uh right in about here so what i'm going to do i'm going to sketch up and that's up here somewhere and we're between those two curves so coming across i would estimate that we're probably somewhere right around 0 0.05 so let's take that as being our value and we'll work with it let's go back So that gave us the y-axis value, and that is theta naught over theta i. And from that, we can go ahead and calculate t naught because that's what we're looking for. We want to know the center line temperature. And what do we get? We get 191.3 degrees C. And when we did this using the approximate uh, solution from the last segment, there we calculated 192.1 degrees C. So you can see we're pretty close. We're a little bit lower with the Heisler chart than we were uh, using the approximate analysis. But that gives us the result for the centerline temperature after four minutes. Let's move on now. So that was our Heisler chart. What we're now going to do, we want to find the temperature at a location off the center line and so that was part two and so for this what we're going to be doing is we're going to be reading off of a curve r divided by r naught which that is 0 0.512 and the x-axis on this curve is one over the bio number 
1.106 and those were the uh, that was the curve that we were reading in the previous graph and we were looking at the Heisler chart for the center line temperature. Okay so with that now we go to our graph and we take those two so this is the graph for what happens spatially. Uh, you can see on the left we have theta over theta naught. On the bottom we have 1 over the bio. So we were looking at 1 over a bio number of 1.1. So there's 1, there's 2, 1.1. I don't know, it's probably someplace right in there. You can see when you're using the charts, you're doing a little bit of guessing. A bit of a guesstimate for this. And then 0.5. Well, we don't have a curve, a radial location. These are the radial location curves. We don't have any one at 0.512. Uh, we have a 0.4 and a 0.6. What I'm going to do, I'm going to go in the midpoint between those two. So we're probably someplace right in there. Uh, that's probably closer to the bottom, which it should be because we're at 0.512. So with that, we then say that that's probably the location. We come over. We're a little bit above 0.9. So let me guess this to be 0.92. And with that, we'll go back and assuming that the y-axis, which is theta over theta naught, assuming that that is equal to 0 0.92, we can then plug in all the values. And again, here what we're after, we're after that temperature because that will be at the radial location at four minutes and notice what we need here we need T naught and that's pulled from the solution from the previous part and so that's why you'll probably recognize that number there and then we multiply that by 0 0.92 and when we do that we get T 192 degrees C. So that is the result that we get. And let's compare when we did the previous example using the approximate technique we got 192.8 degrees C. So slightly higher uh, than what we're getting now but that's consistent with what we just saw Let's see, where was it? Here, uh, the approximate technique was slightly higher than what we got from the Heisler charts for the center line temperature. And so here we're finding the exact same trends. So anyways, those results are pretty close. Uh, you can see the Heisler chart is, is relatively quick. Uh, I didn't use a ruler. Where did my Heisler chart go? There we go. I, I didn't use a ruler here. And if you had used a ruler, it would be a little bit more accurate. Uh, for either the center line temperature or the spatial temperature. But when, when we compare the results, uh, really not too bad. So anyways, that gives you an example of uh, transient conduction analysis with convective environments for a sphere, one of the three different shapes that we can look at. And that is covering everything that we're going to look at with transient analysis and heat transfer.